The stars are shining bright in the Lone Star State. The best in the sports of CrossFit and Strongman continue their quests for a championship here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. Day two at Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas, as the 2022 Rogue Invitational continues, and we are in for a wild ride. The Rogue Coaster out there in left field is lurking, and we're going to kick things off today with that. But more on that in a second as the Rogue Iron Game gets things kicked off here on Saturday just outside of Austin, Texas. Thanks so much for being with us, everybody. I'm Sean Woodland, and once again, we have a jam-packed day of action here at the Rogue Invitational. Here's a look at what we have on tap, and take a couple seconds to read this because there is a lot that we have going on at Dell Diamond. We're gonna start competition at 9 a.m. local time with the Roga Coaster pull. More on that in a little bit. The CrossFit athletes will be out at 10.05 a.m. Central Time. They will go through the turtle. There will be three events for the strongmen today, and we will crown a champion at the end of the day in that competition. And we have three events for the CrossFit athletes. One of them has yet to be announced. Joined at the desk now by Jamie Hiagia and Pat Sherwood. I think back to yesterday, Jamie, and there was about six or seven things that stood out to me. I'm going to make you pick one because you have the hard job, but what was the thing that stood out the most to you on Friday? There were so many exciting events that went on yesterday, but one thing, even though it was a short part of the day, it was a very impactful part of the day, the legends, they were so great to watch. These are the men and women who really put the sport on the map, and to see them out there still so fit was really inspiring. Let's look forward now to day number two here at Dell Diamond. Pat, what are you expecting to see? We've got some great events in line for the athletes. Three more on tap today, starting off with the turtle. Really grippy. You get some monkey bars. It's going to be cool to see. That hill that was constructed will be put into use. Event six, as you alluded to earlier, totally unknown. Can't tell you anything about it. But then event number seven, the Texas Oak. We see uh, CrossFit athletes do clean and jerks all the time, but now we're going to get to see them with the strongman logs. So kind of blending those two worlds is going to be fantastic. There's going to be a lot of log lifting going on today at the Dell Diamond here in Round Rock, Texas. We are through four events in the CrossFit competition. Let's start on the men's side. This is where we stand coming into the day. Justin Medeiros with a 15-point lead over Roman Krennikov. Bjorn Gubinson having a very Bjorn Gubinson like competition right now. He sits in third, and Patrick Velder has been creeping up the overall standings. He is now just five points out of a spot inside the top three. But Jamie, let's start with Justin Medeiros doing exactly what we have seen him do in the past. When he has a bad event, it's only fifth. This is what Justin does. He is the reigning Rogue Invitational Champion and two-time fittest man on earth. He started out with a fifth place, and then yesterday he took a first, a third, and a fifth. It really seems that the more pressure that's put on him, the better he gets, and that is a true sign of a champion. And Pat, there was a point yesterday where it looked like Medeiros might be poised to run away with this thing, but then Roman Kronikov said, no, no, not so fast, my friend. It does not look like that <laughs> anymore. I am just growing more and more of a Roman Kronikov fan as the events tick by. This guy competes 100%. He is not here for fun, and I love that. He wants the gold medal around his neck, and he's trying to earn it. He's had a fantastic invitational so far. Four events down, three of those in the top five. He had an event win on DT with a spin, and his quote-unquote bad event so far was a seventh place. That was all body weight, high volume, you know, bar muscle ups. He weighs 225 pounds. So this guy is a beast, 100%. Tight race between Medeiros and Krennikov at the CrossFit Games. That is happening again here at the Rogue Invitational. Tight at the top of the leaderboard for the men, and it is close on top of the overall leaderboard for the women. Gabriella McGowell was able to grab the lead last night. 305 total points for her, 10 points up on Laura Horvath. Emma Lawson, who led for a good portion of the day yesterday, has fallen back to third. And Annie Thoris, daughter, who is second at the 2021 Rogue Invitational, now sits in fourth. 
Kiki Dixon caught up with Gabriella Magawa after event four last night. Congratulations for being on top at the close of day two. You've completed four events, your first overall. Do you feel like you gave it your all or did you leave anything on the table? I always try to give 100% uh, whenever I compete. So I think I did pretty good job. Like the goal for me uh, coming to this competition is to focus at one event at a time. Um, this year's um, road competition is so much different than the last year. Like there's so many events and so many new things. So I think that's a really smart approach. And so far it's really so. Yeah, I'm very excited for two more days. There's six more events, so let's do this. Now, out of those six events, is there anything in particular you're looking forward to or something that maybe you would pass if you could? Uh, like I said, I didn't really have like so much time to think about all the events. Um, like, I think all of them look really amazing and exciting. Like, uh, I've been like I've been training a lot of those movements which showed up, so I'm really, really excited to see you at, um, at this moment in the season. We look forward to seeing you out there tomorrow. Thank you so much. Pat, we were here yesterday talking about how Gabriella Magawa was one of the favorites to possibly win this entire competition. So no shock that she's on top of the overall standings after four events. Yeah, I mean, she's profoundly capable and she's in the top threes, which, which is what we thought. Hey, Tia Claire Toomey not competing this year, so there's going to be a new woman crowned the champion here. But today, we're going to learn a lot about Gabriella Magala. She obviously is physically capable, but there's something unique about the pressure of now being in first and knowing that every single other woman has you. You're the target. And so three events today. We'll see where she she's in first right now. Let's see where she is at the end of the day. She has the lead, but it's Laurel Horvath who has momentum. Back-to-back -back event wins to close out day number two yesterday. Laura is looking so strong coming off of that back attack earlier in the day. She did the 275 reps at 54321 and 75 box jump overs in 409, looking really solid there. She does have those two event wins back-to-back, -back, looking to make her third today in a row, and then looking really solid on her DT with the spin as well, making that barbell look super light. Emma Lawson is someone else we we're looking at as well, and she started off with a fifth and a first, but yeah, did enough damage control yesterday to stay in that top three. And you mentioned Laura Horvath looking for her third straight event win. Now, if she pulls that off, she'd be the first person ever to win three straight events at the Rogue Invitational. There are three more CrossFit events on the schedule for today. We're going to start with the Turtle. That gets going at 10.05 local time. Now, after that is event six. We still do not know what that is going to be. Hopefully, that will get announced very soon so we can break that down and start building anticipation for what awaits in that challenge. And then later on this evening, under the lights, Saturday night, we're going to break out the Texas Oak, a strongman implement making its appearance here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational in the CrossFit competition. We saw some strongman stuff happen at the CrossFit Games inside the Coliseum. That was exciting, and I'm sure the Texas Oak will not disappoint as well. Joined on the desk now by the two men who are responsible for programming this competition, Chris Spieler and Josh Bridges. Guys, thanks so much for doing this. Let's talk about the events today. What is the uh, main focus of these three tests? I mean, back at it, right? <laughs> so a wide variety again. We're going to see some really cool stuff um, in regards to some outside the regular standard with Turtle. Um, got one of the workouts that I don't think has been released yet. Yeah, yeah. Six, is, yeah. six is not released. Nope, That's not right. released, which I, I'm super excited to watch that. That'll be fun. And then what's this evening? The Texas We're, we oh. we're going to put up wow. a big, heavy piece of wood. Yeah. It's going to be pretty cool, huh? Yeah. That's going to be, I'm really excited about that. For event number five, we've got monkey bars in it, but it's called the turtle. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any rhyme or reason to that name? I've been racking my brain for it. Well, I think the, the turtle implement, you know, it looks like a big turtle shell. Oh, interesting. Okay, gotcha. Well, tell I, I don't know if I just released something I shouldn't have, but no, <laughs> I, I, think, I, think, yeah. I think it's good. Okay. Yeah. Well, tell me this. Of all the different, you know, we've, you've got the hill, you've got the pole, you've got the monkey bars, you've got the lunge. To you, what's kind of the crux of that that's going to make or break somebody's performance on it? I think there's going to be a combo that is sneaky on the athletes, which they're probably not going to like to hear this, but I think the combo of the legs that are going to happen from actually the turtle into the lunge is going to be 
a different uh, response than expected. A different response. <laughs> I like that. Okay. I also, yeah, I think pulling that turtle up a hill is going to create some, I don't know, maybe some interesting things are going to happen out there. And, and for the viewers at home, this is always the case. The incline and the grade of that hill, it doesn't do it justice when you see it on camera. If you get out to the field and you walk it, trust me when I tell you this, it is a steep, steep incline. So it's no joke. It's going to be great. Yeah, I can't wait. Why did you guys decide to bring out uh, Log for the strength test on Saturday night? I that was a non-negotiable. Yeah, that, <laughs> that, really really yeah. 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 that came in and was like, hey, this is happening. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> got it. Well, guys, we're really Really looking forward to seeing how this plays out. Good luck with the Legends competition today as well. That's been a lot of fun, and uh, thanks for stopping by. I appreciate you guys doing this. Yeah, appreciate Thank it. Thank you. All right, let's take a look at event number five, the turtle with monkey bars. We're going to start with an axle bar lunge at 155 for the men, 105 for the women. Then the monkey bars come into play. You got the hill run and then the bag pull, which looks like a turtle. Then we're going to work our way back down, and we're going to do a monkey bar traverse and then and axle bar lunge to close things out. This is the opening event of the day. So now that you've gotten to pick the brains of the men who have programmed this event, Pat, what do you think the keys to success are gonna be? Well, as you see that on the screen, it's an out and back, right? Make your way up to the hill, do the bag pull, then you're gonna make your way back through the monkey bars and end with the lunge. So for me, it's that final trip home. That bag pull up the hill is going to burn the grip unquestionably. And then what are you going to need on those monkey bars? That same grip that is now taxed. You're going to be out of breath, oddly fatigued, and then be left with a miserable front rack lunge to the finish line. So that's, that trip home and grip, that's where it is. Jamie Higia now back on the desk. And this is some outside the box stuff here. With that being said, who are some athletes that you're keeping your eyes on? I'm looking at Patrick Vilner on the men's side. He is a former gymnast so he and a very seasoned veteran of the sport. So he knows himself. He knows how to pace. He knows that he'll, he will be strong on those traversing, traversing the bar. And then on the women's side, I'm looking at Laura Horvath because she is a rock climber. And she, that, she has that in her background and definitely will be strong on that as well. CrossFit competition will get going at about 10.05 local time. So more on that later. We're going to switch gears and start talking strongman. But first, Jamie was able to catch up with Mary Tyson yesterday. She is the American record holder in the clean and jerk. I am with Mary Tyson Lappin. She is the current American record holder in the women's clean and jerk at 163 kilos. Thank you so much for joining us, Mary. Thank you for having me. Okay, now it says that you have never lifted competitively before 2018. Is that true? First of all, yeah, yes. Wow. I, yeah. Can you I give us a little bit of a background of what you were doing before Olympic lifting? Yep. Um, so I did all kinds of sports when I was young. I did like the basketball, soccer, track. Um, I did track all through college, and then I took some years off, thinking I was done competitively competing in anything. And then when I was 27, I kind of got a hold of, or USA Weightlifting got a hold of me through this recruiting program, basically, and then. I started weightlifting and I was not very good at first. Um, I had some goals, but I didn't really know if they were attainable or whatnot. So they, I've been lifting for what, five years now, about almost five years. And yeah, I didn't think it would turn into what it has, but it's been really, it's been a fun journey. What has been the most helpful thing on your journey of bettering all your snatch and your clean and jerk? Um, it's really weird, but honestly, I, with COVID, I was furloughed from my job. I got kind of like a trial period of what it would be like to be a professional athlete. So I ended up being furloughed for five months, got super strong, realized that it's easier to train and compete when I'm not having to work it around work. So I figured out a way to quit my job and train full time. And as horrible as that pandemic was, it was kind of a weird in a really weird blessing, in a weird way, a blessing in disguise for me. So that's kind of what helped me a little bit. Yeah. And when you hit that, when you beat that American record, what was going through your mind when you were on the platform? Um, I don't know. Gosh, it was at the, at the Arnold on the rogue stage. And it was, um, I, I imagined it in my head lots of times. I had attempted it two years before at the Arnold in 2020 and the many things that I had imagined, the way it happened was not how I imagined it. I did not, I didn't imagine it happening on my second attempt. I just assumed I'd miss it on my first attempt and then take it on my third and make it. <laughs> um, but I ended up making it on my first or my second attempt at the meet, my first attempt at that weight. Um, but yeah, it was, it was very, very exciting. Super awesome crowd, super awesome venue. 
It was a lot of fun. And it seems that the sky is truly the limit for you. What are your goals for the upcoming future? Um, I, I'm going all in. We, I'm living where my coach lives now. We sold our house, moved down to where he lives. Um, so I'm going to train as hard as I can for the 2024 Olympics. Um, I guess, I, like I said, go all in, see what happens. I and think, yeah. Joined at the desk now by Dr. Bill Crawford as we turn our attention to the strongman competition. We had three events yesterday, and I think every one of them provided us with a wow moment. What stood out the most to you after day one? Well, that beautiful tower of power deadlift, 900 pounds, 12 reps by Pavlo. That's red meat for the strongman <laughs> fan. I also really enjoyed the head-to-head -head competition. Mm -hmm. That's really exciting to see the dumbbells. You get the crowd right in front of you. And then also those bags. You can see what everybody's doing at once. All exciting. Yeah, three events down for the strongman competition, three on tap today. And then at the end of the day, we will crown a champion. It's Alexei Novikov, who has a 1.5 point lead over Trey Mitchell. Martins Litsis is lurking. It's six points back of Novikov. And then Pavlo Naganechny sits in fourth place with 20 points. But Alexei Novikov had a huge day one. He was impressive. Very impressive. I think what I saw out of him was a lot of maturity. He's coming to his own as far as knowing how to play each event. He got just the reps he needed for the deadlift. And he's the king of the, the sear dumbbell. He did what he had to do there. Perfectly executing two repetitions at the end, right to the very end. He was very methodical with the bag. He didn't just scoop it up and run. There was no time limit. He took his time. He did everything he could to maximize the points for the day and finds himself with a very solid lead in the, in the beginning of the competition. He was very tactically smart uh, in that Husafel's sandbag carry. If Martins Litsis is going to repeat as champion, he's going to have to do some work today, maybe hit some home runs. He's got to hit the home runs. He's, have to, he's got to get some knockout punches, a couple of wins under his belt, and he also needs some help probably. Six points at this level of competition is massive. So he needs to have some other guys help him. Can he do it? Yes, he could, particularly in a couple of events. The one that I would really look at is the stones at the end of the competition. A couple guys who may have surprised some people. First, you know, Trey Mitchell, who at one point was your overall leader, and then Pablo Nakanechi. This is the first look that I think a lot of people might be getting at this kid. He is legit. Very legit. I mean, he's been America's Strongest Man. He won the Shaw Classic. Uh, he was the tester here last year, so he's had a whole year to get ready for this. He really wanted to be here and really wanted to do a great job. So I think he is somebody that we've known inside, and this is his coming out, so to speak. What about Pablo Nakanechi? What's impressed you about him? Pablo, as we said last night, you know, for all of us who study the firmament of strongman, he's a shooting star, and we knew he's coming. He doesn't have a lot of experience in strongman yet, but we, we know his potential. He's really huge and thick. He's got a big body and, and, and incredible body strength. I mean, for him to be at this point, you know, in the top five, I thought a top five finish for him would be an exceptional start. This is a really good start for him. Yeah, you mentioned the Tower of Power. We kicked the competition off yesterday with that. That was an impressive implement. Same story today. We're going to start with the Rogue Coaster Pull. It's a 54-foot incline, and that is an impressive implement out there. It's 16,000 pounds of steel. you got another 1,000 pounds of wood on there. And, of course, the track 54P, and they have a 90-second time cap. This is going to be a blast to watch, but one of the keys to success here. Well, you have to be able to set your hips and use your whole body. You also want to move your hands quickly because it is a timed event. When you get to this place, you've got to have a grip and it's going to get harder and harder as you go. So it's really going to have to be the coordinated pull with a great grip. I think this is going to be separating a lot of the guys out today because it's going to be early in the day and it's also an implement no one has seen. So everybody's on the, on the, on a, on a level playing field at this time. There hasn't been a lot of hand over hand in, in yeah. top strongman in a long time. Who do you expect to do well? Uh, <laughs> I actually went down and watched a little bit of the testing, and Pavlo, they got it to the top. It's, you know, he basically was doing rows with it and then hand over handing and then rowing with it. Based on his body size and just incredible strength, that's the guy I'm going to watch today. You mentioned that some men may struggle with this test. Who do you expect to maybe not have the easiest time with a rogue coaster? Pull? Well, I think it comes down to grip. Uh, a lot of experience in, in strongman is going to be helpful, but that coordinated pull, and a lot of guys haven't done that sort of thing. So, uh, but most of it's just going to be longer levers are going to are going to play out because each pull will mean more for you. So the taller guys will have an advantage over maybe the shorter athletes. But if you can't hold onto the, onto the rope, it doesn't matter. So it'll be exciting, but I think the taller guys, the bigger bodies are going to really come forward on this one. It is going to be a jam 
packed day here on Saturday at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. One more look at the schedule. Get comfy and don't go anywhere because there is going to be a ton to watch today. Wall-to-wall -to -wall strength and fitness. We're going to get things kicked off with the Rogue Coaster Pull. That's at 9 a.m. local time. The first CrossFit event will be the Turtle. That's at 10.05. Three events for the CrossFit athletes. We have three events for the Strongmen. The legends are going to be out there as well, and we will crown a Strongman champion later on tonight. The Rogue Iron Game will be checking in with you during the day to keep you updated on everything that's going on and break down all the action, and you'll be able to watch all the events live right here. For Dr. Bill Crawford, Pat Short, and Jamie Hagia, I'm Sean Woodland. That's the Rogue Iron Game for now. Stick around because the Rogue Coaster Pull is coming up next.
We are in for a wild ride as we kick off the second and final day of the Strongman competition here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. Thank you so much for being with us today from the Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. Three events remain for the Strongman and then we will crown a champion at the end of Saturday. I'm Sean Woodland, joined by Lauren Chalet and the four-time World's Strongest Man, Brian Shaw. And Brian, how badly do you want to be down there giving this thing a try? I mean, just looking at this piece of equipment, Bill, Katie, the entire Rogue team killed it, and I would love to be down there for sure. A lot of just six points separate first from third right now in the overall standings. A lot still needs to be decided here. Loads to be decided. Big, big points up for play. This is going to be an important event. Alexei Novikov comes in as your overall leader. He has a 1.5 point lead over Trey Mitchell. Martins Leitzies is within six points in third place. He has a lot of work to do today if he wants to erase that deficit. Event number four is the Roga Coaster Pull presented by Rogue. 54 feet up that incline. Laws, what are the keys of this event? So this is a very interesting event. We see arm over arms quite regularly in Strongman, but Rogue have gone extreme with this setup. The athletes need to have long levers, strong legs, strong back, and a strong grip is important in this one as well. Let's send it down to Kiki Dixon with more on the Roga Coaster. Guys, the Roga Coaster is an impressive new implement for our Strongman. It's made out of 16,000 pounds of steel, 1,000 pounds of wood that comes right right from Texas, and then this track, they've got to get those sandbags up, it's 54 feet. The goal was to mimic an old-fashioned old roller coaster, and hats off to Rogue, because mission accomplished. That is an impressive implement, and just, it's the little details, too, that it will make the clicking sound that you hear from a traditional roller coaster as that cart works its way up the track. Rogue really have gone all out with this equipment. As I've said before, we've seen many different types of arm over arms in competition. We've seen trucks pulled, we've seen boats pulled up hills, sleds, but this contraption is incredible. It, I'm sat here retired and I'm excited to try and go out there and give it a try. I know, Brian, you are all over this type of event. Would you love to be trying this one? Oh, I, I would love to be trying this. And like you said, the build is incredible. It's extravagant, it's eye-catching. And I think it's everything probably they wanted it to be. Now, these competitors coming out here today, what I will say is this is a, 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 uh, an interesting way to start the morning, right? So making sure that you're prepared, you're mentally prepared, you're warmed up, your body's ready to go. All of these factors are very, very big with this. And uh, hopefully these guys are psyched up and ready. I mean, look, just looking up at that track is going to be something else. We've got our first athlete out there, Kevin Ferris. He's an athlete with an extremely good grip. How do we think he can do on this one? I think Kevin can set a really, really good benchmark here. Uh, like you said, phenomenal grip. Uh, his technique looks good off the start. It looks like that rope, there's a lot of play in it. So keeping tension on the rope is going to be a big, big factor here for these guys. So they're not trying to re-grip. They're not trying to, you know, swim, in essence, to catch the rope and, and uh, get their hands in place. So the tension is important. One thing I'm noticing there that Kevin is already wrapping that rope around his hand. Now, Kevin probably has one of the best grips out of all these athletes, but he's one of the lighter athletes as well. If he's struggling with grip, I think some of the guys are really going to struggle. Well, the fatigue factor of the grip is a big thing as well. So, you know, as you're going through this, maybe the first couple pulls are very, very strong, very solid. And then as you get into it, if, you, if your hands start to slip just a little bit, your back can be as strong as you want it to be, but the problem is your connection point is slipping, and then you've got a problem. This event will end not when the cart gets to the top, but when the bag gets dumped out, goes down that slide, and hits that red mat. That's when time will end. And there's a 90-second time cap here, and, and Ferris is getting closer to the top here. Ten seconds to go to try and finish this off. He looks like he's come to a standstill now. And like you say, it's all about the connection. He could still have the power in the back and legs, but if that is going through the hands and he can't hold on, he can't apply that power to every drive. Yeah, I think for the guys, and again, we haven't been out there on the floor to see the conditions, but if there's any type of moisture whatsoever on that rope, things can change a lot with this, right? So if the rope is really dry, that is a completely different event compared to if the rope has a little bit of moisture. So you may be seeing that. I mean, I think Kevin looks very frustrated. And what I would say is 
the guys are going to know that Kevin has a pretty good grip, right? So coming into this, that's probably going to concern a lot of them that he didn't finish because they would probably be expecting Kevin to finish just like I would be. I'm, I'm actually pretty surprised that he didn't get that done. So this is a tough pull, and uh, the guys are going to have to work. They're really going to have to work to put the points up on the board. And a lot of these guys looking at the overall scores strategically, they need to step up. And, and uh, you know, I think Max is is the next guy that really has his back against the wall, and he's got to make a move right now if he's going to do anything in the overall points. So Max didn't have a good day yesterday, but this is an event that he does like. Saw him do a very similar event to this at your competition, the Shaw Classic. I believe he won that event. He did. He did win that event, yeah. So we'll get a real good idea of how difficult this event is watching this man now. Well, his Max's arm strength is phenomenal. His grip strength is phenomenal. Again, a taller guy, so his levers are very, very good. So if he can maximize that, and if he can stay connected to the rope and use good technique, keep tension on the rope, I think that Max could be a, a potential winner of this event, you know, and, and uh, could put a lot of pressure on the guys that are going to follow him here. Let's go back and take a look at Kevin Ferris's attempt. He started off really well here and was making some good, solid progress until just got stuck. His first pulls were powerful. He's getting good distance on each pull. The cart is going up quite a good distance. He just started fatiguing in, in those hands. It, and like I said, Kevin's one of the strongest in terms of grip strength. But it's that lactic acid that builds up in the forearms. It's a little bit different to just holding on to, to a bar, perhaps. An arm over arm typically takes a, a different kind of grip strength compared to, say, a forearm or a carry, something like that. So as you're re-gripping, like you said, Lawrence, I don't think many people understand how much your arms get pumped with an event like this. Because, I mean, you think of how many times you're touching that rope, how many times you're gripping it, squeezing, trying to pull. So, you know, getting good length out of each pull is important. But one thing I will say with Kevin is you see him re-gripping a lot there in the rope. Um, that the indicator is the tension from where they are seated to where the actual uh, track starts. And if that tension is good, that's, that's where you know you've done a good job. But if you're having to take multiple grips to grab the rope, it's also going to fatigue your grip a little bit. He was quite loose with the rope quite often in those pulls. We can definitely see a more a small, a smoother transaction between each pull. Yeah, I mean, you can just see at the end here, he's just, just slipping on the rope. I mean, it's, it's again, it's not that he doesn't have any power left uh, to pull it. It's just when your hands can't maintain that grip, you can't move the cart. It's as simple as that. So Maxime Boudreau up next. And Maxime is an athlete we expect to do well on this one. Yeah, you can see the focus on his face. He's ready to go for sure. He knows he needs a big performance here. This is an event, when he looked at the six events, he'd be thinking, this is an event I can win. Yeah, he's, he's really, really got to step up here and, and uh, set a mark uh, with this event. And, and for him, personally, starting day two with a strong event is going to be very important to his overall performance because he could do well here. I think, you know, from watching some of his training, it looks like his uh, uh, yoke into log medley has gone well, and he's definitely a guy that's a threat on the stones as well. So he could make a big move here. Day two on paper, much, much better day for Maxine. Let's see how he does on the roller coaster. He's starting fast. He's almost halfway up that ramp already. Good, powerful pulls. And you can see with Max, the, the tension on the rope is staying much better. I don't know if that rope has actually touched the ground in the middle, which is huge. Seems to be doing shorter pulls than Kevin, but keeping that tension, moving through the rope nicely, using that leg power. He's just, he's got to finish strong now here. He's almost there. And this is where the fatigue is really, really going to set in. This is looking good. Way ahead of Kevin Ferris at this point. Already passed him by two feet. Now the question is, can he get to the top and dump those bags out? I think he can do this. He's breathing. He needs to remove the belt. That's his partner in the back, Canada's strongest woman cheering him on. Four more feet to go. And Boudreaux's got go. it. Our first finish. And that will be time. 109.89 seconds for Maxime Boudreaux. Now, they, this tells me this is a brutal event. I know you'd like to be down there trying it. I am quite happy up here watching. <laughs> <laughs> See, Max 
I think there what you saw is the breathing, the breathing factor. And uh, because of the, the longer time limit, right? So when, once you start passing a, about 45 seconds, that's where your breathing is really going to come into play here. And I think what you saw with him uh, in the belt situation, maybe he could have gone with a different setup there yeah. with the belt and, and maybe just gone with the soft belt instead of um, the, the more of a power belt on top because he didn't really need that. And again, his arms and back are strong enough to pull that without that setup. Do you find with arm over arm, every setup is different? Like, I, I've, I've had experience of arm over arm before. Some are really, really heavy, some are light, and you can tend to just pull more of the arms. It's never an event that you can guarantee what's going to happen. You know, some events like a deadlift, we know the results and what they're going to be like. This type of event, much, much harder to predict, much more room for error and different types of results. Yeah, what I will say watching, watching the first two competitors go is I have to say I think they did a great job on the weight I think it's it's a, a true test of strength we've seen that now like you said yeah <laughs> Max doing what he just did there that shows how difficult this is and I think that you're gonna get a great separation through all of the competitors but you're right every yeah, setup is different and learning this apparatus for example you know somebody that may be able to get get away with having a little bit more slack in the rope with a different arm over arm. This one, you may not be able to get away with it the same. Do you think the other athletes will be watching Max perform there? One minute nine, thinking, damn, this is tough. If it's taking Max over a minute to finish this event, what's going through their head right now? The guys that were concerned at all about this are going to be more concerned, and the guys that are, are potentially in the mix saying, hey, this is an open door now, because a minute nine, I, I could maybe do this in sub 60 seconds. And now they know the benchmark because Max is such a good puller. And to be fair, Kevin as well, that's a great pull. You know, it's, it's, it, that may be, and we'll see, the, the event will have to play out for sure, but that may be a great result as well. Absolutely. Let's take one more look at Maxime Boudreaux's effort as he is able to complete the entirety of this event inside the time cap, about 109 to move that 600 pounds the full 54 feet. Definitely had more tension on the rope than Kevin did. Making use of the leg power was every pull. I think one factor there with Maxim, he didn't have to go to the point of wrapping the rope around his arm. His grip strength held, held out through the whole event. Strategy-wise as well, and I don't know, again, if this would come into play or not, but possibly having a little bit of chalk with you on the platform because now the, the other guys have seen, hey, this is going to take a little bit longer. And if my grip starts to go strategically, maybe you pull it three quarters of the way and then take, you know, 10 seconds to re-chalk and then jump back on it. That could that could be a factor here. But again, strategically, if you can go later in, in the uh, lineup, you're always going to get a little bit of a learning especially if you can sit back and watch, right? You watch the first couple guys and you learn, and that's the way that you should do this as a, a top-level competitor. And that is a key point there, is being able to adapt and watch what happens through an event, and especially a new event that we haven't seen before. Brilliant point there by Brian. Hey, Thor Melstead coming up next. Currently in eighth place overall, 10 and a half points. His best finish of the competition was a fifth in event number two. Those last countdown seconds before the event start is very different for strongmen here at the Rogue Invitational. The guys are not used to that. They're used to just setting up and saying go. Uh, so that little little waiting period, you're kind of playing the mental game a little bit about what is in front of you. And like I said, that viewpoint of staring, <laughs> we can see it there now. At that going up is. Uh, it's something else, man. I mean, that's that's got to be neat. Like I said, we talked about it already. I, I would love to be sitting down there and watching it. And, you know, seeing that progress uh, happening is, is huge. It's about a 20-degree incline. Master, this not looking like his favorite event this weekend. He's yeah. digging deep. He needs to keep fighting for every foot. Thing. Watching what we've seen so far, there's going to be athletes that don't finish, so he needs to keep digging deep, keep pulling, keep trying to get that cart as high up on that ramp as he can. 40 seconds left. He's still got time to do this. 
and maybe the fact that he's not rushing, he can save a little bit of energy towards the end, keep the, keep the cart moving. Kevin went off fast, but he burnt out. Aether is still managing to get pulls in this. He's got 25 seconds left. Yeah, if he can keep this moving, like you said, he might be under good points here. I think he's just with that pull gone ahead of Kevin. Come on, Melster, keep it moving. Nine feet to go. Ten seconds, two more pulls potentially. If he can get a big pull, he may do this. One more, he's going to have to be quick. Oh! And Melster's oh, going to get won. it. There, there we it go. Is. He gets it. Wow. The score is when the first bag hits the mat, so Melstead does get in inside that time cap. We just have to wait for the official score, but Maxime Boudreaux will still be your overall leader, but that is a great effort for Athor Melstead, who's able to get those bags to drop just inside that 90-second mark. I think Athor's going to be very pleased with that performance. Beforehand, you know he wasn't looking forward to this event. Solid run there, finished it. That's a big thing for any athlete, especially on these new, impressive-looking events. You just want to finish. I think, like you said, he had a good strategy going in. He started wrapping fairly early, and I think that was a strategy move to save his grip a little bit. Yeah. He worked through the clock, and again, he completed the course. And, and uh, you know, to beat Kevin in this, and, and it would only be fair to ask Kevin, hey, would you go differently had you gone later and seen a couple guys go because you know the first first competitor out on a new event i mean that's tough so and you could be super talented but you don't know how to attack it so you know if kevin would have went slower for example and it, it needed to be faster he could very well flip-flop and say the exact opposite thing hey i should have gone quicker you know so it's it's a um uh, an advantage to go later, much later in the uh, competitor order so for sure. You're sat with us here. If you were out there competing now, would you be looking at big, powerful pulls, just focusing on getting it done, or would you try and be going to really fast movements? So what, what I would say for me is I would compare this very much to the bolt pull in Malta in 2009, right? And what I did for me is I knew the technique I was gonna do, I knew my strategy, and I stayed in my own head, my own zone, and I didn't care how hard some of the other guys made, made it look or how badly they were hurting or whatever. I just said, you know what? I know my ability and I'm confident in what I can do. And I just went out and attacked it. So for me, I would do that exact same thing. I would look at it, I would watch these guys for sure, but I would have already played with this apparatus um, in the testing and I would have I came up with what I thought was going to work. And maybe I would have tested it more than some of the other guys would have, potentially, if I needed to. But I would attack it that way and, and have my game plan. And, and unless I saw something monumental that was very different, I would see how the clicking happened and, and kind of have that dialed in. That's how I would personally attack it. But, you know, again, maybe it's not fair uh, to ask me because I love arm over arm events. Uh, it's one of your you favorite know. events. That's, yeah, an event you've done extremely well at in the past. I think. Melstead there, we just saw how happy he was. Very pleased with that performance. We've got Bobby Thompson up next. Still waiting on Melstead's official score, but he needed every second of that minute and a half to get that thing done as Bobby Thompson comes in in seventh place overall. Started off pretty well, top five finish, fifth place. In event number one, back to seventh place finishes in events two and three. Bobby's more of one of these athletes that likes the power of it. The heavier, the better. The fact that this is heavy could suit him. If he's kind of just going to take his time, focus on powerful pulls, much better than I think if it was just a fast arm speed pull. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's fun to look at the guy's face a little bit as they sit down. And you saw Max's face with a, a tenace, tenacious look of confidence. Bobby looks a little concerned here. He's a bit timid looking yeah, on this one, isn't he? Yeah. It? It's not like a, a log lift for, you know, we see him approach the, the static events. Bobby's comfortable. And you can see already he's wrapping the rope around his arm for I, his first pull. I thought after watching Melstead, this would be a tactic that used. Bobby not known for one of the best grips, but he does have the leg power. He has the back power, so if he can just lock that grip in yep. and get as far as he can with each pull, perhaps if he doesn't rush, he can finish this off. Still waiting on Melsa's official score, but we do know that Maxime Boudreaux still has the mark to beat at 109.60 seconds, and Bobby Thompson gets to work here. Bobby knows he's one of these athletes, the fast twitch muscle fibers, he's all about power. 
he'll burn out quickly. So he's trying to get as much distance on this as he can early on. And then he will just dig deep and keep fighting. He is a fighter. He's someone that never gives up. The amount of times we've seen this guy batting and push himself. He really is a warrior. And he's going up quick. He's doing good. He, he's just got to stay in that attack mode right now as, as this starts to get painful. He really, really has to dig in here toward the top because this is going to be where he separates himself to get possibly a couple extra points. He's not looking as efficient in terms of technique, but the power is pulling him through right now. Goes ahead of Kevin. His next marker is Melstead, who I believe we didn't get a finishing time for. He's not official on the screen right now, but wow. there Thompson's we go. gonna get through. Big powerful pull. And Bobby but... Thompson is our new leader, 102.28 seconds. Now that tells me this event is suiting the big, powerful guys. The guys that can put that big distance down with each pull. And I think looking at guys that have got to come, that suits someone like Pablo Nikonitsky. Yeah, this back power that we saw yesterday on the deadlift, if he can hold on to that, use that back and leg power, he may be able to put in a decent time. Bobby's going to be thrilled with that. That's I, a I think. huge performance for Bobby. Yeah, massive, massive performance. And I think he needed it at this point in the competition for him. You know, I think... He was probably frustrated with a couple different things. And, you know, I mean, to step up like that starting day two is a big, big move for Bobby. And, you know, it's, uh, again, the advantage of going a little bit later in the clock. Uh, Maxime put up the time to beat, and now it just got beat. Not the performance I expected, as you two mentioned. The look on his face was not one that exuded confidence going into this event, but he is now our leader. This was, was fantastic. Pure power. Brian, talk us through his technique here. Well, he's, he's struggling a little bit with the rope position. And, you know, he started with the wrap and, and then, you know, kind of was, was swimming to get the rope and then sometimes wrapped and sometimes didn't. But I think what you saw a little bit was as the cart started moving, he started to gain some confidence. And that last pull there, he get, gathered huge momentum on that pull, pulled it straight across. That was a perfect finish there for Bobby. And look what it means to him. Oh, man, that's such a good feeling when you walk out to an event and you, you, you are concerned about it, and then it goes really well because I think both of us talking before were thinking Bobby might not do great with that, and, and he really stepped up and, and proved it. And I think as the cart started moving, like I said, his confidence grew, and he was like, wow, this thing is moving. I can attack it yeah. and, and keep going. And I think, you know, once you kind of get to that three-quarter, you know, area of finishing – and you're still feeling powerful and the rope is still going, that's when you have to dig and you've got to hit the gas and say, hey, I'm tired, but if I can just get it there a little bit faster, that's where we're gonna see the separation. And, and uh, it'll be interesting to see now how the other competitors go to attack this. Rob Kearney is going to be up next. Kearney currently sixth place overall, finished fourth in event number two, that's his best finish of the competition. And getting back to Bobby Thompson, that's huge for him because he's only five points out of a spot inside the top five. Yeah, I mean, Bobby, I would have expected more in the dumbbell from Bobby yesterday, but he's made up for it there with that performance. He'll be really pleased with his arm over arm here on the Roga Coaster. Now our next athlete, Rob Kearney, had a solid performance yesterday. Rob has the power in the legs, he has the power in the back. His grip is suspect. I'm expecting him to wrap this rope straight away. I think he'll he'll be watching what Bobby did there and saying, hey, if you can start with a wrap and get it moving. And then from there, he's just he's just got to attack. I mean, there's there's not much uh, for Rob that he can leave off the table, right? Like there, this is not a, I don't think this is a strategy event. I don't think it's anything where he can't give everything. He's just got to lay it out there and, and see where, where it falls. Yeah, he's got to attack this. We know he's powerful, and I think the fact that it's heavy could suit him. He's not built for this type of event in terms of he doesn't have the long levers, he doesn't have the, the best grip. But watching Bobby will have given him a lot of confidence. I would say that exact same thing, Lawrence. I mean, he's if Bobby would have struggled, Rob would probably play it a little bit different, but he's like, hey, you know what? Kind of a similar type of build, and he's going to go behind his back here with the rope. This is interesting.
I talked to Rob earlier this week, and he acknowledged the fact, like you said, Lars, grip usually isn't his thing, but he did like the fact that this rope is a little bit smaller. That's definitely an advantage for him. Often we see quite a thick rope on these arm over arms. The fact that this is a thinner rope will suit him. It's not that it necessarily makes it easier, but it's less, ta you, you, your forearms don't burn up quite as quickly on a thinner rope. Kearney getting right to work here. I'm not sure about having it behind him like that. Just, there's a chance of that burning through his midsection. It also just seems to be getting in his way more than anything. Yeah. Well, one, one thing I would say, and I don't know what was stated in the rules as far as taking the slack out of the rope, but every event that I've ever done, the person taking the slack is not supposed to put any tension on the rope at all. So the fact that there's tension there, if there was no tension on his back, this would be a much bigger problem. So I would think that the competitor typically has to clear the slack himself and that the person taking the slack is only taking that. So. It's an interesting thing, but again, I wasn't part of the rules menu, so I'm not quite sure. And, um, again, it seems like it's just getting in his way anyway. To me, it just seems to be getting in his way, lifting his top up there, causing him more issues than, than good, really. I think it's right for him to be wrapping around. We know the grip strength isn't there to just hold it. He's got the leg power, but the rope is in the way. He's not enjoying this at all. Yeah, it just doesn't look comfortable for him, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, he's just, he's just got to dig deep because, again, he, there's still some other competitors here to come, and he doesn't know how it's going to play out. So the, every every foot that he can get out of that, that cart is what he's got to do with this. Mentally, at this point, it's so draining. Mm -hmm. it's, it's one of those, he knows there's some very good athletes to come, but you've got to keep fighting. He knows there's two events to go, though, and um, the next event coming up could be a good event for him. So maybe it's best to just leave it there and save his energy for the next one. Rob Kearney will get about 25 feet unofficially on his effort. I didn't do that much work. We have five men remaining. How would you be approaching this, Lawrence, if you were if you were next up? So arm over arm is one of those events for me. I preferred it when it was heavier. The heavier pulls tended to suit me. I could engage more of that leg and back power. And it wasn't so bad in terms of grip strength, but I was a bit clumsy when it was really quick. So I would be trying to do a bit like Bobby Thompson did there, just wrap it around, big powerful pulls, try and get cover as much distance as I could in as short a time as possible, and hope that I could finish it within around the, the one minute, one minute 10 mark. If I had to keep going beyond that, I would have burnt out. I just wasn't, I, I didn't like the longer distances, longer times. You think you would try to wrap the, the rope? I, I would have probably wrapped watching Bobby then. Um, like we said earlier, it's a different type of grip strength. My grip strength was very good in terms of holding on to farmers' walks, bars, whereas on a, on, a, on a rope, if that starts to slip and pull through your hands, it kind of burns your hands out, can fatigue your hands for events to come, and also pumps up your forearms quite a bit. So yeah, I would have just tried to lock on, uh, wrapping the rope around my arm, and then just use that back and leg power. Let's take, take one more look at Rob Kearney, <laughs> Like you said, just never looked comfortable here. Yeah, you could tell right from the start this is an event. You could He had that nervous look on his face, the same as Bobby Thompson did, but it worked out for Bobby, whereas for Rob, it just seemed to get worse and worse. And you could see that confidence drain from him very, very quickly. I think Rob just wanted to be away from that. He's got a great event to come. He'll want to come back and prove what he's capable of in that one. But this one, it is horrible. When you know it's going badly, you just want to get out of there. What's interesting is he wrapped the rope around his back, but never really wrapped it around his wrist going through there. So I think that it was probably, I would I would guess, a friction thing that he was going for, so that, it, you know, going around his body and kind of through his other arm, he could maybe pinch it with right, his elbow. Gentlemen, I'm, sure, I'm sure he had a tactic in his head. I, I, just, don't, I just don't think it really worked out for him. Yeah. Mitchell Hooper is up next. Has a little bit of momentum. He won the Husseville bag carry last night to move himself up to fifth place overall. He's only two points out of a spot inside the top three. And Mitch needs a big performance on this one. He was a little bit disappointed in terms of the deadlift and the sear dumbbell yesterday. Brought it back on the sandbag carry. He needs a big performance on this one. And he's an athlete that's capable, fit. He's got good leverage, strong legs, strong back. Let's, he's smart as well. He's someone that will have watched these first athletes go and have, and have picked up some tips. I mean, it's his rookie year in Strongman. You competed with him this, uh, this year. 
He's an incredible athlete. You don't see many people like this, do you? No, Mitch is, is a guy that you can tell that he's studying and thinking, like you said, and he will be thinking. But at the end of the day, he's a good athlete. And a lot of times when you're a good athlete, you can step up and do things and just kind of watch and naturally pick it up a little bit more. So it'll be interesting to see how he attacks this. But again, he's in striking distance, like you said, and this, this event could put him into the top three. A big performance here sets the stage for the rest of the day. And that is his goal this weekend. He wants to get on the top three at the yes. Rosen Station. It would be an incredible finish to his rookie year. Oh, outstanding. I mean, you can't, you can't discount that. And again, with as well as Mitch has done this year, it's easy to forget that, that really this is his first year of top level strong. Early pulls are looking good. Nice, long, powerful pulls. His grip is holding out so far. He's not having to wrap. It's looking great. And he starts to wrap. I think just focusing on powerful pulls, not rushing, making sure every single pull you're covering decent distance. More than halfway there. You're making really good progress. A minute got, to go. He's got to dig in right now. Got to dig in. This is this is the time right now where it's going to separate him or not separate him. Time's going good. He's nearly there. Oh, wow. One more One pull. One pull and should do it. it. That's and a fantastic Mitch time. Mitch Hooper demolishes Bobby Thompson's top time. Looking for wow. his second straight event win here. 46.99 seconds. And he has demolished the time so far. Very, very big performance there from Mitch Hooper. Good start today too. He knows there's some great athletes, so there's no big kind of cheer at the moment. He knows some fantastic athletes still to come. But I think that could be some decent points for Mitch Hooper. That's a, a big way to step up right there. And I think you saw kind of through that midpoint, he started to, to wrap a little bit and, and you know maybe miss grip a, 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 just a touch there. But he dug in when he needed to dig in and he finished it and, and put up the top time. And I mean, right now that puts a lot of pressure on these next competitors. Yeah, they're going to be feeling it, definitely. I mean, for me, the, 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 the athlete under the most pressure is Martins Lissis, defending champion, six points away from that first place. This event is going to be very, very important for him. Yeah, this event is massively important. Uh, I mean, for, for all of these guys, but especially for Martins. He's, gotta, he's got to make a move to get up there a little bit. And, and it'll be interesting for Trey, too, and Alexi, because those two guys at the top of the leaderboard Will this event play out where it costs them points, or are they going to be able to stay in the mix? You, Go back and take one more look at Mitch Hooper here. Started off so fast. They didn't need to wrap around at all. Good, powerful pulls. It wasn't until halfway up he started to wrap, but he still maintained that power with every single pull. And he has a great engine on him. Coming from marathon running of all sports. Who, who comes from marathon into strongman? The uh, engine is good, as we as we saw on the on the uh, Husafel sandbag carry. Very talented golfer as well. And really employed a strategy that you were talking about earlier, Brian. You've got those early pulls, got some good momentum, then took a second, gathered himself, and that's where he started to wrap. Ladies and gentlemen, that really was a fantastic time there by Hooper. 46.99 seconds for Mitch Hooper, and after his win last night. He was talking to Kiki Dixon, and he said he didn't feel like the first two events really were indicative of the kind of athlete that he is, and now he is showing that off. That was important for him, and, and mentally, starting day two like that for Mitch, that's going to be solid points. I mean, after the number of competitors that have already gone, it's going to be good points. It's just now determining how good that's going to be, and it, like I said, it puts a lot of pressure on these next competitors, and you know, when you walk up to an event like this, if you got the pressure, do you miss grip a little bit? Do you do you try to rush too much? And you know, if you haven't practiced this and dialed in where your your hands are going to go, how you're going to grip, and you know where where the event is going to play out, if you haven't dialed that in and you haven't practiced it, doing it under pressure is much different than in training. So you've got to create that training environment where you're under a stopwatch and you you've got to do it. Um, so that you're used to gripping like that. So you can't casually train arm over arm and expect to come out here and then have the pressure 
and perform like that, you know? So I know for me, I practice very much that way. I'd put a stopwatch on it. I would have to beat a time. I would try to set expectations. And I felt like that helped me a lot in my training coming into any type of an event like this. Here's Pablo Nakanetsi who comes in in fourth place overall. He won the opening event, the Tower of Power. He's got 20 points and he only trails Martins Lietzis by a half point for third place overall. I don't know why, but I, I think this could be a great event for him. I really do. I've never seen him do an arm over arm before, but when you look at the way he's built and you see the events that he's strong at, he's got that powerful back. I think he's got the long levers. Watching the guys that have gone before him, he'll, he'll, hopefully he'll have understood what he needs to do. I think if he can have the engine on him and finish this in a decent time, he's going to be powerful, for sure. Every single pull, I'm expecting a big distance. It's whether he can keep that going through the time limit. Mitch Hooper's score has been updated now to 42.53 seconds. Wow. wow. 20 seconds faster than Bobby Thompson. It'll be interesting here with Pavlo to see how much tension he can keep on the rope. Like you said, Lawrence, I think his pulls will be powerful. There's no doubt about that. But will he lose so much tension on the rope that that's what's costing him time? Yeah. He's wrapping straight from the start, so let's see how much distance he can pull in every rep that he uses. Comes into the rope, but we saw the power. Look at the distance he gets on that cart flying up that ramp. Already 20 feet in. Something you said earlier there, Brian, about the preparation you would have put into this event. He looks like he's got the power, maybe he hasn't put that specific training into the armor of arm. But look how quickly it's still flying up there. He has tremendous power, 25 years old. He's got a chance here to beat and Hooper. Every pull, he's getting great distance. And he's done it. And he will get it. Wow. Pablo Nakanechny in about 39 seconds. I just feel with this guy, give him a year or two with some, you know, imagine him training with you, that your methodology and your kind of focus on events. The raw power that this man has is incredible. I, I was just going to say, I mean, it's, it's incredible to see the power, but if I could have just talked to him for 10 minutes yesterday, a little bit, and, and, it, and gone through this practice a touch, I think I think he would knock some time off that without a doubt. And that's the scary thing for everyone else. Yeah, he, <laughs> 38 he, seconds, and he looked like he was clumsy with the, you know, getting himself back in position, getting his hands in position, but he still, with that sheer power, put a performance in of 38.51 seconds. And he is now really putting the pressure on the final three men to go, the top three men in the overall standings, because as I mentioned before, he was only a half point out of third and just six and a half points back of his fellow countryman Alexei Novikov for the overall lead. And now the three men in front of him really need to come up with some solid performances if they want to stay in front of that man. The pressure is on. That, that is for sure. And, and uh, Pablo is going to be very happy with that. I mean, that's, that's stepping up to the plate. First Rogue Invitational. This contest at this level, to do that, what he did on the deadlift, what he did here, huge, huge. I mean, it uh, can't be, can't be um, understated what he has done, and that, that's massive. I mean, it's, it's going to end up moving him up the leaderboard, I believe, and it's, it's a great move starting day two. Let's go back and look at his effort, and while it's not maybe the prettiest thing, but certainly effective. He's just pure power. I mean, look how much... He's clumsy there with the rope, even that very first pull, but every time he clamps down, the power engage from those legs, from those backs, he gets so much distance on that car. I don't think he needed to wrap. I think he may have seen some of the other guys wrap. I think he should have started out and just gone for it. You know, I mean, I think trying to wrap is what cost him so much time, potentially. And it's crazy to say that with the time that he put up. Yeah. But if you look at the cart movement in between the time where it's not moving, all he's trying to do is get a grip back on the rope. He could potentially be down at the 30 second mark with some practice on him. I, I firmly believe that. I, I think that's totally possible and he proved it. But you, you just watch the cart move and, you know, I, I would have I said to him, hey, why do you even need to wrap it around the rope? I mean, if you've got that much power, unless the grip was slipping, but it, it didn't look like the grip was slipping at all for him. So. Great performance, nonetheless. I mean, it's we're sitting here analyzing and saying, hey, he did great, but he could have <laughs> done better. Won. It's crazy. Yeah. 
Martins Leitzies will be up next. Two third place finishes and then a sixth last night in the Husafel bag carry. He is your defending Rogue Invitational champion, but he certainly has some work to do here, especially after what we just saw Pablo Nakanechny put up with 38.51 seconds. So for me, this is all about showing that he's a true champion now. He's in a difficult spot. He needs a big performance. And that time from, from Pavlo and from Mitch are very impressive. He needs to try and beat those and hope that someone like Novikov comes behind them. Well, I think what you're going to see from Martins here is a more practice technique. He will have trained this in his gym, getting ready. And I think his strategy with the rope, I don't think you'll see him being clumsy with the rope. I think he's going to have a strategy he wants to execute to get that cart moving and to keep it moving and to keep the tension on the rope. So if he can get that done, I think Martins has the grip to get this done. But again, like you said, this is the moment. Go, this is the move you have to make. And you know, it all tends to come down to the last event where you talk about that. But if he wants to be in that battle in the last event, he has to make a move right now. Yeah, he really needs a top three finish on this one. Anything less than that, it's just not gonna be good enough. He's got, he's got to put some pressure on both Trey Mitchell and Alexei Novikov as well because they're coming out next. So if Martins does not step up and put that pressure, now it gives them an open door to potentially extend their lead on him as well. Absolutely. Leitzies is just about set here. He is one of those athletes that seems to be able to pull it out the bag when, it, when he needs it. And we'll see what he's got first event of day two at the Vogue Invitation. He looks focused. He's, he's definitely ready to go. Fantastic grip strength, great leg strength, back strength. He's again another athlete that's got all the attributes and he's attacking this fast. Shorter pulls than we've seen from Pablo, but quick, much better hand transition. Doing well. He's going to keep his pace up. 20 feet, 25 feet now. 20 seconds gone by. He's moving it well. He's going well. If he can keep this up, he's going to do this. Different technique, but it's working. Creeping closer. Martins Leitzis has a chance here to set the top he's score. He's going to do it. And, and he will go. get it. Pressure is on, and the Dragon delivers. Martins Leitzis, 33.83 seconds, your new top score. And that is why he is our champion. Rogue Invitational winner from last year. He wants to defend that title. That was big. That was an important performance. And, you know, when we talked about Nekunich earlier, it was that lack of transition. Martins was perfect there. He kept the tension on the rope all the time. Fast, getting himself back up. Unbelievable performance there. Yeah, he, he had to step up and do that. And, you know, I, I, I think before the event, thinking about it, Martins has all the tools to execute like that and he did it and right and now the pressure is off of him he, ju he just put the marker up now now it's it's alexi novikov and trey mitchell yeah. they're going to be feeling it and for people who maybe have not watched a lot of strongman you think of all about just strength and power but you forget and we were talking about this last night the technique that's involved and there's an example of why technique is important because Nakanechi, as you said, may have had this, the strength to beat that score, but he just didn't have the technique. Leitzi's much cleaner here in this effort. Just being the strongest isn't enough in Strongman. We're sat next to one of the, the, the best technicians there is, someone that really thought about every single element of the sport. You're the best man, Brian, to tell people about that. You have to be well prepared on these type of events. Yeah, you definitely do. I mean, the only thing that I would say sitting here is, that I would be asking about as a competitor, for sure, is the, the man taking the slack, taking the rope, why is there so much tension on the rope, right? Like this event, in my opinion, the, the competitors should be asked to clear the rope themselves. And with that, when Martins is regripping, there's so much tension coming out the back. Why, why is that happening? But again, it's happened for everybody. We mentioned it with Rob Kearney. So at least they're being consistent with the, the So it's, it's interesting to see, you know, as the, um, you know, event is going on here, the technique, like you said, Lawrence, if you're well-practiced, right, and you're going into this, you just have to step up and execute, right? Well, so we've got two fantastic athletes to come. Trey Mitchell really performing well this year. We need to see what work he's put into this event because, you know, historically, this isn't going to be his favorite event. 
what kind of training has he been putting in to address this type of thing? Because if he can have a big performance here, if Trey can get top three on this, he's putting himself in a position to win this title. Nothing outside the top four so far for Trey Mitchell. Back-to-back second-place finishes to start off the competition and then a fourth place last night. Yeah, very solid start for Trey Mitchell. And this is, this is a moment, like you said, Lawrence, he can open the door, right? Because I think the question mark for somebody like a Bobby Thompson, who did relatively well in this event, now Trey is going to look at Bobby. Bobby is standing there with Trey. I'm sure that he's given him some advice and, and uh, technique. And, you know, that's the camaraderie of the sport that's so nice, right? Like, you, you can see Bobby Thompson there say, come on, Trey, let's get this done. So Trey has the pressure on him, but he also had the pressure on him in the dumbbell event. Yep. He stepped up. He had the pressure on him in the deadlift event. He stepped up. So he has come ready to play, and that, that cannot be discounted with Trey Mitchell. So let's see what he can do here. Well, we know he's in good shape. Amazing performance not so long ago at the Shaw Classic. Day one has gone fantastically for Trey Mitchell. Let's see how he starts day two, the roller coaster. Well, we know that he has the power. I mean, his back and legs, this will be no problem to move this. It is simply a grip factor for Trey. Can his grip hold out? Can he maintain a grip on that rope and be able to transfer his power into this event? And if he can do that, he can put up a great time. He doesn't need to win the event, but he needs to get in the mix. He's, I think right now for him, probably if he could beat Bobby Thompson on, on the leaderboard, I think that that would be a, a great result for him. Trey Mitchell. Trey introduced to the crowd. Looks a little bit nervous, as you'd expect in this position. He kind of always has that look on his <laughs> He face. does, to be fair. He, 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 you know, he, could, <laughs> he could be walking up to something he loves and, and kind of be looking like that. But, you know, hopefully, hopefully he can turn that into focus here and make this event happen. He's, he's an interesting character, very mild-mannered, very polite. You know, he's not a big character in terms of being on social media and stuff like that. But when it comes to competition, he is seriously one of the best in the world right now. Yeah, he, he has put the work in, and he is, like we, we were talking yeah, yesterday, exactly. he's improved tremendously, yeah. tremendously, and somehow still manages to fly under the radar a little bit when you're talking about the top competitors, but he's always at the top of the leaderboard or thereabouts. Here goes Trey Mitchell. Good power in those first couple pulls. He yeah, doesn't have the speed of Martins, but the power is there. Every single pull again, nice distance. Really got it. They're going to keep this thing moving. It's a good start. It's a much better start than I thought we were going to see from Trey. So this is good. This is really good. If he can keep this going, he's on for a decent time. Those Martins leads us by four and a half points for second place. Martins is safe, but this is where he's going to finish. He's going to finish this. And Trey and Mitchell, goes. and that looks unofficial, like it's ahead of Mitch Hooper. Third place so far for Trey Mitchell. He will be delighted with this performance. 40.89. Now that is big for Trey Mitchell to keep himself inside the top three after four events. Only two events remain after this. So a great effort from him. As again, he came in in second place overall with 25 points, trying to hold off Martins Litsis, who right now has the time to beat and only trails him by four and a half points. But Mitchell may have made it so that Leachies will not be able to erase that deficit in this event. Leachies would have definitely wanted more people between him and Trey Mitchell on this one. That is a big performance. And look at the power he gets. He's not comfortable in this event. You know, he's a bigger athlete. It's not so easy to be stretching forward and getting in position. But he put, he's clearly put the work in. Big, powerful legs. Big, powerful back. And his grip held out then as well. That's a huge, huge statement from Trey Mitchell. Huge statement. I don't think that either one of us was expecting No, that. I really wasn't. I, I'm so happy for him, man. He's, he's going to be thrilled. He's just such a great guy. And like you say, he often gets like, overlooked. People aren't always talking about him, but he is. Every comp we look at this year, he's always there or thereabouts. All eyes on Alexei Novikov. He will be the last man to go. He is your overall leader, and he only trailed Mitchell, or he led Mitchell, pardon me, by a point and a half. So Novikov's got to stay close to that time.
to stay in the lead here. I think you would agree, Lawrence, this is probably one of the events for Alexi that could, could be a little chink in the armor, potentially, right? So the, we were thinking the same thing about Trey Mitchell. So Alexi has to prove it right now. And now you, you start to see that leaderboard and you're, you're saying, wow, yeah, there's pressure. There's a lot of pressure. There is. I mean, there's been some great times put up. He could potentially do really well on this one. He could potentially drop back a fair few points as well. And then the competition is really on for the last two events. But let's see what Alexi can do. He is one of those athletes that sometimes surprise us. I remember watching him do a truck pull this year, earlier this year, and no one was expecting him to win. And he went and blasted everyone. You just never know with this man. He tends to step up in the moments where he needs to step up. And, and the best competitors will do that. Absolutely. So Alexi has proved that time and time again. He's a relatively young, still a young guy. I think he's the second youngest in the field. Which is incredible for, for his career thus far. He's done phenomenal. So, you know, these big moments, this, as a competitor, this is what you live for. This is what you want. You want the day to start. And now the event started, the adrenaline has built and built up to this moment. And this is what everybody wants to see. And this is what all the training comes down to right now. Did you put the work in? Can you prove it? It's time to step up and make it happen. 42 seconds is the number he's got to be thinking about right now in order to hang on to the top spot on the overall leaderboard. If he does not beat that time, he will I'm, surrender two I'm, points to Mitchell. I'm wondering if he'll take more of a, a Lisi's approach. He's you know, a shorter, smaller athlete. I think he's got the fitness to keep that engine going, be quick and transition quickly with the rope. I'm sure he's practiced this event. He is a smart guy. He's not someone that just turns up and thinks I'll have a go. He puts the prep in. He thinks about events. He'll have watched every single athlete go. It's interesting to see as well where his shirt is chalked up at. And I don't know if that's a strategy, potentially, if he needs it uh, to wrap the rope somehow. But... It's a lot of chalk to have on the shoulder. <laughs> I, I'm thinking it's either that or it's chalked still from yesterday. <laughs> that, that could be. That could be as well. <laughs> Maybe he didn't realize there's more than one T-shirt in the bag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's getting himself fired up now. This is a big performance time. This is where he needs to put the, the foot down and make it even harder for the chasing pack. Alexei Novikov has finished inside the top three in every single event. He won the Sear Bell ladder as expected and then finished second last night in the Husafel sandbag carry. On paper, when we looked at the events, you, you clearly think day one is better for him. He's, he's a front runner. He gets himself in the lead. Now he needs to keep that pressure on the rest of the athletes. He'll be feeling it because there's been some big performances. Here goes Alexei Novikov. The lighter athlete doesn't have that sheer bulk that some of the other guys have to kind of really pull hard against that car. But he's up about halfway already. He's going well. Yeah, this is a great start for Alexi. He's digging deep here. He's not worrying about wrapping the rope. He's keeping quick. Powerful pulls. More Come than up. halfway there. He's not going to beat this as his time looking at this now. Now where can he place? He needs to finish soon. One more pull and he could get second. And Alexei Novikov is there and a great oh, performance yeah, for Alexei Novikov. 39.04 unofficial, just edging out Trey Mitchell. Ooh. So instead of surrendering points, Novikov will build on his lead over second place Trey Mitchell. But Martins Litsis is going to be creeping closer now after this event win. 10 points for the Dragon. And that's a big win there for Martins. Last year, he only won the last event. He's already bagged an event in the start of day number two. He knows he's got the stones to come later, which he will believe he's going to win that one. He's an exceptional stone lifter. He's done everything he needs to do to get himself right back in this competition. And officially, it looks like Litsis is going to shave two points off of Alexei Novikov's lead. Litsis with 33.83 seconds to win the event. Pablo Nakanechny, another top three finish for him. He'll take second. And then Alexei Novikov, our overall leader, looking to stay on top of the leaderboard. He will finish in third place. Let's go down to Kiki Dixon, who is with our event winner, Martins Litsis.
Martins, congratulations on your event win. Now, this is the first time we've seen the Roga Coaster. Where did this one hurt the most? Um, well, I don't think I felt anything during it. I just kind of saw red and went. You went, it worked for you. Now, you are one of the strongmen that were able to go later in the game. What were you able to learn from the other strongmen that went before you? Um, quick resets. I could tell that it's not too heavy. It's really strange hearing my voice. Anyways, I could tell that it was not too heavy, so it was just about quickly re-grabbing the rope and just making sure there wasn't too much time between each pull. Now, you are the reigning and defending Rogue Invitational Champion. Two more events to go. What can we expect? I'm going to have to win them to win it. We'll see you back out here. Thank you very much. Thanks, our teams. First event win of the 2022 Rogue Invitational for Martins Leetzies and had the most unique technique of any of the strongmen here, and it pays off for him. Yeah, he mentioned there in his interview, he was trying to make sure he kept that tension on the rope, quick pulls, and it paid off for him. You know, we said Pablo had tremendous power, but just wasn't quite as efficient. Martins very well practiced on this, and it paid off there. A big, big event win for the defending champion. And Martins Leitzis gets his first event win of this Rogue Invitational, his second career Rogue Invitational win. Last year, he waited to the end of the competition to win an event, and it's Alexei Novikov who now leads Martins Leitzis by four points. Trey Mitchell stays in second place. He is now two and a half points back of Novikov. Pablo Nakanechny remains in fourth place, and Mitch Hooper stays in fifth. Rob Kearney will drop from sixth to seventh. And Bobby Thompson has moved up one spot into sixth place all by himself. Still want to give this one a try, Brian? I would love to give this <laughs> a try. I think that's a, a great result. You saw Martin step up as the defending champion, do what he had to do. He gained a couple big points back here in this event. And I'll tell you what, it's getting interesting. The leaderboard could change, but it's a lot of pressure now in these final two events for these guys. Yeah, lost two events left. What are you expecting to see here on the remainder of the competition? We're going to have such an exciting finish. It's getting very, very close at the top there. You know, Martins creeping up. Uh, Novikov getting the point on Trey, but Lissis was catching him as well. So they're just getting closer and closer that between those three. I think we're going to have an amazing finish. Mitch and Pavlo still fighting. It's going to be an amazing last two events here at the Rogue Invitational. Two events remain in the Strongman competition. Brian, thanks so much for stopping by. It's always great having you here. I, I know the audience learns a ton, as do I. We really love what you add to the broadcast. Have fun being a fan and uh, enjoy your time here. Thank you, guys. Really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun, and, and uh, you guys are doing excellent work. Thanks a lot, man. We are done for now for the Strongman competition. We will continue with the CrossFit competition in a little bit. Event number five, the Turtle, coming up for the women. The Dragon with his first event win here at the Rogue Invitational. The 2022 Rogue Invitational is brought to you by the Air Force. Join the fight. Beyond the whiteboard, fitness is a journey. Concept 2, innovative, high-performance training equipment since 1976. And by GORUCK. GORUCK is the rucking company. They build the world's toughest gear for rucking and training.
It's a bit of a fitness playground here at the Rogue Invitational as day number three of the CrossFit competition kicks off with some monkey bars. Glad you're with us, everybody, today at the Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. I'm Sean Woodland with three-time Affiliate Cup champion Adrian Conway. We're going to start with the women's competition today, and Laura Horvath does not have the lead, but she has a ton of momentum right now. Laura Horvath is on the charge, and with an event like this coming up that, in my opinion, is simply grunt work, she has an opportunity to do something we've never seen, and that could be three event wins in a row. Three straight event wins possibly for Laura Horvath, but a lot needs to happen between now and then. Here are your overall standings coming into this event. Gabriella Magawa grabbed the lead last night. 305 total points, leads Laura Horvath by 10. Emma Lawson, who led for a couple of events yesterday, now sits in third place, and Annie Thoris daughter is just 20 points out of a spot inside the top three as she continues to inch her way up the standings. Event number five is the turtle presented by Mayhem Athlete. We're getting outside the gym a little bit here, doing some, doing some stuff on the playground. We are, we've got a distance that we're gonna cover. We would categorize this as an out and back workout. We've got some axle bar lunges. For folks that don't know that, that means it's a thicker circumference than a traditional barbell. Monkey bar traverse, then they're gonna get to that hill and they're gonna run up it, but also execute a bag pull to the top. Monkey bar traverse back and then we're lunging to the finish. Let's talk about keys to the event here. You know, keys are to look left to right in this event. I don't often say that, but athletes do need to know where the competition is. This is going to allow them to play the field a bit and make a move when needed. And then, of course, it's hang tight. Each one of these is going to actually affect the athlete's grip, even the lunge because of the fact that their grip is pried open. So it's going to be a very grippy event here to watch. Let's bring in the third member of our broadcast crew. Kiki Dixon is down on the field. Guys, these monkey bars are 18 feet long and then they are spaced 22 inches between. The caveat is they must make contact with every single bar, otherwise they have to start from the beginning. If you're wondering why these look familiar, that's because they were last used in the 2017 CrossFit Games. But I tell you what, there's gonna be no monkey business here. All business. I see what you did there, Kiki. I see it. <laughs> we were gonna have four heats of five athletes, and heat number one is underway. And 16-year-old Olivia Kerstetter has done extremely well so far in her individual debut. She has, and she had a really great finish to the evening last, last night as, as we got to watch her execute DT with a spin. And I've got her here as an athlete to watch, simply because we're, we've got that out and back fashion of an event here. We're gonna get to see her toe to toe with some of the fittest ladies in the world, and I, and I can't wait to see how she responds. Manon Anganez, she and Danny Spiegel are getting set to close out their initial lunge with that 105 pound axle bar, and now they will move to the monkey bars. Olivia Kerstetter was making her way there as Danny Spiegel gets through those extremely quickly. We watched Spiegel execute that hand over hand transition for each monkey bar and it saved her a tremendous amount of time. Spiegel will make her way up the hill. And now she will pull the implement known as the turtle up that hill. And, and you've talked about this, seeing this hill on the screen is much different than seeing in person. I don't think the pictures on screen do the incline and the formidable presence of this hill justice. Absolutely not, not even close, Sean. I, I like this view that the audience is getting right now as we're watching the, in, the bag go up the incline. I got here on site just a few days ago and the first thing that I verbally said was, wow, that hill is a lot steeper than it looks on camera. Just 13 total scored reps here in this event and Danny Spiegel who is in the middle in those long gray pants is first done with the turtle pull and now she will head back down the hill and back to the monkey bars. And at this point, she's gotta be thinking, okay, relax, breathe. She's trying to almost shake her arms out and get prepared for this traverse coming back because that rope actually fatigued her grip quite a bit just to pull the bag up the hill. And on Anganez is back to the Monkey bars as well. Here comes Olivia Kerstetter as Spiegel is through, and then she'll 
get to work on her final lunge back across the finish line. Danny Spiegel coming in in 16th place overall. Does have one finish inside the top 10. That was a sixth in event number three. Danny extremely composed. And we can't overlook the, the, the skill set that these ladies are showing us, even through the steadiness of these lunges. It's, it's not light enough weight to forget about. It takes focus. The fact that the barbell is thicker than a traditional barbell, it can sometimes pull you forward. So they're doing a great job to stay upright and continue to move forward. Danny Spiegel has led from the very start of this first of four heats. And Danny Spiegel looking to pick up a heat win here. Just a couple more lunges to go. She is through. She will sprint across the finish line. And Danny Spiegel sets the early time to beat. Three minutes, 12.98 seconds. Now, Olivia Kerstetter has managed to pass Manon Anganese for second in the heat. And Anganese is in. There's a look at Olivia. 17th place overall, but her last two event finishes both inside the top 10. So she's gaining some momentum. Andrea Solberg is across, and that will leave Annika Greer as the last woman to finish. And she has one more section on that field to complete before she is done. So all the athletes in this opening heat will get in inside the six minute time cap. And even as we watch Annika finish her lunges, you'll notice that she gathers her steps between each and every, every lunge or every rep. And that might have been the best execution for her for what she had today. But we're going to see the faster athletes take step after step to continue forward. Danny Spiegel, your heat winner, 312.98 seconds. With just three heats to go. And had really no trouble with anything. Oh yeah, Danny, Danny executed that pretty flawlessly, including this rope pull. Notice that she actually used the opportunity to gather both hands together for each pull. There was no hand over hand action. She just gathered both hands and then used her entire body from her legs through her upper body to pull that rope each and every rep. The efficiency of that paid off, left her plenty of energy to finish strong on these lunges, and that got her an event win to start the day. Danny Spiegel with the early time to beat, three heats remain. She looks to work her way up the overall standings here. The Turtle, presented by Mayhem Athlete, is event number five of ten here in the CrossFit competition. We're just edging our way to halfway here, Sean. And, and the Turtle's fast, even though it doesn't say it in the name. It doesn't seem to symbolize that. But we've got axle bar lunges, which are traditionally a, a little bit thicker uh, than a traditional barbell. Then we're going to open up with the monkey bar traverse, where we'll see some hand over hand action, which is probably going to be the fastest way. The hill bag run and pull back down with the monkey bar traverse, and then finish, of course, with the lunges across that finish line. 105 pounds on the barbell and 105 pounds is what the turtle weighs, one of the keys to the event. It really pays off to be able to play the field. It's good to start fast and try to stay fast in this event, but it's good to know where your competitors are left to right. And then, of course, it's hang tight. This is a very grip-biased event where the athletes come right off the traverse and then have to handle a heavy bag right up that hill with the rope. Second of four heats is getting set. Still waiting on the athletes to take the field here. Carolyn Prevo, Jacqueline Dahlstrom, Emma McQuaid, Alexis Raptus, and Bailey Rogers will be the next women out as they are in the home dugout here at Dell Diamond Stadium. And it is pretty cool how Rogue is able to take a baseball field and transform it into a fitness carnival. You got the Rogue coaster that we just saw, the opening event for the Strongman sitting out in left field. Modder Hill is out in center field. You got Zeus, monkey bars. Yeah, I've gotten feedback from a lot of athletes here, Sean, that have, that have said this is one of their favorite places to compete. It's not even close, and that's why. It's the overall atmosphere. It's the experience. It's the programming. And it's also even the, the dugout that they can be stowed away at but be close to the competition floor. It's, it's really the details that comes down to really enjoying this type of event for the athletes. And of course, I think that's why we get to watch some of the fittest in the entire world that wanted to come be a part of this. 
Now the athletes for the second of these four heats are making their way out onto the field. You'll notice athletes are out there chalking the bar. People are like, well, why would they put chalk on the bar? This isn't even a grip intensive workout. And, and it, it is, although you kind of can overlook the fact that these lunges affect their grip. And they just want to make sure that they know where their hands need to go exactly. There's no knurling on these bars out there. They're, they're pretty flat slate. So what that means is that it's very easy to grab the bar in the wrong place. And it's a little cockeyed. And that can throw you off tremendously. Yeah, any little edge that you can get to keep that thing in the front rack position, you're definitely going to take in an event like this. Crowd continuing to make its way in here on this Saturday at the Rogue Invitational, the second straight year that this competition has been held at this venue. And also the second straight year that we have had a strongman competition as part of the Rogue Invitational. There's Alexis Raptis, who comes in in 13th place overall, but coming off a second place finish yeah, and last she, night. And, and, and Sean, she, she is who we're, we're, we're signaling on because she had a great night last night and really impressed me with her overall work capacity in that DT with the spin. The two of four is underway. We start with the 105 pound front rack lunge. Time to beat belongs to Danny Spiegel at 312.98 seconds. Oh, and by the way, what a great way to identify if your posterior chain is turned on after all the squatting <laughs> yesterday and all the pulls and hand cleans from DT. Here's some more lunges for you ladies. Alexis Raptus is out front early. Carolyn Prevo is about a lunge behind her, maybe a couple lunges now as Raptus picks up her pace heading towards the finish. She will drop the axle bar and now heads to the monkey bar. So Raptus starting to open up a lead here. Carolyn Prevo sits in second. Bailey Rogers will be the third woman to the monkey bars. Raptus no problem here. Yeah, great start for her, way to create some momentum. She was hand over hand on the monkey bars, and I think that's going to be very uh, repetitive for us to see. The athletes that are willing to commit to hand over hand there are going to gain a lot of time on the field. Raptus gets to work on the turtle, 105 pounds. He's got to pull up the hill. Here comes Carolyn Prevo, and Bailey Rogers will be the third woman there. Jacqueline Dahlstrom working her way up the hill, as is Emma McQuaid. And this is where you've got to be aware that this is completely a total body movement. If you notice the way they grip it and hinge over, Alexis Raptus here is using hip extension as she drives her feet into the, the platform and stands tall to pull the rope. Yes, her grip is on the rope, and yes, she's using some arms, but she is using very much her lower body and her posterior to get that bag up to the top. Raptus with about a 20-foot lead right now on Carolyn Prevo on the pull. Raptus right side of your screen. Rivo is on the far left. Raft is working her way back down and will head to the monkey bars. Has a minute 12 now to try and track down Danny Spiegel's top time from heat number one. And on those hands, smooth. Jerry Kiki Dixon mentioned earlier, these monkey bars were used back in the 2017 CrossFit Games. Raptus back to work on the lunge. Way ahead of the field here. And could be on pace to beat Spiegel. Bailey Rogers is now back to the lunge. She has moved ahead of Carolyn Prevo. Prevo right now to tie with Jacqueline Dahlstrom for third. And Emma McQuaid now belting up in the background there. Getting set to start her lunge with that 105 pound axle bar. This is again where we get to zoom out and watch the athletes as they execute the lunge. Most of them are just lunge after lunge now, one large step after another, not gathering their steps in between. Alexis Raptus, the momentum continues. A second place last night, and now the time to beat as she gets in ahead of Danny Spiegel, 303.18 seconds. Now 
Now Bailey Rogers in the black pants will be the next woman to finish. Carolyn Prevo is done. She will take third. Emma McQuaid comes in in fourth, and Jacqueline Dahlstrom will finish fifth place in the heat. The heat winner, Alexis Raptis, who had a second place last night in DT with a spin and looking for a top five finish here in the turtle. And we mentioned it. You know, momentum is, is, is a real thing. And, and coming off of an execution, uh, an event for her, the way she did last night, I think really opened the door for her to attack today with confidence and go after it. You know, it gives, it gives you the ability to just kind of let go or of self-doubt and, and present the best you out there on the field. It was close to start between Raptus and Prevo, but then Alexis Raptus just continued to put distance between herself and the rest of the pack. Yes, she did a great job on those lunges staying smooth, but here I really believe she pulled away a lot with using that violent hip extension to pull that, that bag up the hill. Great execution there to conserve her arms and grip, to attack these monkey bars with confidence on the back side of the workout. And then there was no looking back for Alexis Raptus, and that's what got her the victory. 303.18 seconds for Alexis Raptus. Beats Danny Spiegel by nine seconds. We have two heats remaining. Here's where we stand right now. Raptus and Spiegel one and two. Bailey Rogers just ahead of Olivia Kerstetter for third and Carolyn Prevo's time of 325.77. Right now the fifth best mark that we have seen, but two heats remain here in event five, the turtle. There's certainly been nothing slow about the first two heats that we have seen. Take a quick break. Heats three and four coming up next here in event five at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. Halfway through the fifth of 10 events here for the women at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. Sean Woodland and Adrian Conway with you. Kiki Dixon down on the field. Covering event number five presented by Mayhem Athlete, the Turtle. It's the Turtle, but it is not slow. We have got an axle bar lunge, which is a little bit wider in circumference than what we traditionally see in the form of a barbell. Monkey bar traverse. The athletes then get to the top of the hill for a bag pull and then they work their way back through the monkey bars and finish with a lunge across the finish line. Two heats remain, heat three of four coming up next. And the athletes are set to begin. Cara Saunders, Danielle Brandon, Ellie Turner, Ariel Lowen, and Matilda Garns. And there's there is Cara Saunders. Pardon me, Adrian. No, you're good. She had a she had a solid day yesterday, and 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 Cara Saunders in a workout like this, I think about her games experience, being able to adapt on the fly, 
Uh, certainly a powerful lower body. These lunges are going to be nothing for her. It's all about being able to manage the pace so she can get out in front and get after this event. Cara Saunders actually in ninth place coming in this event. 235 total points, has a second and a fourth. But she also has two finishes outside of the top 10, a 16th to start the competition, and then a 15th last night in DT with a spin. Keep an eye on Ellie Turner in lane three. Talk about momentum. She's got a second and a third underneath her belt coming into this event in the last two. I would imagine this would be a good event for her as well. Strong lunger. Anytime we see a squat type movement, it's something that she excels at, and that's certainly the way that we would categorize this lunge. There's Cara Saunders, who is towards the back here as the battle for the lead right now between Daniel Brandon on the right and Ellie Turner on the left. They will be the first two women done with their lunges. Danielle moving with some urgency today. I think she, uh, she's got a bit of a fire lit today, Sean, after that back attack workout yesterday. Brandon, Turner, and Lowen, first three to the monkey bars, and then Cara Saunders and Matilda Garns behind them. Brandon is through and starting to pull away from Ellie Turner. And this will be interesting. I want to see how Danielle can navigate this load and getting it up the hill. Brandon gets right to work. 105 pounds on that turtle. Here comes Ariel Lowen. And this is very different. We're noticing Danielle Brandon's going hand over hand to start. Okay, now she's starting to throw her whole body into the movement. A few of these ladies seem as though they might not have been watching the earlier heats very closely. Uh, to, to me, I want to minimize what you're doing with your arms. I want to keep your arms straight, and I want you to drive with your hips to do the majority of the work. Ellie Turner's getting the, getting the momentum going with her bag there in the middle. And she needs it. She got hung up on the monkey bars and is now in last place in this heat. As Danielle Brandon is just about done with her pull, and she will head back down the hill. So smooth sailing right now for Danielle Brandon as she is out in front. Time to beat is 303.18 seconds. Belongs to Alexis Raptus, who did that in heat number two. And Brandon has some time to track that down. She does have time, and it's going to be close. So a lot of urgency here. She's fast on these monkey bars, which is very smooth. I mentioned yesterday for Danielle Brandon, she had a missed rep in the back attack where the bar in the back squats, 275-pound barbell, she had to dump it. It was her responsibility to get it back on the rack, and once that happens, you really have no shot of doing well in that event. So that kind of derailed her. She's in seventh place overall. But other than that hiccup in back attacks, everything has been inside the top 10 for her, including an event win to start the competition on Thursday in Texas Trail. And here comes Danielle Brandon trying to track down Alexis Raptus. She's about halfway done with her lunge, a little more than halfway now. Yeah, and it looks like she, she's right there. She's still gathering her steps, but uh, essentially that she's deemed that as necessary at this point. And it's going to pay off for her. Danielle Brandon is going to go sub three and have our new time to beat. 256.01 seconds. Danielle Brandon definitely back on track here on Saturday. Matilda Garns is in, followed by Ellie Turner, Ariel Lowen, and then Kara Saunders. So only three seconds separating second through fifth, but it's Danielle Brandon now who has a lead with one heat remaining. You have yet to see anyone relent their lead when they start fast in this particular event. So clearly it pays to get out in front and stay out there if you have the capacity. And once again, it was close to start. Danielle Brandon and Ellie Turner fighting for the lead on that opening lunge, but this is where Daniel Brandon was able to open up and never look back. Yeah, we saw her literally attack the lunges step over step in the opener, smooth on the monkey bars. Here she started to go hand over hand, then got her whole body into those pools, and it allowed her to stay vastly in front of the field. And then she did a great job on the back half, almost gaining speed on these monkey bars. And then she did what she needed to do on those lunges to have the fastest time of the day so far. Danielle Brandon 
now has your top time. With one heat remaining, here are your top scores. Brandon, the only woman to go sub three, beats Alexis Raptus by about seven seconds. Matilda Garns right now sits in third, followed by Ellie Turner and Ariel Lowen. So that third heat, the fastest heat that we have seen thus far. One heat remains here in event number five, the turtle. One heat remains for the women in the fifth of 10 events here at the CrossFit competition at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. It is the Turtle presented by Mayhem Athlete. And the Turtle is not slow, it is fast. And the stage is set, the times are there for these athletes to beat. We've got an axle bar lunge to open at 105. They're gonna traverse the monkey bars, get to that hill, climb it, then pull the bag all the way to the top, 105 pounds, and then they're gonna finish the same way they started, back through the monkey bars and finish with the lunge. Let's talk keys to the event here. You know, the keys are to play the field. You need to be able to look left to right and understand. So far from what we've seen, the person that gets the lead keeps it. And then of course it's hang tight. This can be a pretty grip intensive series of movements. And there is that 105 pound axle bar. And as Adrian said, whoever gets the lead on that implement has been able to keep it throughout these first three heats. Here are your lane assignments for this fourth and final heat. The overall leaders out on the field, Gabriella Magawa in the middle in lane three. She has a 10 point lead on Laura Horvath, but Laura Horvath is coming in with some momentum. She has won the last two events. Great momentum, but Laura Horvath is here, and I think we could see something really special here. Potentially a third win in a row, which has never been done at the Rogue Invitational, and this style of event has Laura written all over it, in my opinion, with her history in the sport and the events that she's excelled at. And there's Amanda Barnhart, who comes in in fifth place overall. She is 35 points out of a spot inside the top three. That's where Emma Lawson sits. She's in the white top. Lawson in third place with 290 points. She's only 15 points back of Magawa for first. We are underway, 105 pounds on the axle bar lunge, and it's Annie Thorosdotter, Amanda Barnhart, 
Emma Lawson and Laura Horvath pretty even here. With Gabby Magawa falling back, but it is close. Yeah, and it's going to be close the whole way, I think, really. We're going to start to see some separation as we get to the monkey bars. And then, of course, that bag. But these lunges, a lot of these ladies are just going to go rep for rep as they're both. They're all turning over step for step, stride for stride, not gathering between any reps. Barnhart is going to be done first, followed closely by Annie Thor's daughter, Emma Lawson, and Laura Horvath. Annie Thor's daughter first off the monkey bars, followed closely by Laura Horvath. Emma Lawson now sits in third as Barnhart was one of the last women off of the monkey bars. This is the race for the lead between Horvath and Annie Thorstadter. Thorstadter coming in fourth place overall, 270 points, and she has been inching her way up the overall standings throughout this competition. Okay. And Lawson now to work. We've got a few different techniques coming. Okay, now we're, now we're getting the total body movement again. A lot like we saw from Danielle Brandon and Lassie. They started some hand over hand action. Then they get the whole body into it as they stand tall, then drive and pull with their hips and their arms. Laura Horvath has about a five foot lead on Annie Thor's daughter. Horvath on the right, Thor's daughter on the left. Horvath is going to be the first woman done, but not by much. Annie Thorstadter only has a couple pulls left. Horvath taking off down the hill. And that could be enough, Sean, because that's where we see the most time of this event spent is right there at that bag. So it is an integral part for you to gain momentum for this back half of the event. Laura Horvath is done with the monkey bars. And now Laura Horvath onto the lunge, trying to hang on here. And now this is where it gets hard as the leader of a pack. You don't know where the field is when you can't see them. Annie's gonna try to make as much of a charge as she can, but how much ground can you really make up in a front rack lunge? It's hard to make up even five feet alone, let alone another 10. Horvath is gonna have a chance to track down Danielle Brandon. She's on her final lunge section. Brandon unofficially was at 256, and Laura Horvath with the hat trick. Wow. Looking at her third straight event win as Annie Thor's daughter is across. Gabby Magawa is going to come in in third, followed by Amanda Barnhart and Emma Lawson will take fifth place in the heat. What an event and what a showing by Laura Horvath. Unofficially an event win for Laura Horvath as Danielle Brandon's time, the last we saw was 256.01 seconds. We'll have to see if that changed, but it looks like Horvath may have just won her third straight event. Yeah, and you talk about momentum. She has a lot of it. She did a lot of what she needed to do right there on that bag, creating separation between her and Annie. And then, of course, now that she has her in the rearview mirror, it's all about just controlling herself, staying composed, and not allowing any faltering. No reps, step backs, missed reps on the lunge, and she did it. Execution at its highest level, three in a row for Laura Horvath. Laura Horvath continues to build momentum here and looks to put herself on top of the overall leaderboard. 249.40 seconds. She beats Danielle Brandon by seven, but Brandon back on track with a second place finish and 95 points for her. Magawa will get 90 points with the third place finish. Amanda Barnhart will tie her best finish of the competition with a fourth. And Alexis Raptis with another top five result as she takes fifth. Let's go down to the field. Once again, Kiki Dixon talking with Laura Horvath. Congratulations on your third Rogue Invitational event win in a row. Thanks so much. Thank you. Getting a lot of love from the crowd, rightfully so. Quite an accomplishment. In addition to being incredible at fitness, you're also a rock climber. How much do you think that helps with these grip intensive events? Oh, I think it definitely helps. Also, I feel very comfortable doing it, so. It for sure pays off that I used to rock them. 
Now, you had the same amount of work on the way out as the way in. Did you notice that the sandbag pull had an impact, or are you able to just rock and roll? No, I don't think it impacted that much as I, maybe the programmers thought it would. So I think it was good. She's showing no signs of slowing down, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Laura Horvath and Gabby Magawa now tied with 395 points, but Horvath with the tie break because she has three first place finishes. Emma Lawson remains in third place. Amanda Barnhart, Leapfrog's Annie Thorosauter now moves into fourth. Danielle Brandon moves up three spots into fifth. And Ellie Turner now sits in sixth as Annie Thorosauter goes from fourth place now down to 10th. The women are done. Men coming up next in event five, the turtle. Stay with us here at Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas.
It's turtle time. Fifth of 10 events up next here for the men at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. Thanks for staying with us, everybody, here on this beautiful Saturday at Dell Diamond in Round Rock, Texas. I'm Sean Woodland with three-time Affiliate Cup champ Adrian Conway. And Adrian, there was a point yesterday where it looked like Justin Medeiros was poised to run away with this competition. But then Roman Krennikov really cut into that lead last night. And once again, a battle between Medeiros and Krennikov playing out here at the Rogue Invitational. Yeah, they're giving us all that we could hope to see, essentially. And, and Roman is extremely well-rounded in himself. And I really like the turtle, although it might be wrongly titled, as a fast event where Roman could also have an opportunity to excel. So I don't see our interest in this scoring table waning anytime soon. Here are the overall standings coming into the event. Justin Medeiros now a 15 point lead over Krennikov after Roman won DT with a spin last night. Bjorben Carl Gubinson doing exactly what he does, just quietly sitting in third place. And Patrick Vellner, the 2020 Rogue Invitational Champion, has been creeping up the leaderboard. He is now just five points back of Goodman for Goodmanson for a spot inside the top three. Event number five is the Turtle, presented by a Mayhem Athlete. And we start with that 155-pound axle bar lunge. Yeah, and the lunge was something that didn't give the ladies any problems, but it affects the rest of the workout. They're going to go the distance with that. Then they've got their monkey bar traverse. Once they get to the hill, this is the dictating factor of the workout thus far. How fast can they get the bag to the top to start the descend back across the bars and across the finish line, finishing with the lunge? We will have four total heats here. And the turtle for the men, 155 pounds, like the ladies did. they got to drag it up Modder Hill there. What's the... What are the keys here to event five? You know, the keys are really play the field. What we've seen so far is when athletes get out to a fast lead, they hold on to it. It's about getting to that turtle, which is the bag itself, up to the hill as fast as possible and getting back. And you got to hang tight because grip, it can be a limiting factor in a test like this. Lane assignments for heat number one. Jack Farlow, Jorge Fernandez, Tim Paulson in the middle in the black shirt and white headband. And Scott Tetlow and Lazar Jukic opening things up here. And keep an eye on Scott Tetlow in lane four. Served in the United States Navy for more than 12 years, so you know he's got some experience with stuff like this. Yeah, you got to think about the, the the obstacles in front of them here in itself. You've got the lunge, you've got the monkey bar traverse, and then, of course, it's handling what we categorize as an odd object in the turtle bag and getting it to the top. You got to watch an athlete like Scott Tetlow. You know he's put in some time training exactly in these types of modalities. And here we go with the opening heat, first of four heats for the men. As after this event, we will be halfway through the competition. And it is Jorge Fernandez out front early, followed by Tim Paulson. And Jack Farlow, Farlow at the top of your screen. And what you'll notice with Jorge Fernandez, he's actually leaning forward in his lunge, really trajecting himself forward, less up with a pause of open hip extension. He's simply meeting the movement standards and advancing as fast as he can, and that gave him an early lead right now. Jorge Fernandez will be the first man to the monkey bars, followed by Tim Paulson and Jack Farlow. I thought he was leaving the door wide open there. Jorge looked like he was going to gather his hands on every bar for a moment, then quickly made the transition to going hand over hand. And Farlow has passed Paulson now for second place as Jorge Fernandez remains in the lead. And as we have seen in the prior heats uh, with the women, once an athlete gets out front, he or she is tough to catch in this event. And now the 155-pound turtle pull up that hill in center field. And as we were, we were talking earlier, you know, seeing this on camera does not do it justice when you see it in person. Yeah, and it, it honestly doesn't know justice that these athletes make this bag going up. It looks so easy, right? Um, but we have to understand and can't ever ignore that this is the first time they've done something like this. There's not a hill in the back to warm up with. They got here and figured it out. Jack Farlow has passed Jorge Fernandez on the pull here. Follow Farlow on the far right side of your screen. You can see him just now finishing up the pull as Fernandez is finished up. Now, this is the first time we've Seen someone surrender a lead at this point in the event. Yeah, now we get to see now we get to see how they're gonna respond to the finish. Jack's got a slight lead that could be enough to hold off Jorge. Lazar Jukic has passed Tim Paulson. 
for third. Jukic is on the far side of the field. He's onto the monkey bars as Farlow gets through those unscathed. And here comes Jorge Fernandez. But Farlow will be the first man back to the 155-pound axle bar. And he gets right to work. And it'll be interesting to see if Jorge can attack these lunges on the back half the same way he did the front. They were fast. Ooh, a no ah. left for Fernandez. And that's what can get you, Sean. You toe in the line with what the judges need and want to see versus what will get you there as fast as possible. And sometimes it can result in a setback. Farlow remains out front as Tim Paulson is now tracking down both Jukic and Fernandez. But Farlow is going to pick up the heat win as he comes across the finish line. Tim Paulson is just ahead of Jorge Fernandez for second here. Paulson is in, and Tim Paulson's going to take second, followed by Jorge Fernandez in third. Lazar Jukic and Scott Tetlow are the last two men out. Jukic actually just put the barbell down for a quick break, and he will come across. So Lazar Jukic will finish fourth in the heat. Jukic really wincing in pain. He rolled his ankle on Thursday in the Texas Trail and has been gutting it out for the competition so far after that event. But Jack Farlow, 250.62 seconds to take heat number one. Rumble, young man, rumble. Youngest man in the, in the, in the lineup starting the day with a heat win. That's got to be a great feeling. And for the first time, we have seen someone lead at the monkey bars and then surrendered that lead on the hill. Yeah, Jorge did a great job coming out of the gate, smoked the first set of lunges, started to move the bag well, but Farlow did it better. And that's what got him down the hill early. And then of course he was very, very smooth on these monkey bars hand over hand, no hesitation. Jorge had some hesitations on the back half. And then Farlow executed the way he needed to. No, no setbacks, no no reps, and finished the day, or finished this event with a heat win. One heat down, Jack Farlow with a top time. Three heats remain. We'll take a quick break and come back with the rest of event number five, the turtle for the men here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational.
Day three of CrossFit competition continues at the 2022 Rogue Invitational from the Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. Glad you're with us, everybody. Sean Woodland alongside three-time Affiliate Cup champion Adrian Conway, and we have Kiki Dixon down on the field. Event number five, we are through one heat. It is the Turtle presented by Mayhem Athlete. And the Turtle is not a slow one. We open up with an axle bar lunge for the guys. It's at 155 pounds. They're going to get to that monkey bar, and then they're going to go up that hill and pull that sandbag, which is the turtle, up to the top of it, and then they're going to come back down the way they started, finishing with the monkey bars into the front rack lunge over that finish line. Second of four heats is set to get underway. Elena Simons, Yonikoski, Saxon Panchik, Cole Sager, Nick Matthew, and Heinrich Hapalainen. Uh, they're on the field together. And there is Cole Sager, a man who's finished on the podium in the past year at the Rogue Invitational. And he likes these kind of events. Cole likes to do work. Cole played college football, and he has a great resume with events like this. At the CrossFit Games in 2018, we did something called the Battlegrounds, where it was a lot like an out-and-back fashion we have here. There was external loading. There was some running. There were some, uh, some hills and some ropes. He fared very well. Won that event in 2018 and looking for a similar performance here at the Rogue Invitational. Sager in 11th place overall. Coming off his best finish of the competition last night in DT with a spin when he took eighth. We are set to begin heat number two. Everyone's going to be chasing Jack Farlow's top time at 2 minutes 50 seconds. Now the 155-pound lunge across the field. Smooth is fast here on these lunges. You don't want to toe the line quite as much as Jorge Fernandez did on the back half where you have to step back or get a no rep. But it's important to have urgency here on these front rack lunges to gain momentum into the second and third areas of this event. Heinrich Hapalainen at the bottom of your screen is out front early, and fellow Finn Yonikoski at the other end of the field is about a step behind him. Hapalainen will be done first. He'll move to the monkey bars with Saxon Panchik and Yonikoski. Here comes Nick Matthew in that signature crop top, and Cole Sager will be the last man done with the lunge. Hapalainen through the monkey bars and up the hill to start his turtle pull. And Yonikoski at the other end of the field, though, has now overtaken Hapalainen, as has Nick Matthew, and Saxon Panchik closing as well. And in an event like this, Sean, that is extremely important. The urgency in transitions means everything. The sooner you can get that bag pull going, as we've seen before, we've only watched the lead ever exchange hands one time through the heat so far here at this particular movement. Well, Hapalainen is gaining ground now on Koski. The two of them dead even on the turtle pull. Hapalainen slightly ahead of Koski right now, but those are your top two. And Hapalainen has about two pulls left, and he will be done. So Heinrich Hapalainen back in front here. Yona Koski is done. Hapalainen will be the first man back to the monkey bars. He and Koski, the only two men done with that turtle pull. Now Saxon, Panchik, Sager, and Matthew all done at the same time, working their way back down the hill behind that man, our leader in Heat 2, Heinrich Hapalainen. Yeah, and I, and I love that. Hapalainen's in his mind saying, what do you guys know? Hey, I've paced that run up the hill just right so that I could finish the way that I needed to. And we've already seen on the front portion of this workout, he executes these lunges really fast. So again, it's hard to make up a lead, especially if you have a clean run on the back half of these lunges. Hapalainen is staying clean here on this final lunge. Yonikoski towards the top of your screen. The far end of the field sits in second place. Saxon Panchik has moved into third. And it's Sager and Matthew fighting for fourth right now. But Hapalainen is on his final section for the lunges. He's got to get completely across that line. He will do it. And Heinrich Hapalainen, the new time to beat at 236.74 seconds. That's a fast one. Now Yonikoski is through. He will take second in the heat. Saxon Panchik finishing up. He will finish in third. And Nick Matthew trying to 
close the gap between himself and Cole Sager here. And Matthew looks like he might be a step ahead of Sager. And I just want to say, the, the, the lunges are affecting the men differently than the ladies. I mean, we watched a guy that has a listed 545 back squat, and Nick Matthew dropped the bar halfway through his lunges. It, their posterior, their bodies are feeling the fatigue from the accumulation of these events we've seen so far. All five men in well inside the time cap. Heinrich Hapalainen is our new leader at 236.74 seconds as the two Finns finish one and two here in heat two. Hapalainen doing his thing. He started fast on the lunge and then he was very smooth on the traverse of the monkey bars. We called him out for pacing the run, and that allowed an, an opportunity for Yona, who got made up some ground on the bag, but Hapalainen was the one that was able to overtake him on the back half of the bag pool and got an early lead on the back half of this event and finish strong. For now, the time to beat. Here are the times as they stand through two heats. Two finished athletes leading the way as Jack Farlow's top time now slides to third. Saxon Panchik sits in fourth place at 253.65 seconds, and it's Tim Paulson in fifth, as five men have managed to go sub three on this event with two heats remaining of the turtle. Back in one second as action continues at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. Halfway through event number five for the men here as we reach the halfway point of the CrossFit competition at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. Sean Woodland and Adrian Conway with you up in the booth. Kiki Dixon is down on the field for event number five, the Turtle presented by Mayhem Athlete. And the Turtle it is. That is the dictating factor in the workout is how fast they can get the bag up the hill. But they open with an axle bar lunge. They get to the monkey bars to traverse them out to the hill. Once they get up there, they're going to pull it hand over hand or using their full body to get it up there. And that seems to be the difference maker as they make their way back through how they started. Monkey bars back to the lunge and across the finish line. Third of four heats. 
here in event number five. And the men who are in that heat are taking their positions at the starting line. Jason Hopper, Sam Quant, Chandler Smith, Ricky Garrard, and Noah Olson. Ricky Garrard trying to reverse his momentum a little bit, an 18th and a 10th coming into this event. Chandler Smith in yeah. the same boat. Yeah, and what a stacked heat this is. But Chandler Smith's got also that military background and probably a lot of experience with monkey bars and ropes and simple grunt work. I really like Chandler's background in athletic history for an event such as this. Can't wait to see what he does. Chandler Smith with a ninth and a 12th in his last two events. Ricky Garrard an 18th and then a 10th last night as he has seen himself fall down the overall standings, looking to climb up here in event five. We are underway. 236.74 seconds. The time to beat belongs to Heinrich Hapalainen and Jason Hopper already getting hit with a no rep at the top of your screen. And that's costly because now as an athlete, you have to be a touch more conservative to show the judge what they want. The judge is now alert to, hey, he did something wrong. I'm going to keep a closer eye on his reps. And now that's just a situation you put yourself in. Noah Olsen will be done first. Ricky Garrard looks to be the second man done with his lunge, followed closely by Sam Quant. And now Chandler Smith is done. Olsen looking to get through the monkey bars first. Now he will make his way up the hill for his 155 pound turtle bag pull. Ricky Garrard and Sam Quant fighting for second place behind Olsen. And Quant managed to gain some distance there on that run up the hill, as did Ricky Garrard. And here comes Chandler Smith. Sam Quant making quick work of this bag with the arm over arm technique, kicking, keeping that thing moving. Yep. And he is now ahead of Noah Olson. And that is the advantage of the arm over arm technique is that there's no pause in momentum. One stroke or one pull builds off of the other. And Sam nailed it. Look at the ground that he made up. Sam Quant in the lead, working his way back down the hill. And now we'll move back to the monkey bars for the final time as Noah Olson is in second. Olsen smartly taking some chalk with him. He was chalking his hands as he was running down the hill. Ricky Garrard and Jason Hopper able to make up some ground. Hopper in a battle for third as Chandler Smith towards the back of the pack here. Sam Quant way out in front. He will be the first man back to the barbell. Oh yeah, and he's attacking these things aggressively. He feels good. Great front rack position. Noah Olsen onto the lunge, as is Jason Hopper. So Hopper, after that early no rep, able to make up a ton of ground here. And he has moved now into a battle for second in the heat. Ricky Garrard is all by himself in fourth, but now Chandler Smith is gaining ground on Garrard on the right side of your screen. Sam Quant, meanwhile, getting set to finish up a second place last night in DT with a spin and looking to set the new time to beat Sam Quant is in and he will just edge out Heinrich Hapalainen for the event lead, 234.53 seconds. Here comes Olsen just beating Jason Hopper across. Ricky Garrard looks to be the next man to finish. And Garrard is in. Chandler Smith will be the last man to Close out his event here in event number five in heat number three of four. But Sam Quant got to the hill, I believe, in third place, but then made up some ground his way up and then really did work on that turtle bag pull. Yeah, he did a great job. Talk about being at threshold. We notice him stumble, not even with the bar. He drops the bar to run across the finish line and almost has nothing left in those legs. These guys have been through a thorough test, and we are only halfway done. And for the third straight time, we've seen the lead change a little bit. Noah Olson got out front, but when he got to the hill, that's where Sam Quant was able to start reeling him in. 
And what a great job on the monkey bars. He was smooth hand over hand. But we saw Sam Quant take advantage on the bag with something that we haven't seen so far with hand over hand on the pool all the way to the top. And of course, it was really smooth sailing throughout the rest of the event for Quant. He executed that lunge under threshold. You can tell he was getting close. And then he wobbly, wobbly need made his way across the finish line. And just beats Heinrich Hapalainen with a couple seconds to spare. 234.53 seconds is now our top time. Heinrich Hapalainen will slide down to second. Noah Olson's mark of 242.56 sits in third, followed by Jason Hopper and Yona Koski. One heat remains here in event five. Stay with us, everybody. Heat four coming up next. One heat remains here in the fifth of 10 events for the CrossFit competition at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. Event five is the Turtle presented by Mayhem Athlete. And unlike the women's side of things, just because you get out front early doesn't mean you're gonna stay there. Absolutely not. This workout is not slow. They're gonna open with the axle bar lunge, make it through the traverse, and then up to the hill where they're gonna meet the turtle and pull it to the top. And then of course, make their way back through the monkey bar traverse and into that front rack walking lunge all the way through the finish line. Sam Quan has a top time, two minutes, 34 seconds. If you're gonna beat that, what are the keys? Well, you need to play the field here. We've seen a couple times now at this point, the lead has been overtaken at, p at points in this, at the, in this event, and it's been on the turtle itself. And then, of course, you need to hang tight. Can you hold on to the rope and perhaps use that same hand-over-hand -hand action that we saw Sam Quant have success with in the last heat? The top five men in the overall standings will be out on the field. Here are your lane assignments for the fourth and final heat. Velner Krenikov, Madaris, your overall leader. Bjorvin Gubinson, who sits in third, and then Jeff Adler, right now in fifth place overall. Patrick Vellner in fourth place. He is only five points back at Gumanson for third, and he has slowly been working his way up the overall standings. And Pat, being in striking distance of the podium is gonna have some urgency. He loves these chipper format events that are built to be out and back. You get to play the field a little bit, and I really like the setup of this particular test for Vellner's skill set. Justin Medeiros, your overall leader, will be in the middle of the field. Roman Krenikov in the gray shirt. 
coming off an event win last night in DT with a spin. Carved 20 points off Medeiros' lead and now trails him by just 15, and we are underway. We saw some costly no refs take place earlier in these heats, and it's important for athletes to know, yes, you have to have urgency in the lunge, but you can't tow the line fast enough that the judges are going to send you back. Justin Medeiros is out front, but Adler at the bottom of your screen, Krennikov and Veller are all right behind him as Grogan Gubinson now sits in fifth place early in this heat. 234.53 seconds is the mark to beat. A no rep for Justin Medeiros. I don't believe he got all the way over the line. And now Pat Vellner takes the lead. So Medeiros in an early hole here. Pat trying to seize the moment. That's a rarity that we see happen to Justin. So I'm, I can't wait to see how he re responds. Pat Vellner leads Roman Krennikov. And this is big for Krennikov because he only has to make up 15 points on Medeiros. That's just three spots in an event. Vellner will get to work first on the turtle bag pull, followed by Krennikov and Adler. And quickly we see, Sean, all these athletes now using pretty much the same technique or similar to what Quant had success with in the last heat. They are always paying attention to their surroundings. Vellner in the lead here over fellow Canadian Jeffrey Adler and Roman Krennikov. Vellner will be the first man down the hill and he will move with urgency to the monkey bars. Let's see if that hand over hand pull blew up his arms too much and it did not make an easy work of this monkey bar traverse. Here comes Roman Krennikov in second. Gumitson has moved into fourth as Adler is going to be the second man to the barbell along with Roman Krenikov. So Krenikov getting some help here from the rest of the field as Gumitson moves to the axle bar ahead of Justin Medeiros. Pat Vellner continues to lead trying to track down Sam Quant's top time. Vellner looking for his first event win here of the Rogue Invitational. And now a no rep for Krenikov which is costly as Adler's right there rep for rep with him. Now a slight lead. That could be costly for Roman Krenikov sur surrendering points as Pat Vellner doesn't look like he's going to win the event, but he will take the heat. Here comes Adler. And now Roman Krenikov is across. Justin Medeiros is starting to reel in Bjorgen Gubinson here on the lunge. This could be close across the finish line. Gubinson is not able to hang on as Medeiros will take fourth place in the heat. Belner doing exactly what we thought he would on this particular event. Not winning at all, but taking the points that were available to him, at least when he took the floor. 235.57 seconds, good enough to win the heat, but not good enough to beat Sam Quant. So Sam Quant is going to move himself up the overall standings, his first event win of the competition after a second place finish in DT with a spin. So back-to-back -back top two finishes for Quant. Vellner, though, his best finish of the competition as he looks to take second place in the event. And that no rep for Justin Medeiros, yeah. that was the key moment of the event on the opening lunge. It really was. He started off with great momentum, led the pack, in fact, and it was something that we'll have to see. But Vellner seized the opportunity. I mean, Justin had a hesitation. He got called the back, and, and Pat Vellner looked like it. he stepped on the gas pedal, went hand over hand, which is more costly to your grip fatigue, but it results in the fact that he gained a tremendous ground and advantage on the rest of the field, and he had enough grip stamina left to make easy work of the traverse and finish strongly with these front rack lunges, and it locked him up a second place finish in this event. Pat Vellner, the only man really in that final heat who had a clean run. Sam Quant's gonna win the event one second faster than Pat Vellner. Best finish for Vellner though in second, Heinrich Hapalainen. Great result for him as he will take third place in the event. That is his first finish inside the top three. Best finish so far of the competition. And Jeffrey Adler will take fifth. 
Nowhere on that screen is Justin Medeiros as Roman Krennikov will finish seventh and looks to be the overall leader after this event. A lot to sort out here, but let's send it down to the field. Kiki Dixon with Pat Vellner. Pat, just shy of that event win, but second place finish, still nothing to scoff at. When was the last time you found yourself on some monkey bars? Oh, I mean, we were talking in the back. Uh, some of us had done it at the games, you know, three, four years ago now. Otherwise, it's been a long time since the playground. How do you monitor the go button that you've got set to just get it done and what the judges want from you and find that balance in your performance? That's the trick on a workout like this, and frankly, all of them today. Uh, it's high, high execution today. Really fast workouts, really small margins. So you want to be as aggressive as you can, but controlled aggression, because as you can see, like I, I could have maybe pushed it to try to get that one second, get Sam, but if you get called back on that last lunge, now there's three, four people coming up behind you. So uh, we saw that happen to Justin here, and, and like today there could be big swings because execution is really valuable. So you just got to do what you can. Don't get too greedy. Thanks, Pat. Thank you very much. Second place finish for Pat Vellner, and now he moves up another spot into third. Roman Krenikov now leads Justin Medeiros by 10 points as a rare mistake for Medeiros allows Krenikov to take advantage. Sam Quant moves into fourth place. Jeff Adler stays in fifth. Jorben Gumitsen drops from third down to sixth. So we are halfway through the individual competition here at the Rogue Invitational. Five events remain. It's going to be fun the rest of the way. We're only halfway, brother, only halfway. The action continues here. The Legends coming up next at the 2022 Rogue Invitational.
the legends are back at the 2022 Rogue Invitational as they get set for their second event of the weekend here at Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. Sean Woodland alongside three-time Affiliate Cup champion Adrian Conway. Earlier today, we had a flyover courtesy of the United States Air Force and we were able to thank those pilots during the break and a special thank you to everyone out there serving in the United States Armed Forces. Thank you so much for everything you do for the rest of us. It's always fun to watch the legends get out there and compete. We're going to have a relay style event here. Teams of two, there will be one team of three. And we're going to see something similar to what we just watched the men and women go through. We will. It'll just be a slight, varied, uh, you know, same run through. It's it's a sprint to begin for these guys. Then they're going to hit the Zeus monkey bars. They're going to do one hill bag drag up Zeus monkey bars on the way back. And then instead of finishing with a sprint, they will finish with 100 foot axle bar lunge. It's not keys of this event. You know, we're out here for fun, but there's always yep. keys, especially when the score is actually dependent upon the slowest time. It's important to have a tunnel vision. You know, in a sprint like this, it's easy, but when it's coming down to a tenth of a second, you got to focus only on you and not just your competitors. And then, of course, you have to show up at the bar while the front rack lunge is the latter part of this workout. You've got to be able to hold your pace and finish fast. The team of three is going to be at the bottom of your screen. That's Dan Bailey, Miko Salo, and Rich Froning. Bailey and Salo are going to go out at the same time, and Rich Froning will be the man who goes out by himself. Oh, look at this. we got, like, synchro monkey bar action coming across. Well, Dan Bailey is through that, and if you remember the Killer Cage event in 2011 at the CrossFit Games, Dan Bailey was flying through the monkey bars in that event, so no surprise that he was the first man to get to the top of the hill and start his bag pull. We see some hand over hand. We see some grip and rip with the total body hip extension. Chan's getting his body into it, making slight work of that bag, pulling it up the hill. Matt Chan is the second man from the, or third man from the right. Dan Bailey is on the far right. Matt Chan is in that gray top. And Chan is done. <laughs> he, he took a spill there at the end. I think he just decided I'm going to sit here and rest a while. That's, that's what that was. Dan Bailey way out front, back to the monkey bars. Matt Chan paired with Jason Kalipa. You talk about pedigree, Sean. Dan Bailey was built to run fast. There's a spring to his step that you simply can't mimic or imitate. And Dan Bailey now on to the lunge. As here comes Matt Chan. And Josh Everett is there as well. And this is where it's interesting. We're not just trying to tag off to our partner here, folks, because we've got a few teams of two and a two, a, a, one team of three. The winner and the seeding of this heat is going to be based on the slowest partner. So you can't just have the desire to tag off. You've got to have the, the desire to do it as fast as physically possible, no matter where everyone else is on the field. Dan Bailey is done, and here comes Rich Froning. Remember, Miko Salo was also a member of that team. And Rich heads to the monkey bars. Skipped one there on the first, hey. just jumped right to it. Why not? Listen, know the rules and take full advantage where you can. And Rich has a lot of experience with knowing how to maximize his output in any given test. Throwing up the hill. Tommy Hackenbrook is also out there as well. Rich going a bit of a hybrid pull, right? He's using his arms, but he's also getting initiate, initiative with his hip so that his arms aren't doing all of the work. Hackenbrook using those strong arms to get that thing rocking with the hand over hand pull, and now he gets his whole body into it. And if you watched yesterday, Tommy Hackenbrook was paired with Dan Bailey, and they won that first event. And Hackenbrook in his interview said last year 
He was paired with Stacey Tovar, who was six months pregnant, and she did the majority of the work because he was so out of shape. So he actually trained a little bit for this and wanted to come in in, in better shape for this year's version of the Invitational. As Rich Roney is through. I always thought one of the easiest jobs in the world was judging Rich Roney because he just moves so cleanly. I completely agree. When you, when you watch his movement, he set the standard for a lot of athletes coming up in the sport. Okay, I can be great if I move like that. Not only does it pay off in the speed of his workouts, but when it comes to longevity and protecting your joints from wear and tear, that is extremely important, not just for competitors, but for the everyday athlete out there in the CrossFit community. Focus on your movement, increase the quality, then and only then chase that intensity and load. Danny Sakamoto pulling on that turtle. Saw her out there. Sam Briggs also out there. Wasn't here yesterday, but she's back in the field today. Paired with Rebecca Boyd Miller. Also saw a similar effort from Annie Sakamoto back in 2011. Hey, we watched these legends go down a touch more graciously to the hill. <laughs> a little less aggressiveness on that downward slope as we know our knees sometimes take a pounding on the downgrade of a run. Margo Alvarez is now across. There's Annie Sakamoto. Kristen Clever as well. Kristen's got always a lot of tricks up her sleeve. I swear, always been really great at any nuanced skill, particularly gymnastic style. She makes very easy work. And Sam Briggs, a little modification here. Gonna handstand walk. 2013 fittest woman on earth. And you gotta wonder, is it a, a knee issue perhaps, something that she's battling? But again, either way, what a great example to the community on how to scale a workout, continue to try to chase the intended stimulus as best you can, but more importantly, join in, throw down, something is better than nothing. Chris Clever in the background there also modifying this one, as we've seen in the past with some of these Legends events. Sam Briggs is across. Hey, Here comes Andy Sakamoto. Now Chris Clever has finished up. Gotta love it. And I remember we watched Danny actually modifying squats yesterday with a launch. So we're getting a bit of some redundancy testing for Miss Sakamoto here in this particular test of, or series of events. And Andy still trains hard. She's a coach. Yep. At her affiliate in Santa Cruz, California. And let's not forget a CrossFit Games champion just literally over a year ago in 2021. And then the, and her master's division. And she was in, we told her going into that competition you know, on the media team, she does a lot of work with us. You, know, you come home with that title or you don't come home at all. And she delivered. That's so. right, you, you basically told her you can't sit up here with us <laughs> anymore. <in> the, <laughs> uh, she is a, a fantastic person, always fun to be around. Another great showing by the legends. And here's the thing uh, about them too, is that you know a lot of these athletes walk into your gym, they're probably gonna tune up your best person. Oh my goodness, you know, absolutely. They're still that fit. 100%. You know, the only difference, Sean, really, is as we see these athletes aging, which is all completely new to our sport, is that they reduce the volume at which they train. The beauty is the capacity they've built throughout the years, a lot like CrossFit, the methodology, we can retain even as we reduce the volume, and they have a tremendous ability to still express so much power, so much intensity, so much strength, even though they might not be out there on the field showing it in the same way they have at the CrossFit Games historically. And these are the men and women who really put this sport you know, on the map. Some of the early superstars that inspired a lot of people to walk into their gyms and find a new way to get fit and be part of a really tremendous community. And I'm one of them, man. A lot of these 
athletes out here are peers to me in age, but I looked up to them tremendously in the years that I started CrossFit. The latter part of 2010 is when I got my level one, and it changed my life, and, and I can thank a lot of these folks from what I saw of them on the competition floor in the field that initially set that spark and desire for me to have the curiosity to approach a sport like CrossFit. And that will conclude the Legends competition here for day number two. Rich Froning and company showing that they are still pretty darn fit. We are just getting started here on Saturday at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. Stay with us, everybody. The Rogue Iron Game coming up next.
the much anticipated Roga Coaster made its debut for the Strongman, our individual CrossFit athletes took to the field for a monkey traverse, and the legends completed their second event of the weekend. This is the Rogue Iron Game. Welcome to the 2022 Rogue Invitational here at Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. I'm Jamie Hagia, and we finally have some sunshine. I'm joined here by Dr. Bill Crawford, and we saw the legends compete, but we also saw the Roga Coaster. How cool was that, Dr. Bill? It was awesome. It's big. It's also like doing a deadlift that moves on you. It also challenges your grip. It's painful. It was very visual, so everybody that was watching got to see this thing goes up, the bags come off. You know what time it is. It was beautiful. Let's take a look at how our men did on event four on the Roga Coaster. Here is a look at the results. Martins Litsis took the event win, getting that much needed home run with a time of 33.44 seconds. Eight out of the 10 strongman finished the event. And the men in the overall standings, Pavlo, Novikov, and Trey Mitchell all finished right behind him with times faster than 41 seconds. But it was Martins Lisi's who needed that first place finish in that event. How did Martins do in this? How did he do that? Well, Martins is a very experienced competitor, and he always comes up with another performance. He knew exactly what he needed to do. He also knows that he needs to get some knockouts, like you said. He needs to win, and he went after the win. I thought he'd be in the top three, but honestly, I was a little surprised he won the event, but it's Martins. Another man who impressed us as well, Pavlo Nakamnechi. Well, I actually expected him to win the event. He did come in second, and he set the pace at 38 seconds. Big wide frame, big body, great grip, fantastic deadlift, as we all know after yesterday's event. And he really showed that he's here to compete. He pulled that so quickly, but again, it's that experience in competition, being able to continue to push. He did a fantastic job, though. Another man that we talked about coming into this is Trey Mitchell. You predicted he would have a great event here at the Roga Coaster. Did he live up to your expectations? Absolutely. Uh, he won the Shaw Classic recently. A lot of these events have actually been very good for him, but he's a big body, he's a tall man, and he's very strong in his back. So I expected him to have a very good result. And he's also right in the middle of this hunt. He's here to be on top of the podium. Don't think he's here for second or third. Trey is here to win. It will be a tight race, but let's take a look at our overall standings for our strongman. Alexei Novikov remains in first place with 34.5 points, but Trey Mitchell stays in second place, only 2.5 points back. The Dragon Martins Leitzis is creeping up and starting to close that gap, only four points behind of Novikov. And, but we can never count out Pavlo, who sits in fourth place overall. Oh, Dr. Bill, Alexei Novikov sitting in that top spot. What does he need to do to become a champion at the end of the night? Well, he needs to be strong in the events, obviously, but it's not making mistakes. What does that mean? That means that he's aggressive to the point where he can get the job done. But last year, he was a little over aggressive on the timber carry and the log press, which actually cost him some points. So he's been much more seasoned this time around. He just needs to not make mistakes and stay in the top one, two, or three, and he'll finish the job. Let's take a look at event five for our strongman. It is going to be a repeat from last year. It is a yoke carry overhead log lift medley. Dr. Jan Todd named this the yoke and oak, where they will be carrying the yoke 50 feet, and then they have to lift that log that's 360 pounds three times. What are the keys to winning this event? Well, basically you wanna have a clean walk. That way you can get off to the second event. What does that mean by a clean walk? You wanna get under the implement, get to the 50 feet, and then get to the logs. The log press, because you've done this yoke, this yoke, it hits you right in the midsection. So basically you need to have a stable lockout. So you push the pace on the log, uh, you push the pace on the timber carry, and then you need to get this implement over your head and lock it out. And that's the tough part because you're really feeling the pressure from having done the yoke walk. 
with a tough yoke and oak coming up, which athlete should we be looking out for? Well, I'd have to say that uh, you'd want to watch Martins, obviously, and Alexi. That's the epic battle between these two strong men who have been world's strongest men before. But then there's the other battle. Pavlo and Trey want to get into that mix. They want to be on top of the podium or on the podium. So I think there's a couple of battles going on, but I probably would watch Trey the most in this event. That is a wrap on our strong, strong man for now. We will be talking CrossFit in a minute, but first I caught up with one of the most decorated American women in CrossFit history with Carrie Pierce. I am joined now by Carrie Pierce. She is a seven time games athlete and she has finished third place in 2020, stood on the podium. Thank you so much for joining us, Carrie. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So uh, being here with the legends, you are on the younger side, 33. How does that feel to be out there? It feels great. It's a lot less pressure and it's nice being on the younger side because I'm like, okay, I know I can like hold my end when we're with a partner. Yeah. And we were just talking a little bit before your background was gymnastics. You were a collegiate gymnast at the University of Michigan. Um, how do you feel like that trans transferred, anything you learned from that transferred into your CrossFit career? The body awareness just from gymnastics growing up, body weight, strength, just being able to do like the strict pull up, strict handstand push ups is so crucial in CrossFit and being an individual competitor. I started competing at five years old. True. So I knew, yeah, how to compete with myself and going out on the competition floor and dealing with nerves. So that definitely helped a lot and for CrossFit. How did you get into CrossFit? A friend in college kept telling me to do CrossFit and I was like, no, I did gymnastics 18 years. I don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. And then finally I saw it on ESPN in 2014 and especially Julie Fouché, cause she was an American and I was just watching like, this is actually really cool. I think I could be good at that. So <laughs> I saw that I had a powerlifting competition in November of 2014 and then started CrossFit right after that. Wow. And then when did you, was there a certain point where you kind of knew like, hey, I'm really good at this thing. I think I can go <laughs> represent for USA and be one of the, the you know, four time fittest American women up there. Yeah, so I did my first CrossFit Open in 2015, and I ended up qualifying to regionals and then to the games that first year. And <laughs> first year. <laughs> yeah, but I was like, oh, it's a fluke because I won the handstand walking event. I won the handstand push-up event. I didn't do well in the snatch event or like the running event. And I was like, oh, it's a fluke. So then I came back in 2016, and then I finished fifth at the CrossFit Games. And I was like, okay, I think I'm pretty good at this. Let's see if I can get on the podium. You did announce your retirement, but you are competing here. What have you been up to since you have announced that? I've worked out a lot less. I still enjoy working out, um, but I have a business, Power Abs, and we recently have like fit programs, so like a high intensity program. So I've been able to just focus on business and helping others uh, with their fitness journey instead of always just focusing on mine, which has been very rewarding. Yeah, and Carrie, everyone loves you. They love to see you compete. Is there any chance we might be seeing you in the future sometime down the line competing again? I will say definitely not on the individual okay. side. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> got it. Well, thank you so much for joining us and best of luck to you this upcoming season. Thank you so much, Jamie. We are back here now talking CrossFit, and I am joined now by Pat Sherwood. And we did get to see these CrossFit athletes compete in their first event on day three. How did you think that went for them? The turtle, I loved it, it was fantastic. Potentially, now that it's in the rear view mirror, it should have been named the hand grenade, because what it did was just blow up the leaderboard a little bit, shift some points around. And this is when, for me as a fan and an analyst, things start to get interesting few days into the competition, there's some stories developing, and a short, sharp workout like event number five, beautiful. There has been some movement. Let's take a look at our event four results for our men. The turtle, event five, the turtle is Samuel Quant in first place with 234.53, but right behind him was Patrick Vellner, who was quick up that hill to make light work of that. Henry Kapalainen was right behind him and followed up by Jeffrey Adler and Noah Olson in that top five. Someone we hadn't really talked a ton about coming into this yet is Samuel Quant. How impressive was he to you out there? Right, and hadn't talked about that much meaning, not at all. So I'll tell you what, Mr. Quant, you are on the radar right now. Fantastic. He entered event number five in sixth place, tied with Chandler Smith, but that event win bumped him up into fourth place, which was fantastic. He's just 15 little points away from a third place position. And after a mediocre trail run, he's been crushing it. A fifth, a sixth, a second, and now an event win. 
Two men we have been talking a lot about are Justin Medeiros and, Ricky, and Roman Krennikov, but they didn't finish in the top, or Ricky Garrard, he did not finish in the top 10 in that last event. Do you think that hurts their chances, or how do you think they're feeling after that event? Uh, th that was, again, things that are stressful as an athlete are just so much fun as a fan to watch, right? So Ricky Garrard needed to make some points. He was one of the big names coming in here, and rightfully so, profoundly capable athlete, but he entered in eighth, and he fell a little bit. He's not going in the right direction. Justin Medeiros was battling with Roman Krennikov. He needs more points because he has somebody clawing at his back. So for Justin to finish outside of the top ten, again, it's making one heck of a story for us to talk about. I did not see that coming. Taking a look at our overall leaderboard, after five event for our men, there has been a shift in the leaderboard. So in that top spot is Roman Krennikov. Looks like that workout yesterday and going at his recovery pace worked out well for him. Justin Medeiros is only 10 points behind him, followed by Patrick Villner, Sam Quant, and Jeffrey Adler into that mix of the top five. But Roman is just continuing to shine. What do you expect from him the rest of this competition? That's such a fantastic overall leaderboard. There's so much going on there. First of all, Roman Krennikov making it such an interesting invitation and now taking the lead from Medeiros. But look, just 10 little points, right? There's five events left. That is a world of difference that can happen. But it's great to see, can Roman hold on? Does Justin have the fight in him to claw back, which I believe that he does. And there's old sneaky Pat Vellner made his way all the way back into the top three. So it's looking great on the men's side. Switching over to the women's side of the field, let's get their results for event five for the women. It was Laura Horvath who took her third consecutive win here at the Rogue Invitational, followed by, by veteran Annie Thor's daughter, Danielle Brandon making her way back up into that top three in this event, Gabby Magala and Amanda Barnhart. But Laura Horvath, three consecutive Rogue Invitational event wins, the first person to do that. What, how was she able to do that, Pat? I'll tell you what, with Tia Claire not competing, there is somebody else stepping up big time, and that is Laura Horvath. My goodness, so impressive. Entered this in second place, knocked it out of the park. She knows how to perform under pressure, got herself an event win, was at the podium this year at the Games, and she's looking to make her way onto the podium here at the Invitational. Besides Laura, who else stood out to you in that women's field? I got to give some credit to somebody who was a bit off the radar, but a very well-known athlete, and that's Amanda Barnhart. She's incredibly capable. I mean, she's been to the Games five times, been to the Rogue Invitational a couple of times. This is her third appearance, but she entered the Turtle in 10th overall and did so well that she clawed her way into fourth. That's a huge leap up the leaderboard. Let's take a look at our overall leaderboard for our women after five events. It is going to be Laura Horvath taking that top spot with 395 points, but Gabby Magala is only five points behind her, followed by Annie Thor's daughter, our youngest, second youngest in the competition, Emma Lawson, and Amanda Barnhart. Laura just continues to shine. What are we expecting to see from her in these next two events for day three of competition? Oh, I think she's going to do fantastic. I can't see any holes in her game, any way, shape, or form, but I'll tell you what, we've got Gabrielle Magal in there, Horvath doing amazing, but it's almost like in my mind, you're going for a nice walk through the woods, everything seems to be going well, then you look behind you and there's just a, a predator right there. That's Annie Thor's daughter, quietly in third place and not getting the attention that she deserves. Two-time champion from the game, she can do everything and she's not coming to be third. Annie's gonna do everything she can to move up to second or first. She will, and looking at event six coming up, it has been kept a secret, but it is finally out. It is the dual two. It is going to be one legless rope climb, 10 overhead squats at 135.95, and you're gonna cyclone bag carry to the finish. It is going to be kind of a repeat with different movements, similar styles, where they will be going up against each other and in different rounds. So Pat, what are the keys to this event? What I like about this is, what we just saw with the turtle, that was short and sharp, a few minutes, but this is on a whole nother level. We're talking sub 90 seconds. So if you have any sort of error, bad rep, didn't hit squat depth, any fumbling with the bag to get it moving, you might not tumble one spot. We're talking three, four, five, six places. So the accuracy and precision and the pressure on these athletes is going to be the most we've seen so far. 
with having to run almost a perfect race in this event, who, which man and women are you looking for to shine in this? Oh, okay, well, I'll start with the easy one. The easy one is the men's side. Obviously, there's great competition everywhere, but we're talking a 10-point battle between first and second. You have to be watching Roman and Justin just to see who's gonna fight to get those 10 points back. On the women's side, there's a bunch. Laura Horvath, I think she's gonna hold on to first. I think she's gonna just crush this thing as well. But right behind her, you've got Barnhart, Brandon, Turner. There's a whole bunch of women that I think are really going to excel, especially because I think a bunch of this event comes down to that heavy carry at the end. It will be exciting and a race till the end, but let's take a look at what we have left on the schedule for Saturday. It is going to be two more strongman events and two more CrossFit events. And we, by the end of the night, are gonna crown a strongman champion. So you're gonna wanna make sure you stick around for that. We also have three more Iron Game shows, so you wanna come back for that as well. But that is going to do it for us here. Thank you so much for joining us. And coming up next is Women's Event 6.
It's time for a duel. Event number six here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational coming up next. And for the second straight year, it's an elimination style event where we will pair the field down gradually until we have a head-to-head -head matchup for the event win. Thanks for being with us here, everybody, at the Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. I'm Sean Woodland with three-time Affiliate Cup champ Adrian Conway. Laurel Horvath has a ton of momentum right now. She has won the last three events, but she has yet to get rid of Gabby Magawa. Magawa just five points back of first. These ladies are going head to head, but Laura has the advantage. Going into a, a test that is going to really highlight the athlete's ability to get up that rope and do it quickly, Laura has a climbing background. And now that we've been into such grip intensive work throughout the course of this weekend, I really like how this could play out for her. Here are your overall standings coming into event number six of ten. Horvath with that five-point lead over Gabby Magawa. Laura Horvath, the first woman to win three straight events at the Rogue Invitational. Annie Thorstadter has moved into the top three. Emma Lawson sits in fourth, and it's Amanda Barnhart, who is five points clear of Danielle Brandon for fifth. Event number six is presented by Beyond the Whiteboard. It is the Duel 2, and we saw this format last year at the Rogue Invitational. We did. The Duel 2 is just a bit of a different spin, different flavor, if you will. It's one legless rope climb into 10 overhead squats. The load isn't tremendously heavy for these athletes at 135 for the men and 95 for the ladies. And then we've got a cyclone bag carry to the finish at 200 pounds for the fellows and 150 for the ladies. And in an event this fast you just can't make mistakes what are the keys to success you know accuracy is the first thing sean that comes to my mind but not just with these rope climbs of course the hand over hand method's going to need to be quick and your descent needs to be accurate but the depth with the squats as well you can't afford a no rep and it's important to stand and show the judge what they want to see in that hip extension at the top of every rep then lastly transition speed i know we've got three elements in this test but there's a fourth and it's hidden and it is the transition time from movement to movement. We will start with three heats of five athletes. The top five women in the overall standings, Horvath, Magawa, Thorstadter, Lawson, and Barnhart, all get a bye into the second round. The top 10 times from these first three heats will advance into round two. There's Danny Spiegel who will be in lane number three. She had a great Spiegel start coming to in the day. 16th place overall. Yeah, had a great start to the day, and you'd like to think that some of that momentum from, from her heat win is going to help carry into uh, this, this test here. We start with the one legless rope climb. Annika Greer closest to the screen. And speed matters, Sean. How, how quick can they tab the top and then get down quickly? is tremendously important. It's not just can they do a legless rope climb, it's how fast. And on Enganez in the long gray pants is the first woman to the barbell. Danny Spiegel is next to her in the green pants and she has a really good pace going here. Annika Greer is the first woman through. She will pick up the 150 pound cyclo bag and she has to take it 75 feet across the finish line. It's gonna be Annika Greer who takes the heat. Spiegel is second and on Enganez will be Third, here comes Olivia Kerstetter. She and Andrea Solberg, the last two women to finish. So 41.57 seconds for Greer, the top time. That's a little fast, just a little fast. And, and I think what we, we can notice here right out of the gate is that that legless rope climb played a significant role. But Annika Greer's ability to cycle her overhead squats with clean reps, showing the judge what they needed to see in regards to depth and hip extension at the top is what resulted in her getting a lead to that bag. 41.57 seconds unofficially for Annika Greer. And heat one is done as Annika looks to advance into round number two. And that mark will certainly help her achieve that. One more look at Annika Greer's run in heat number one. Right out of the gate. Notice even the jump from the pad. It's important to create momentum up. Annika has a great leg swing, swing that allows her to feel as though she's almost kipping up that rope. And then it was a race to the barbell. Execution here matters. It's going to be easy for athletes to start wobbly. If you can get a great rep with that first squat snatch, it's going to pay off. 
and it put Annika in a great situation as she is pounding through those overhead squats. And the first to drop. You've got to be willing to get a bit reckless with the cyclone bag. Now, you, the audience will notice that this can be a tad easier to pick up and hold on to because it's actually thicker at the top and more narrow at the bottom. So it kind of fits the, the parameters of us wrapping our arms around it and holding it against our body. One heat down, two to go in this opening round. And remember, the top five women in the overall standings receive a bye into round number two. And they are out there right now just getting in some reps. They're on the right side of your screen. They just passed out of view, but they've been working on some overhead squats and just trying to stay loose as they wait for round two. There's a lot to be learned as they get to watch these other heats take the floor, but there's something to be said in being able to grease the groove and feel the heat of competition there on the floor. But we know the advantages. It pays to be a winner. You're getting to rest. You're getting less reps under tension here. Um, because of your placing already in your hard work. There's Alexis Raptis who has back-to-back -back finishes inside the top six. She finished second in DT with a spin to close out Friday night and then a sixth place finish earlier in the turtle. <laughs> Bailey Rogers, Emma McQuaid, Alexis Raptis, Carolyn Prevo, and Jacqueline Dahlstrom in this second of three opening heats in round number one. 41.57 seconds was the top time from heat number one from Annika Greer. Top 10 times from these first three heats moving in to round number two to join the top five women in the overall standings. Yeah, we're taking 10 out of these 15, and this one is all about execution. You think they're feeling the pressure a little bit? Just about ready to start heat number two. One legless rope climb, 10 overhead squats, and then the 150-pound cyclone bag carry across the finish line. Here we go. Good jump. Pretty even race right out of the gate, hand over hand for all these ladies. No kipping needed. Bailey Rogers first to make the touch. She'll get to the barbell just ahead of Alexis Raptus and Carolyn Prevo. Emma McQuaid in the white shirt on the left side. She's right there as well. Here we go. Athletes focused on driving right through the middle of their foot. You can't get too far back in the heels. You certainly can't travel forward on the toes and let the weight pull you forward. Seen a couple no reps handed out. Emma McQuaid got hit with one, as did Jacqueline Dahlstrom. And now Alexis Raptus is in the lead alongside Carolyn Prevo. Here comes Bailey Rogers. Oh, Prevo got that bag up quick. Raptus and Prevo in a foot race to the finish. They are dead even. Raptus falls. Prevo makes it across cleanly. Now, Raptus has got to get across because here comes Jacqueline Dahlstrom. And I think Raptus was able to hang on as Bailey Rogers and Emma McQuaid are across. But Carolyn Prevo will get the heat win, waiting for her official time. But Alexis Raptus with the trip. We will see if that will cost her. One heat remains here. But a great race between those two, and now they're able to share a laugh about it, but. Yeah, you love to see it, right? And they're gonna, quote unquote, risk it for the biscuit here. Alexis put it all on the line because she knew that it was down to hundreds of a second that was gonna separate her from Prevo, and, and that is really what we've gotta see. Now, you hate to see an athlete fall or falter, but it's a part of competition. What you love most is that they're able to laugh it off, get back to the athlete area, reset and get their minds right because they know there's likely a chance for them both to have an opportunity to take the field again. But one more look at heat number two that came down to the cyclone bag and we saw a couple no reps on the overhead squats. This seemed to be a pretty clean run for several of the athletes out of the gate until like you mentioned, Sean, we saw some no reps in the overhead squat which are costly. Alexis Raptus and Bailey Rogers got to the barbell at about the same time. And there was the first no rep for Jacqueline Dahlstrom at the bottom of your screen. And then Emma McQuaid got hit with one as well, and another, and, as did Dahlstrom. And what I'll say most about Prevo, she probably has one of the slower cycle rates of these overhead squats. But you know what? Every rep counted, and she knew it. And it allowed her to get off that, that barbell quick and onto the bag. The security and position that she grabbed it with and how quickly is what separated her 
from the rest of the field here. And of course, the slip up there by Raptus. And then Alexis Raptus was able to gather herself and get across the finish line just ahead of Jacqueline Dahlstrom as the top 10 times from these first three heats move on to round number two. Third and final heat here in the opening round. The athletes making their way to the starting positions. And I'll say Raptus, her, her ability to rebound quickly and respond to that adversity, get up and finish. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of in the moment focus and not letting that particular time become bigger than you as a competitive athlete there on the field. There is Ellie Turner, seventh place overall. Slow start to the competition with a 12th and a 17th, but since then, everything eighth or better, a second, a third, and then an eighth place in the turtle as she has been climbing up the standings. Now 315 points. And Danielle Brandon has been moving the right way after a 19th place in back attack. And there is Kara Saunders, who currently sits in 10th place overall coming off an 11th place finish in the turtle. And I, and I like what Danielle Brandon's gonna have an opportunity to do here, opening with a legless rope climb. And then the question mark really is gonna remain, what's she gonna do with the bag? Can she get it in a secure position and move that external load? Because it's not light, but it's something that she can handle. And we know those heavier loads can be something of a limiter for her. Matilda Garns, Ellie Turner, Danielle Brandon, Ariel Lowen, and Cara Saunders. There's Matilda Garns, ninth place overall. Best finish of the competition was a fourth in the opening event on Thursday, Texas Trail. Ten seconds. Third and final heat of the opening round has begun. It's Matilda Garns and Danielle Brandon. Brandon makes a touch first just ahead of Garns. Here goes Danielle to the barbell for her 10 overhead squats. Kara Saunders is behind her, as is Matilda wow. Garns, but Brandon wasting no time. She dusted that first squat snatch, hit the proper depth, has her judge in a rhythm of just counting reps instead of judging like a hawk walking, watching her all so closely, and that got her off the barbell quick. Brandon now to the cyclone bag along with Kara Saunders. Brandon has that thing hoisted up and she is heading towards the finish line. Here comes Kara Saunders right behind her. Brandon's gonna take the heat. Saunders is across. Ellie Turner will take third, followed by Garns and Ariel Lowen. And now we have to figure out who had the top 10 times and who will join the top five athletes in the overall standings in round two. And pretty much a done deal that Danielle Brandon is gonna be one of them. Yeah, and you even see it. Her demeanor immediately is like, okay, I finished. Get me off this. I need to get myself ready for the next round. I'm hungry for more. She had a bad taste and went, went down yesterday in regards to some of the events and their outcome, and she's out for business. Now Brandon won the opening event of the competition, then took a ninth, and then it was the back attack event, the back squats and the box jump overs that really derailed her. She missed a rep. The barbell hit the ground, it's 275 pounds, and the athletes are responsible all by themselves to re-rack that. She had to strip weight, move it back up, and at that point, she was out of contention for any sort of solid finish there. But since that 19th place finish, she has bounced back a seventh and then a third earlier today. Let's take a look back at this third and a final heat as Danielle Brandon Goes wire to wire. Smoked that initial rep right there. Executing a clean squat snatch sets athletes up for success for the rest of the nine reps. And she did fantastic with this bag, which I questioned earlier. How would she respond to that load and carrying it the distance? She showed us. She smoked it. They will tabulate the scores and figure out who the top 10 athletes are out of that opening round. And then we will be back for round number two of the Duel 2 here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational.
We are waiting to find out the 10 athletes who will join the top five in the overall standings here in round number two of event six presented by Beyond the Whiteboard, the duel number two. We've had a scoring appeal from round one. The scoring team is making sure they need to get that right because of a bracket style event. That might mean that someone who is in ends up being removed and they want to make sure that that process is correct. And now you can see the names going up on the board to round out round two. The top five winning the overall standings, top of your screen, Jacqueline Dahlstrom, Ariel Lowen, Manon Anganese, Matilda Garns, Ellie Turner, Annika Greer, Danny Spiegel, Carolyn Prevo, Kara Saunders, and now one more name needs to be put up. The suspense. Danielle Brandon. No surprise there, as she was the winner of her heat. There are the 15 women who move to round two here. You may have been watching as we were away and saw Barnhart, Lawson, Thorstadter, McGowan, and Horvath take the field, but because of that scoring appeal, they had to bring them off while they figured that out. They will be first out to kick off round number two. The top 10 women will move on. Again, allowing these athletes time to get back, move their body, stay warm, and also stay precise with these movements that they're about to get tested was extremely important and an integral part about keeping the, the field of play as even as possible. And as we saw in round number one, mistakes can be costly here. Yeah, you've got to roll through this thing clean. It's one legless rope climb, 10 overhead squats at 95 pounds for these ladies, and then a cyclone bag carry of 150 pounds for 75 feet. This event starts and stops in the blink of an eye. There is Amanda Barnhart, fifth place overall. And overall leader, Laura Horvath, who has won three straight events. Keys to the duel, too. Yeah, and like many would assume, accuracy is extremely important. Hand over hand on the rope climbs, and then also a quick descend can make or break athletes. They've got to squat to depth, show the judges what they want to see, and also extend those hips all the way at the top. And then transition speed is a fourth element of the three listed that can often be hidden in this test. So Gabriella Magawa currently sitting in second place overall, just one finish outside the top five. That was event number two, where she took 11th. Now the judges will take their positions, and we are set to kick off round number two. Top 10 times from this round move on to round three. And then it will be the top five times, and then the top two going head to head for the event win. Malasa currently in fourth place overall. She does have an event win in this competition. She took Ski Bar to open up Friday. Lawson, McGowan, Horvath, Thor's daughter, and Barnhart. Opening heat of round two. We tested rope climbs in semifinals this year. Laura Horvath is the lady out on the field that finished with the best time in those 10 legless rope climbs for time. And she's going to be first to the barbell. Horvath and Lawson get to the barbell together. Horvath right in the middle of the field. Here comes Thor's daughter and Amanda Barnhart. Now McGowa, the last woman to start her overhead squats. And Laura Horvath with a good pace here. Accuracy is key. Now we got to see how does she respond to the bag. Horvath has the bag up. Barnhart is second to the bag. She has that lifted. Laura Horvath is going to win the heat. Amanda Barnhart looking to take second place. Annie Thor's daughter and Emma Lawson battling for third. And Gabby Magawa will come in last. We'll have to wait and see the, for the official scores here. So it does look like Emma Lawson may have tied with Thor's daughter. That's unofficial right now. But Laura Horvath looking like she has a very good chance of moving into round three. Scores still adjusting, but it was very clear that Laura Horvath is your heat winner. Yeah, and here's what's interesting, Sean. She executed clean 
and flawlessly from what we saw, but now the remaining 10 athletes have a time to beat, and they are the ones that get to play can we match her time? And these, these top five now just get to sit and wonder, was that enough to advance us into the next round? A lot of waiting and nervous moments for the athletes during this event, just like we saw last year with the duel, which was the final event of the 2021 Rogue Invitational. And we will get set for the next five athletes to make their ways out onto the field. You know, there's probably people watching this wondering, like, is this, a, is this really a test of fitness for these elite athletes? And the answer to me is obviously yes. And when we think about the 10 gener general physical skills that encompass what CrossFit is, we've got strength, power, accuracy, agility, speed, balance, and coordinate coordination all at the forefront of this test. Now, it's fast, but it is a strong measure of their fitness. Jacqueline Dahlstrom and Matilda Garns along with Ellie Turner. They will be out in heat number two with Menon Anganades and Ariel Lowen. Athletes taking their positions on the starting match. Judges are in position. Matilda Grimes is taking a second to just take a look at her barbell, maybe put a little chalk on it. There is Menon Anganez. Again, you think about that hand placement. Garn's just making sure that she knows exactly how to attack the bar in that split moment to make sure she gets it overhead exactly where she wants. Some of these ladies may have to take a moment to glance at their hand position, and now she's minimized that for herself to optimize the result. Matilda Garn's continuing to warm up using every moment she has before they start this event. She came in a ninth place overall, coming off a seventh place finish in the turtle. And there is Ellie Turner, who currently sits in seventh overall with 315 points. Best finish of the competition was event number three. Took second in back attack. Ariel Lowen also in this heat. Laura Horvath, the fastest time that we have seen so far in round number two. She won the opening heat unofficially a time of 37.78 seconds. Heat two, round two. Starts with that one legless rope climb. Hilda Garns is through, and she will be the first woman to the barbell. She's on the right side of your screen, and she is one rep in. Second platform from the right is Matilda Garns. Ellie Turner, though, in the middle, has a great pace going on her overhead squats, and she has remained clean so far. Yeah, just a shorter cycle rate allows her to take the lead there on those overheads. Ellie Turner first to the bag, Manon Anganez right behind her. Matilda Garns is in third, followed by Dahlstrom. So Turner's going to take the heat. Garns trips and falls short of the finish line, allows Anganez and Dahlstrom to come across ahead of her. And now Ariel Lowen is in. And Ariel had a drop as well. She had to pick it up and finish with a few feet left. You gotta wonder when we watch things like that, Sean, is, is the overall fatigue from the first five events now starting to catch up with these ladies throughout the course of these couple days. They've done a lot of work already. Ellie Turner with a great run there. Was not the first woman off the rope, but her pace on the overhead squats is what allowed her to take the lead. And then had little trouble with that 150 pound bag as she lugged that across the finish line. And looking like she will be moving on too. Round number three. One thing that I love most as we as we get to watch short, fast events like this is the psychological test that is often at the forefront of, of all these events, especially those that, that come under a minute. 
it's how can you handle the pressure? I mean, I'm up here watching these athletes take place, and when the, ju when the, when the judge says 10 seconds, my hands get sweaty. It's hard to take the competitor out of the competition for sure. Let's go back and look at that second heat and watch Ellie Turner in the middle of your screen and the pace that she has when she gets to the barbell. Everyone was pretty much neck and neck here through the legless rope climb, hand over hand, not a lot of kipping from this heat, using their hips to get up there, just arms. But look at that cycle rate. She even got a no rep and was able to rebound from that comeback and make a sprawling finish over the finish line and make it count for the heat win. Doing a good job of letting the weight on that bag pull her forward, and I think that's why some of these athletes are tripping short of the finish line, is that they're just trying to get that momentum to carry it over. And we saw a costly fall from Matilda Garns as she was in line to finish second in that heat and winds up taking fourth. As both Anganes and Dahlstrom were able to pass her at the finish line. Third and final heat is set. And Annika Greer, who's on the far right side of your screen, had a really great run to open up the competition. She did, and what stands out to me about that clean run that we saw from her is that she didn't necessarily win coming off the rope, but her cycle speed of her overhead squats, if she can get to that bar, stick that first squat snatch, and then show the judge what they need to see, it's going to put her in a very good situation to get to that bag with a slight lead over the field. Greer's just five foot two, so not a lot of ROM there. Exactly. Not a lot of range of motion there from the hips to the knees when, she's, when we're working in that frontal plane up and down. Danny Spiegel comes into the event in 16th place overall. Her best finish was a sixth in event number three back attack, that heavy back squat and box jump over event. Brandon in lane three in sixth place overall. Spiegel Saunders, Brandon Prevo, and Greer. Third and final heat of round two has begun. Danielle Brandon in the middle of the green top. Looks to be first done with her rope climb. Prevo was second, followed by Saunders and Spiegel, and Annika Greer is the last woman to the barbell, bottom of your screen, but as Adrian mentioned, that cycle time on the overhead squats really paid off for her in round one. Danielle got there, though, with about a two-rep lead on the rest of the ladies. Brandon is through, it. so is Saunders. Here comes Carolyn Prevo, but Annika Greer, as you mentioned, Adrian, closed that gap. It's not going to matter, though, is... Danielle Brandon is going to win the heat. Saunders is in. Prevo dropped the bag. Spiegel, Greer, and then Prevo. 38.22 seconds for Danielle Brandon. Not the fastest time that we have seen, but definitely good enough to get her into round three. Top 10 times moving on. Yeah, she's out. She's again, you know, I mentioned she came out this afternoon and she means business. She's focused. She gets off the field. Now, she literally timed that just perfect, Sean. Like you said, it looks like they're using the bag to pull them forward. She nailed it. Now, I think one of the things that separated uh, Brandon from the field is look at the slight pump that she uses through her knees on her legless rope climb. It, it shortens the, the time from hand to hand, and I think it just created enough of an advantage for her to hold on those quality overhead squats that she's executing there. Hung onto the bag just long enough to get across that finish line. Carolyn Prevo was looking for a top three finish, but she had a drop late. And we'll see if that costs her, as now we will figure out the top ten times and see who is moving on to round three of the dual two.
We started with 20 women. We are waiting to find out the 10 who will advance to the next round here in events number two, the dual two. two. We have another scoring appeal that we're working through, and the judging and scoring teams are working to make sure that they get that 100% right. So while we await those results, let's send it down to the field. Kiki Dixon was the, is with the two men who programmed yes. this event, Chris Spieler and Josh Bridges. Josh, Chris, it's great to have you guys here with us. You guys are responsible for the trials and the pain that these athletes are going through this weekend. Big picture, what were you looking to achieve and get out of the programming or give to the athletes, I should say? You know, we wanted to put on a great show for all these fans. And we wanted to display these freaks, monster athletes' talents, really. So every time we try to come up with a workout, they just go out and crush it. And for you, which is your, what are your favorite events out here? I mean, who doesn't love the duel, right? This is awesome. Um, so inspiring to watch them back squat 405. And then we've got some really exciting stuff planned for the end. Have you guys uh, gone through all of these events yourself? Oh yeah, easy, all in a weekend. So it was easy. <laughs> easy day, easy day. You guys are also competing on the legend side of things. How much fun are you having with that? It's just awesome, awesome to be with friends. You know, fitness is so different in what it serves me for. Mountain biking, dirt biking, skiing, pow. Um, but uh, what a pleasure to be with friends. And has everything played out the way that you expected with the events? The, every time you have an expectation, these athletes blow it out of the water. Every time. Well, thanks for joining us, you guys. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys. Chris Spieler and Josh Bridges, the evil geniuses behind the programming here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. And they mentioned something that I think we see a lot is that you have an expectation of what the tip of the spear can achieve. And every time that gets proven to be, uh, I don't want to say incorrect, but you're not expecting enough. 100%. And, and these guys have been around the space for a long time. They, they understand physiology, exercise science, right? They've done some coaching, they do some programming. So it does, it's not that they don't have plenty of exposure and plenty of experience in this style of testing. It's that these athletes year after year just continue to advance. And it's almost as if the tester is the one that limits the pool of talent that continues to rise through our sport. So it's up to us to continue to explore when we program, when we test, because that's where these athletes get to shine. And think about the back attack event. The weight for the women on that back squat was 275 pounds. It wasn't that long ago, but that would have been a great test for the male athletes of the games. You're completely right. 275 pounds, I would have been excited about a few years ago if they put it in a front or a back squat for the males, let alone the women. And what we saw blew my mind yesterday because – for half the field, we don't even have a listed one rep max back squat, Sean, above 275 pounds from a resource standpoint. So it was like, how are they going to respond to this? And countless times we watched ladies execute not just one, not just two, but up to five reps unbroken at that load. And they literally were setting PRs on the field while we watched them compete. We are continuing to await the final results here. As we are through the first two rounds, we had three heats of 15 athletes. We're awaiting the final 10 who will move on. After that, we'll have one heat of five as the top five athletes move on, and then the final head-to-head -head matchup for the event win. Which I absolutely cannot wait to see. This test here, even as we consider it being elimination style, it is all out with whatever ounce of energy and focus that you have every time you take the field. Knowing that the risk is really high for you to not have another opportunity to step out there. Again, when we think about fitness, it's broad, and we're testing a really narrow scope because it's a short time domain. But again, when I think about those 10 general physical skills that we have as a measure, we're testing eight out of them. Strength, power, accuracy, agility, speed balance, and coordination out there. Alexis Raptus is the athlete who has appealed, and she was correct. She had a successful appeal. What is going to happen is that Raptus is going to be brought back out onto the field, she will run the course by herself, 
and that will be her new time for round two. Then that time will be factored in with the rest of the times, and then we will figure out the top 10 athletes. So a successful appeal for Alexis Raptus. She is in the gray top and green pants. She gets to log a new time now for round two. Wow. I, I, I love the adaptability of the staff here, right? To understand that there was a wrong made and to give an athlete an opportunity to show their true prowess now. She's going to have to seize the moment. There might be just a touch more pressure out there on Alexis taking the field by herself, but what a great opportunity. Well, now she has no one to pace off of, too. It's Correct. just full go, but like you said, good to get this right and allow Alexis Raptus to get the most accurate representation of her ability on the board here. Yeah, and we'd love to see this, this type of thing be avoided, but this is literally the best outcome in a situation like this. It's give her a chance, show her what she's got, give her the opportunity to continue to compete. And during the break, we saw her down there talking with one of the members of the scoring team, and we thought maybe she was the athlete with the appeal. That proves to be correct. She'll move over to the lane three. Now what's cool here is if we can get a shot of these athletes. The ones that have been eliminated literally have taken the field alongside her to watch her and to cheer her on. It is amazing. Here goes Raptus. To log her new time for round two. Okay, now here's where you gotta push, get that urgency. The first couple reps. She does a great job emphasizing lockout at the top of all those, which ensures she had a clean 10 reps. Now to the Cyclone bag, 150 pounds, and here comes Alexis Raptus to find out if her time is going to be good enough to get her into the top 10, and she is across in about 43 seconds unofficially. Clean run for Alexis. And we get to find out, was it fast enough? Well, the fastest times that we saw in that round from the Heat winners were high 30s. Laura Horvath had right around 37 seconds, 37.78 seconds. Daniel Brandon was a couple seconds off of that. So in an event this fast, we'll have to see if Raptus did enough. Yeah, and it really comes down to the cycle speed of the squats. A lot of these rounds is dictated by showing the full range of motion that, of course, is the standard for this test, but also towing the line of how fast can you return to the bottom of that squat and get back to the top. And there's a bit of risk that's inherent there when you're trying to maximize the speed, but that's really the separator. Good look at Zeus in the middle of Dell Diamond Stadium here in Round Rock, Texas. Home to the Texas Rangers minor league affiliate, the Round Rock Express. And it's really neat to see how this facility gets transformed from a minor league baseball field to, I said it earlier, like a carnival of fitness. I mean, yesterday you had the Tower of Power out there in left field. That's not there anymore. You still have the Rogue Coaster. That was the opening event for the Strongmen. We still have two events for the Strongmen coming up, and we will crown a strongman champion at the end of tonight and we still have another event for the individuals after this and the men still have to go through the duel too as you can see Annie throws down our cross honors and Danielle Brandon talking things through yeah and that's I think the unique thing about our sport is that the athletes are going head to head they all have killer mentalities they want to win they're here to win but they spend a lot of time together and they become great friends that's just good old-fashioned fun right there. Kids rolling down a hill. Good to see that. The fitness that matters, man. Setting a great example. Hey, adults, go play. Go get out there. Get itchy. That's right. Roll around. The legends are also taking part in the 2022 Rogue Invitational, and Kiki Dixon is with two of my favorite people on the planet, Tanya Wagner and Annie Sakamoto. Yes. <laughs> Ladies, you two competed as a team earlier on. Your friends both on and off the competition floor. How much fun is that to do together? 
super fun. Um, it's so it's so great to just catch up and laugh the entire time, and then get to be on the floor together and push for each other is really cool. And now, oftentimes, both of you guys can be found in the broadcast booth as well. Which do you prefer, Annie? Are you liking being on the field, or would you rather be back up at the desk? Well, it's funny. Like, right before we go out, I'm always thinking, why am I doing this? I hate this. I don't want to do this. I want to throw up. And then in the middle of it, I'm just, I'm, I'm having so much fun afterwards. It's so much fun. So they, they each make me nervous in their own way. Um, it's just so much fun to be on the floor, especially with all these other legends. Now, you know that you're going to get invited each year because, obviously, the legend status never stops. Does that keep the pressure on you to keep your fitness where you want it? Well, the cool thing is, I I don't always I don't always know. <laughs> With all the people retiring, you're like, ooh, hope I make the cut still. <laughs> but no, it's super fun. Like it does. It, I think, but just like anything else, like it's so much fun that there isn't a ton of pressure. We put the pressure on ourselves. So um, definitely, everything ramps up when it gets closer to time for the yeah for competition. And does being called a legend get you any street cred with your kids? No. Absolutely not. Yeah, yeah no. Not even. Quite the opposite, at least in my household. Legend to them is just like, you old. Like, you old and you got gray hair. Like, you're a has-been. You fabulous. Thanks for joining us, you guys. Thanks. 2009 CrossFit Games champion Tanya Wagner and Annie Sakamoto, who was the 45- to 49-year-old Masters champion last year. Always fun to hang out with those two. You will not stop smiling in their presence. Absolutely not. Fireballs. And, and always, <laughs> See, always bringing a good that time. That is <laughs> standard behavior right there for the two of them. And, <laughs> and great ambassadors for the sport. They both own affiliates. CrossFit Apex. And for Tanya Wagner, she and her husband Josh have been the longtime owners of that affiliate. And the legend is, it's a fun for them to get out here because I know a lot of those athletes that sometimes they only get to see each other once a year at this event. But it's also cool for the community. And we have new fans uh, coming in the sport every year. And some of them never got a chance to see you know, Rich Froning compete as an individual, Dan Bailey or, or Matt Chan uh, or Sam Briggs. And to see the level of fitness that, that they are still uh, able to exhibit out here has got to be inspiring for a lot of people. I completely agree. And I forget that because I'm such a nerd about our sport. I, I, I've been in it long enough myself when someone's like, wait, wait, who is, who is that again? Mm -hmm. I'm like, excuse me, what? You don't know who that is. So I, I really love that Rogue continues to include the legends because it's such an educational process to people becoming a true fan of CrossFit and what we bring to the table as a sport. I think it's a beautiful thing. And of course, you know, <laughs> hey, it's fun. These guys and ladies never disappoint when it comes to putting on a show. You know, like they, they, they get out there and, and it's all fun and games until that beef goes down. And then they're still a great example of what raw capacity looks like. Scoring team still working on getting those top 10 times correct. So while we wait on those results, let's go back down to Kiki Dixon, who is with Kerry Pierce. Kerry Pierce, it's been so fun to watch you compete on the legend side of things. However, is it hard for you to switch gears when that buzzer goes off and not want to win or win? Or what is it like for you out there? You definitely just want to go and give your best. You're like, this is about fun, but I think we're all athletes out there. So we're competing and just want to give our best and put on a show for the crowd. Now, you were paired with Rich for the first event. Did you feel any extra pressure as a result? <laughs> a little bit, yes. But I think once three, two, one, then the buzzer goes and you're like, I'm fit. I know what I'm doing. He's super fit, too. So it was just a lot of fun. And being able to go back and forth on basically everything and do the front squats together was a great time. And now that you're not competing necessarily as an individual side of things, has the cadence of your training changed? Yeah, I've definitely slowed down a lot. Um, I like work out basically four days a week. Um, and like I said, just a lot lower volume, still like decent intensity. I'm still very fit, um, but it's been nice slowing down and like joints, my body and everything feels great. And I'm just really having a lot of fun. It shows, it's been a blast to watch you this weekend. Thank you so much. Thanks, Gary. Carrie Pierce competing as a legend here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. We are in the middle of event number six of the CrossFit competition. It is the Duel 2 presented by Beyond the Whiteboard. It begins with that one legless rope climb. We go into the overhead squats and then finish up with the 150-pound Cyclone bag carry to the finish line. 
And it is a fast event, 90 second cap, and none of these athletes have needed anything close to that in order to finish it. And we mentioned it's fast, but it's a great test of so many of the things that we measure and aim to improve in a sport of fitness. Strength, power, accuracy, agility, speed, balance, and coordination are all things that these athletes have to exhibit in order to have success in this event. Still waiting on the top 10 times from round two. And then we will have two heats of five, but let's take another look at the keys to success for the duel too. Yeah, we mentioned accuracy, and it is really highlighted here in two of the movements specifically. We've got hand over hand for the rope climbs. So your speed matters up and down. We noticed Danielle Brandon have success from pumping the legs in short spurts and acting as a kip. We've seen ladies use the cycle rate or the windmill almost look like a scissor type kick with their legs on the way up. And then of course, transition speed is a hidden fourth element of these three movements that are listed because the speed from the rope to the bar and the bar to the bag is extremely important in the outcome. Well, and so far it's been those last two movements that have tripped some athletes up, whether it's a no rep on the overhead squat or dumping the bag before you are across the finish line. Yeah, and this is, this is you know, you hit the nail on the head, Sean, when you talk about the, the last two movements. There has to be an urgency throughout all three of these, but there also has to be a relaxation so that it allows you to have accuracy as you finish. And now they are filling in the 10 names who will be moving on. Barnhart, Turner, Saunders, Horvath, and Brandon are the first five. Now, Danny Spiegel makes it through along with Annika Greer, Manon Anganez. Annie Thorosauter as well. And then the final name will be maybe Alexis Raptus. So the appeal pays off for Alexis Raptus as she gets another run to put up a time. And it's good enough to get her inside the top 10. So 10 athletes remain, two heats of five before we take the fastest five times here. They will face off before that head-to-head -head matchup for the event win. Raptus, Thorostadter, Anganese, Greer, and Spiegel in the first heat. Barnhart, Turner, Saunders, Horvath, and Brandon. The table set. Here we go. We are waiting the first five athletes to make their way out to the field. It looks like they're going to give some of the athletes in round two some time to warm up so Brandon Turner Saunders and Barnhart are all in the warm-up area right now just getting in some reps to try and stay loose as they are wrangling up the five athletes who will be in heat number one yeah and I'll tell you this is a challenging portion of this for these athletes it's it's one thing to be in the safety of your own affiliate, where you train day to day, to be able to warm up and then just go attack a workout full speed. Hey, no big deal. But to be staged after a thorough warm up and have to stand still for five to 10 to sometimes longer than that, because of course we have unexpected things happen, and then have to step onto the field and go full speed and do it accu accurately with urgency can be a challenge in itself so much of this competition is how athletes can respond to adversity in the moment. And of course, unpredictability is a part of that. Cara Saunders getting some reps in on the Cyclone bag. Ellie Turner was out there messing with that thing a little bit as well. And they're still waiting on the first five athletes to make their way out, and there they are. Alexis Raptis, Manon Anganese, Danny Spiegel, Annika Greer, and Annie Thorosnod. Two minutes away from starting the first of two heats in round three. Top five scores moving on. We saw Annika Greer talking with Annie Thoris' daughter. 
Annie Thoros out her debut to the CrossFit Games in 2009. Annika Greer was six. Wow. Dates us a little bit. But I will also say Annie was extremely young when she came onto the scene, too. So, And you just l listen to some of the you know, records that, and achievements that Annie Thorsauter has in his, her career as you look at Alexis Raptis, who had that successful appeal. Annie is second all-time in event wins at the CrossFit Games with 14. She's one of nine individuals who has competed in nine regionals as an individual. Annie Thorsauter has won five regionals. She's tied with Camille Blanc Bazinet in that category. And Annie was also a member of Team Europe's individual, I'm sorry, invitational team three times. Annie Thor's daughter, Annika Greer, Danny Spiegel, Manon Anganese, and Alexis Raptis on the field here. And we are set for the opening heat of round three. Who can be first up the rope? Hey, Thor's daughter looking good, like she has a slight lead on Alexis Raptis at the other end of the field. The two of them make the touch at the same time, followed closely by Manon Anganese. And Annie needed that time hurt. Raptis is first. Her squat rate's a little slower than some of these other girls. Keep an eye on Annika Greer. She opened with a no rip, but still cruising. Greer, the second woman in from Thor's daughter. Barbell is down along with Alexis Raptis. Here come Thor's daughter and Anganese. Danny Spiegel in fifth. Alexis Raptis is just ahead of Annika Greer. Here comes Manon Anganese. Raptis is in first. And it's going to be close for second. Photo finish. We will have to wait for the official results, but Alexis Raptis takes the heat. And there were a handful of women right behind her vying for second place. Top five times will move on to round four. Ways to seize the opportunity there from Alexis. Raptus and Thoris daughter, the first two women done with the rope climb. Annika Greer put some pressure on Alexis Raptus in the overhead squats, but a clean run on the cyclone bag for Alexis Raptus. You mentioned transitions in your keys. She certainly made fast time between the barbell and the cyclone bag. And it pays off for Alexis Raptus looking to move into the fourth round. Yeah, you wonder, did that extra run prime her and get her a little bit ready for, for uh, her opportunity there in that, in that particular heat? One heat remains here in round three. Those athletes are ready to take the field. Barnhart Saunders and Brandon right there at the top of the steps, followed by Laura Horvath and Ellie Turner. Horvath, your overall leader coming into this event. She's won the last three events, the first time that has happened at the Rogue Invitational. And we can't not mention who we don't see. Gabby Magala out there climbing this rope and having an opportunity. And we know it seems that historically... Rope climbs aren't, aren't a strong suit of hers. So you wonder, was that something looming on her mind leading into this event? Was there urgency? Was there even more self-created pressure? Like, oh, I've got to get up this rope quickly. It's important for Laura Horvath to amass some points here at this junction of the juncture of the competition because there are deficit parallel handstand push-ups that are looming, and that has been a notable weakness of hers in the past. And the good news for her right now is that the only woman who is within striking distance of her right now is Annie Thoris' daughter. 
And Thoris daughter was 30 points back to start this event. So if Laura Horvath can get herself at least into the final round here, she'll have a really good chance to widen that lead. Yeah, and she's, she's got a lot of self-awareness. I believe that she understands throughout these 10 events where she's going to be able to make points, create opportunities for herself, and she knows that event is looming. So I think that even puts more of an emphasis on this run that we see her on, this, this, this hot streak of victories and potentially us even watching her fourth in a row here. Horvath had one of the best times in the last round. 37.78 seconds in winning her heat. Daniel Brandon was close to that. Both of these ladies, Danielle and Laura, both get up that rope extremely quickly, and I can't wait to see whose style shows to be more fruitful here. As we know, Danielle Brandon tends to have the short kips with bent knees on the way up. And Laura Horvath tends to keep her legs a little longer and, and, and move them from side to side almost like scissors. You've been out there on the competition floor where you have to sit and wait and the anticipation builds. What's going through your mind when all you have to do is just you'll stare down the competition floor? A lot of things, right? First and foremost, I, I'm, I'm really trying to keep myself as calm as possible. We already get so excited. The adrenaline is pumping through your veins. And what you can't do is get too emotionally involved too soon because you're just building fatigue. So you have those moments where it's, ah, deep breath, woosa, calm down, here we go. It's not time yet. And then w once they start to count down within a minute, it's time for you to get focused and get serious. We are set for the second and final heat of round three. Danielle Brandon is in the lead, makes the touch first. Laura Horvath right behind her along with Cara Saunders. Brandon to the barbell first, gets a rep in ahead of Laura Horvath. Yeah, Danielle did a great job even adjusting her feet in the middle of a rep without costing herself time there. Cara Saunders is in third place right now. And Barbell down at exactly the same time for Horvath and Brandon. It's going to come down to the bag. Horvath gets it up first. He has about... A step lead on Brandon. Brandon trying to make up that distance, but it's going to be Laura Horvath, Danielle Brandon, and then Cara Saunders. Here comes Ellie Turner, and then Amanda Barnhart is through. What a race. These ladies step for step the whole entire way. Almost dropped that barbell in sync. Sink. Laura Horvath shaves more than a second off her time from the last round. It's likely the top three here in this heat will all be moving on. But we have to, again, see what happened with heat number one in those official scores. But Laura Horvath going to move on. As Brandon, who was able to win the race on the rope, but Laura yep. Horvath makes up the ground on the overhead squats. Yeah, she made up the ground. She got to the barbell, executed very cleanly. They dropped the bar at the same time, and then all of a sudden, Laura's ability to get that bag to her lap and to her belly quicker gave her a two-step advantage on Danielle, and it paid off. If Laura Horvath advances into the final round, and Annie Thorsen does not, Laura Horvath is going to have a really big cushion on top of the overall standings heading into event number seven later on this evening. But we have to wait and see who the top five athletes ha are as we have two heats remaining. This is where the athletes have to hurry up and wait. Annie Thorstadter is already up in the stands with her daughter Freya and Frederick Gideus. She's not upset about that quality time, Sean. Not at all. Annie Thorosdotter back in individual competition for the first time since 
last year when she finished second here at the Rogue Invitational. Competing with that team she put together for CrossFit Reykjavik. Finished fourth at the CrossFit Games last August. Take a quick break. We'll be back with round four of the Duel 2. Event six, the Duel Two continues here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational, and we are awaiting the reveal of the five athletes who will be heading into round four. Thanks for staying with us today, everybody. Sean Woodland with three-time Affiliate Cup champion Adrian Conway, and we have Kiki Dixon down on the field. Laura Horvath, and Danielle Brandon, Kara Saunders, the first three athletes in that final heat, joined by Alexis Raptis. And the final athlete in will be Ellie Turner. Wow. And this is big for Laura Horvath. Yes, it is. Danielle Brandon, the only one left closest points to her. Danielle Brandon came in, in sixth place overall. 65 points back of Laura Horvath. Alexis Raptus with a smart appeal in round two to get herself into round three. Now here she is in round four. Top two will face off for the win out of this heat. Laura Horvath so far has had the fastest time that we have seen in this event. It's presented by Beyond the Whiteboard. And it starts with that one legless rope climb. But it's been the overhead squats and the cyclone bag. That's been the difference here. Yes, that is the separator in this workout. We've seen some lead changes happen off the legless rope climb. But after that, once athletes tend to get off through those 10 overhead squats, that is a big separator. 
Laura Horvath is in the middle of the screen. Again, the fastest time that we've seen so far, she's able to save more than a second off her time from round two. Trying to get her fourth straight event win here. And that's probably the most pressure that she feels. Can she execute and get number four in a row? Well, as we mentioned earlier, those parallel deficit handstand push-ups are looming. So Horvath trying to pile up some points here as Alexis Raptis came into this event in 11th place overall. She's looking to move inside the top 10. And there is Ellie Turner in 7th place overall. She could find a way to punch into the top 5 here after this event. Now we're waiting to see who has it to be top 2 in this heat. Raptus, Brandon, Horvath, Saunders, and Turner. Last heat was a battle between Brandon and Horvath, and it's looking like that's going to happen again. Brandon and Horvath make the touch at the same time on the legless rope climb, and they advance to the barbell ahead of Raptus, Saunders, and Turner. Almost synchro in the overhead squats here, rep for rep. It's going to come down to that bag. Brandon a little faster than Horvath right now. Final rep for both, and once again to the sandbag at the same time. Here comes Cara Saunders right behind oh. him. Brandon is off first this time. Horvath trying to gain some ground, and Horvath oh, is going to dive. I don't know if she made it, but Laura Horvath decides to just go full send across the finish line there, and it may have paid off, and right now, looking like it did. But those are your top two, Laura Horvath and Danielle Brandon Horvath. Again, the fastest time, this time by three-tenths of a second. Kara Saunders is going to finish third in the event. That is Saunders' second best finish of the competition. She took a second in event two. Ellie Turner is going to take fourth, and Raptus will take fifth. Now the question is... Who takes the 100 points between Laura Horvath and Danielle Brandon? And what a race between the two of them. Take one more look at it. And this time, it was Danielle Brandon who was faster on the overhead squat. It was. And she had her literally by a fraction of a rep as we closed in on reps 7, 8, 9, and 10. And as they pin this barbell down, you're going to notice it, it takes skill for them to get over that bar quick. And then, of course, you got to risk it for the biscuit. Laura knows that. She committed to winning that particular heat and dope just at the right time. Good. Top two moving on, and really Horvath had to worry about Cara Saunders, but good honor for selling out there. We'll see if she has anything left in the tank to maybe pull off another win over Danielle Brandon. She's got her the last two heats, but Brandon closed the gap there. Three-tenths of a second separating the two of them. And hey, this event is called the duel, and that's what we're about to see. We get to see a showdown between the two ladies who resulted in the fastest times, but also did it in the most exciting fashion. Risky and bold strategy to take a diving header holding a 150-pound sandbag, but Laura Horvath does it, and it pays off. They perhaps took that motivation that they watched over in right field from the children rolling aimlessly in the grass <laughs> and, and, and realized they let the creative juices flow and say, that could be my, my answer to the problem. How can I get top two? Be like that. Horvath and Brandon will square off. The winner taking the event win and adding 100 points to her total. Horvath and Brandon have gone head-to-head -head in the last two rounds with Horvath winning both times. But again, Brandon really closed the gap in that last round, just three-tenths of a second separating the two of them as it's winner take all next. Winner take all, and you got to wonder, does this work accumulation affect them differently than it does the other athletes. You're always going to choose to be one of the last standing. You're always going to want to put on the show. You're always going to want to fight and scrap for every point that's available. But do these overhead squats, these 50 extra overhead squats that they're doing over the field, does that, does that create a bit more fatigue? 
here's another look at how close the finish was between Horvath and Brandon. As the two of them got to the bag at the same time. And then Daniel Brandon just took off with Laurel Horvath. With the dive and just planted her head just right into the field. I'm surprised she doesn't have a, a big white paint mark on her forehead after that. You love to see it. Commitment to excellence, folks. Just win at whatever cost. Daniel Brandon and Laura Horvath able to talk it over now, but pretty soon things are about to get serious. Yep. As they're being called back out onto the field for the final round here of the Duel 2. Sixth of 10 events that the athletes will face here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. We have the Texas Log awaiting this evening. which I absolutely cannot wait to see, by the way. It's going to be fun to watch. Laura Horvath trying to bring home again her fourth straight event win here. Coming off a third place finish at the CrossFit Games in August, the second straight year in which she has finished on the podium in Madison. Danielle Brandon got off to a great start in the competition. Won the opening event, then took a ninth place in event two, and then really had a hiccup in back attack where she took 19th because of a missed rep. She had to reload the barbell onto the rack and really took her out of contention. But since then, back inside the top 10, a seventh and a third, and now at least a second place finish here in the duel two. Yeah, and this is where psychology plays plays a bit of a game here on athletes. Is are you content with being one of the last two? Or do you really want that 100 points? And it's going to take focus, and it's going to take a lot of tenacity here. But just like we saw from both these ladies in the last seat, they're, they're not going to leave anything out on that field uh, through this event. Last two heats, Laura Horvath has gotten the best of Danielle Brandon for the third time be the charm for Brandon here as she looks to bring home her second event win of the competition. Horvath going for her fourth win of the competition at her fourth straight. Here we go, winner take all, 100 points on the line. Danielle Brandon looks like she has a slight lead over Laura Horvath on this legless rope climb, making the touch ahead of Horvath and Brandon. Yep. To the barbell first, and she gets a rep in just ahead of Laura Horvath. The same scenario that we saw in the last heat. Yeah, right now working with a full rep ahead this time. Brandon, final rep for her. Barbell is down, barbell down for Horvath, and it's going to come down again to the bag. Horvath has it. Wow. She is ahead of Brandon right now, and Laura Horvath make it four in a row. Yeah, give her those fireworks. What a show and what a come from behind victory that she just executed. That's amazing focus. Fourth straight event win for Laura Horvath and she is going to have a stranglehold on the top spot in the overall standings with four events remaining. What a feeling she's got to experience right there. Fruits of hard labor. Danielle Brandon looked like she might have had it as she once again got to the barbell first. But Laura Horvath on the overhead squats, her pace was just slightly faster. And as she did in the last round, was able to have a very good pace on the cyclone bag and gets across the finish line. One more look at how it went down. Horvath and Brandon head-to-head -head for the win.
Head to head, Danielle had the slight lead right out of the gate and into the rope. Even in the overhead squat, she was a rep ahead of Laura. But as these ladies started to wrap up the overhead squats, it was Laura who was first to the bag and take a few steps. And it gained her that victory, which is four in a row. Overall standings, Laura Horvath now a 60-point lead over Annie Thoris' daughter, continuing to climb and now inside the top two. Gabby Magawa sits in third place, 65 points back. And Danielle Brandon, she will move up into fourth place. Kiki Dixon is with Laura Horvath. Laura, you just had your fourth Rogue Invitational event win in a row. I don't think anybody's ever done that before. How high are the confidence levels right now? Oh, it's pretty high. I can't wait for the last one tonight. You and Danielle had the opportunity to go head to head several times as you cycled through this event. What did you learn about yourself and Danielle as you went through each round? It was awesome. It was actually a race every single time when we were next to each other. So it was awesome. I really liked it. You just had to like go really fast, but also don't get no reps. So it was like you had to pace it a little bit, but also full send. So I don't know. It was awesome. She went full send. It worked. Congratulations on your fourth Rogue Invitational event win, Laura. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. You're the best. The streak continues for Laura Horvath. Now four straight wins. She moves into third all-time on the career wins list at the Rogue Invitational. Now with four behind Pat Vellner and Tia Toomey. And all by herself on top of the overall standings. Women are done with the duel. It's the men's turn. Coming up next at the 2022 Rogue Invitational.
We saw the women go through the dual two. Now it's the men's turn as action continues on Saturday at the 2022 Rogue Invitational from Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. Thanks for being with us, everybody. I'm Sean Woodland with three-time Affiliate Cup champion Adrian Conway and Kiki Dixon is down on the field. Sean. Overall standings coming in. Sorry, Adrian. Roman Krenikov, 10-point lead now over Justin Medeiros. Pat Vellner has moved up into third place. He is 15 points up on Sam Quant. And Jeff Adler sits in fifth with 370 points. The Duel 2, presented by Beyond the Whiteboard, is up next. And it's the same movements we saw with the women. And this is another fast one. It's one legless rope climb, 10 overhead squats at 135 pounds for these guys, which they can move quickly. And then we've got a cyclone bag carry, and it's 75 feet at 200 pounds. Keys to the event. The keys are simple. They have to be deadly accurate. Hand over hand on the rope climbs, fast descend, perfect depth on the squats. Get low enough, stand tall enough, make them count. And then, of course, you got to hit the transitions with as much focus as you can. That's the fourth and hidden element of this test. Scott Tetlow, Jack Farlow, Tim Paulson, Jorge Fernandez, and Lazar Jukic will be the first five men out. Same story with the men as it was with the women. The top five men in the overall standings get a bye into round two. We are underway. Opening heat for the men in event six. Farlow's fast up that rope. Jack Farlow, the first man to make the touch and the first man to the 135 pound barbell, followed by Jorge Fernandez and Lazar Jukic. Tetlow is getting hit with some no reps there on the left of the screen. He got two in a row. And that's going to be costly. Fernandez first off the bar to the sandbag. Fernandez in the bag first, followed by Farlow and Jukic. Here comes Paulson. Tetlow just got finished. Farlow drops the bag. Fernandez is in first. Jukic will be second. Paulson cannot catch Farlow. And here comes Tetlow in fifth. A mistake for Jack Farlow. May, him, may have cost him the event win as Jorge Fernandez is going to log the fastest time in heat one. You know, there's something I'll say to having the advantage of a lot of team experience, with, which Jorge does have in, in, in droves, is that you're used to maximizing your particular speed and intensity anytime that you can in order to either get your teammates on the field or on the floor, or of course, to make sure that you're not the slowest link. So that could be an advantage for him in this particular event. Jorge Fernandez will take heat number one as we take one more look back. And Jack Farlow got off to a great start. He was the first man off the rope and looked like he was going to be able to hold on to the lead until he drops the bag. Yeah, and like you said earlier, even as we were watching the female, Sean, it's, it's those latter two movements that mean the most. It's the 10 overhead squats and then the transition to that bag and getting it over the finish line. And that's where Jorge Fernandez seized the opportunity. Fernandez had a great pace on that. I don't think Farlow was going to be able to hold him off, but maybe a top two finish had Farlow not dropped that Cyclone bag. 200 pounds is on the bag for the men. We are set for the second of these three opening heats. Here is Cole Sager. He will be out there with Jonakowski, Saxon Panchik, Heinrich Hapalainen, and Nick Matthew. Cole Sager has a pretty fast cycle rate on his squats. This could be something that allows him to have some good success here. And Sager has put on some pretty good performances in the past in events that feature rope climbs. Sager's had an up and down competition so far. Started with an 11th place in the Texas Trail, then got into the top 10 with a 9th, then a 16th, an 8th, then an 18th. 14th place overall is Sager. You saw Nick Matthew, he's in 15th place overall. Saxon Panchik, 11th place, has three finishes of 10th. 
out of five events. The two Finnish athletes in the field have been joined at the hip. I think they've competed together in every heat so far. <laughs> Heinrich Hapalainen is coming off his best finish of the competition. He took third in the turtle. Saw Nick Matthew. He has an event win under his belt. He won back attack. Seconds. 30 seconds before we start. Hapalainen's probably the, the tallest athlete out there, and that might give him a slight advantage being the first up the rope here. Then, of course, because of the balance of this test, that's where he could have some trouble on the overhead squats as well. Apple in six feet one. Yeah. And heat number two has begun. And it is Apple and Matthew and Sager. They all made the touch at about the same time. And all five men right to work on the 10 overhead squats at 135 pounds. Koski with a no rep. He's still on the lead pace, though. Matthew with the barbell down first, along with Cole Sager, different ends of the field. Here come Hapalainen and Panchik. And now Koski, Nick Matthew ahead of Cole Sager. Matthew is in first. Sager gets across. Maybe not. It may have been half a line, and Koski's going to beat Panchik across the finish line. We will wait for the official scores, but it was close between Heinrich Hapalainen and, and Cole Sager. Nick Matthew, though, will get the heat win as we now have one heat remaining in the opening round. Yeah. The equipment team doing a great job all weekend long, getting things reset in a timely fashion, just lugging equipment on and off the field. We thank them for their efforts. Their preparedness is unmatched. Literally, in our walkthrough day, I, I watched them take reps after reps of getting things on, getting things off, timing it, knowing exactly what it was going to take to allow this event to have success. It's amazing to watch. No Olsen giving the folks at home a wave. It will be Olsen, Chandler Smith, Bjorvin Gumanson, Jason Hopper, and Ricky Garrard in heat number three. <laughs> Let's go back and take another look at that heat. And it was really even off the start. Very even. Matthew had a quick reach at the top and in a very fast descent that allowed him to get to those overhead squats first. A clean run of 10 reps, and they were fast, and it allowed him to make slight work of this bag. What a quick pickup and immediately into his first step. Nick Matthew takes the heat, and like I said, it was close behind him between Sager and Hapalina. You love to see it. When you come off with an event win like that and you, you catch stride, you're just like, yeah, let's just keep it moving. I want to roll back <laughs> and run this back as soon as I can because I'm in the zone right now. The men of heat number three here in the opening round are out on the field. Again, it's Ricky Garrard, Jason Hopper, Bjorvin Gubinson, Chandler Smith, and Noah Olson. One thing to watch is we, we watch the athletes transition from this overhead squat to the bag, regardless of where they're at, is do they pick it up with their feet parallel to one another, or are they picking it up, and as they reach it to that braced position, are they in stride walking forward? Daniel Brandon actually did a really great job of that for the females, and of course it allowed her to get that top two finish. And I think we saw the same thing there from Nick Matthew, so I'm anxious to watch some of that here take place as we watch these rounds unfold in front of us. Bjorvin Carl Gumanson in sixth place. One of the most consistent CrossFit athletes that we have seen over the last 10 years. And there is Chandler Smith. Great to see him back out here in live competition after what happened to him at the Granite Games and the medical issues that he was dealing with that kept him from earning a qualifying spot. 
to the CrossFit Games. Chandler Smith, though, has had two finishes outside of the top 10, trying to correct that here in the dual two. And there is Jason Hopper, the man who started the competition with an event win in the Texas Trail. He is one of four athletes who have 300 points. Hopper in seventh place overall coming in. Third and final heat of round one. 33.87 seconds, that is the top time so far. Ricky Garrard got up there in a hurry along with Hopper and Chandler Smith. Garrard is the first man to work on the overhead squats along with Chandler Smith. A bit of a stumble from Ricky, otherwise he's gonna have a pretty fast cycle right here. Chandler is moving. Chandler Smith. Looks to be the first man done with the overhead squats, but it's Noah Olson who gains some ground. Olson first the bag. Smith is second, followed by Boominson, Garrard, and Hopper. Noah Olson's going to take the heat. Chandler Smith has got to be careful as Bjorgen Boominson was right there. Hopper's going to beat Garrard across the finish, but Noah Olson with the heat win, looking to move on to round two. Just got to do that six more times. Chandler Smith just does hold off Bjorgen Boominson. Jason Hopper coming in ahead of Ricky Garrard. Top 10 times from round one. We'll move on to round number two. And the top five men in the overall standings got a bye directly into round number two. But a heat win for Noah Olson. And you've got to finish. We watched Noah come out. He is not the first off the rope, and that is okay. And he probably trusted that in the process of this, knowing if he stayed the course with his overhead squats, it's where he could take the lead and he makes small work of this big bag and gets it across the finish line very quickly. Great grip and great approach to picking it up and getting it moving. Noah Olsen, 10th place overall. Woo! Coming into the event, looking to move on here in the duel two. We will find out who will be in round two after a quick break. Stay with us here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational.
We are through the first round of event six of 10. The Duel 2, presented by Beyond the Whiteboard here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. And the men who received a bye into round two, the top five in the overall standings, will be up first. This is a fast event, Sean. One legless rope climb for the men, 10 overhead squats at 135 pounds, and then of course, the race to the finish with that cyclone bag for 75 feet. 200 pounds is what that cyclone bag weighs. Justin Medeiros is part of this heat right now. Second place overall, and a rare mistake for him in the last event where he got hit with a no rep on the lunge portion of the turtle. A 12th place finish, rare to see him outside of the top 10. Right now in second place, 10 points back though of Roman Krennikov. You know, we forget about this with Justin Medeiros is that he is the second youngest male in this field. How will he respond psychologically to this new pressure that he's found on himself? Plenty of scores left, yes, but an outside the 10 top finish, very rare for him. And with an event that actually involves such pressure each and every time you take the field, what's he gonna show us here in this event? Justin Medeiros last year in the duel squared off with Guy Mahiros in the finals. And he had clean runs throughout that event. So he is a man who knows how to execute under pressure. He'll be out there with Sam Quant, Roman Krennikov, Pat Vellner, and Jeffrey Adler. What a lineup. Opening heat of round number two of the duel two. Top 10 times, moving on. Roman Krennikov in the middle is just about even with Justin Medeiros. Medeiros, Quant, and Vellner were the first three men through the rope climb. Vellner gets to work on his overhead squat, just a fraction of a rep ahead of Quant and Medeiros. Medeiros with a great pace here. Yep. And a no rep for Roman Krennikov. Vellner with the barbell down. Medeiros and Vellner first to the bag. Here come Adler and Great Quant. transition for Kronik Medeiros. Krennikov now in trouble. He's the last man in the bag. Medeiros will take the heat. Vellner is second. Quant and Adler are across. Krennikov needs to hurry. So Roman Krennikov will finish in fifth. The top ten times move on. We still have two heats to go. But that could open the door for Justin Medeiros to retake the lead here. What execution by Justin there. Didn't start off in the lead. We saw Vellner jump out front early. But boy, he stayed the course, gained some ground on those overhead squats. And I'm going to tell you right now, his transition to the bag to get it off the ground and get it moving was the fastest that I've seen all day. Justin Medeiros looking to move on to round three. Just the top ten times from this round moving on. And Roman Krennikov is... In a little bit of trouble here. But one more look here, and these athletes got a buy. So it's the first time that they've been able to attack this event. And while they did get the rest, they did not get the experience out on the field. Yeah, you got to wonder, and not an opportunity to touch through one of these rounds out there on the field. Did it hold them back? Did it hinder them in any way? They should feel fresh, but also we see that kind of play out in some of these athletes' favor as they catch a groove. Justin, it didn't affect him one bit. Justin Medeiros with a heat win. Pat Vellner came in after him, and there was a, a tight finish between Quant and Adler, but we do know that Roman Krennikov, fifth place in that heat. He's going to need some help to move on here. We have seen some crazy things happen in these events so far, in these heats of this particular event. No reps on the overhead squats. Sandbags taking a spill. Athletes taking a spill. And not always over the finish line. So it could happen. Five men in the next heat. Jason Hopper, Lazar Jukic, Jorvin Gumanson, and Heinrich Hapolainen, along with it. Yonikowski. An event with this type of speed, Sean, really emphasizes the importance of practice. 
You know, and I, and I don't mean that from a perspective of only competitors at the elite level. I mean, the day-to-day -day athletes in CrossFit affiliates across the world have to be able to put a prime uh, emphasis on their ability to practice skill work, whether it's under, understanding and identifying the proper depth for your personal overhead squat, how to stand it up all the way, how not to just climb a rope several times in a row, but how to do it quickly. And of course, we love to play with odd objects. But I think we're really seeing the fruits of a, a lot of certainty from these athletes that do this at a very high speed. And you don't gain that certainty and that confidence without skills and drills. And that takes time and intentional practice in order to develop. We are through one of three heats here in round number two. As we await the five men who will be in heat number two. Hopper, Jukic, Gumanson, Hapalainen, and Koski. Dukic moved through round one pretty darn well for experiencing a rolled ankle early this weekend. So it's good to see him doing his thing and being able to still perform at a pretty high level here amongst some of the fittest in the world. Yeah, despite competing on a bit of a bum wheel, I mean, Lodger Dukic is in 20th place overall, but you got to admire him for staying out there and competing. Yeah, it's just, you know, and, and, it, and it's hard. It's hard, It's a hard choice. I, I'm sure it was a hard choice for him, his coach, to make because it's like, do we risk your health? Do we risk further injuring yourself? But then you look at the stage and the opportunity that's set here at the Rogue Invitational where – you get to learn so much about yourself personally, and then of course you get an opportunity to go head to head with, with the best in the world at a sport that he's trying to continue to grow his greatness in. And clearly he feels good enough to compete, but probably couldn't turn down this great opportunity that's out here in front of him. Five men in heat number two coming out to the field. Heinrich Hapalainen will be one of them. Yeah, Heinrich finishing 21st at this year's CrossFit Games is a big frame, 6'1", 207 pounds. He's an athlete with high work capacity, and we're really going to see, can, can, can he line up and move fast against some of these shorter statured or shorter levered athletes? There is Jason Hopper, who comes in in seventh place overall, back-to-back sixth-place finishes coming into this event. He does have... An event win under his belt in the Texas Trail on Thursday. There's Bjorven Carl Gumanson in a very Bjorven Carl Gumanson like position on the overall leaderboard. Sixth place coming in. And then Yonikowski, who comes in in 12th place overall. Styling with that backwards hat tipped up. You gotta love it. And there's Lazarus Dukic, who once again had that ankle injury, rolled his ankle on the Texas Trail and has stayed in the competition, continues to fight here. Heinrich Hapalainen, 13th place overall with 215 points, but he is coming off his best finish of the competition in the turtle. Earlier today, he took third to earn 90 points. Yeah, he made fast work of that turtle on the rope. Let's see how he climbs this one. Heat two of round two. Koski, Jukic, and Hopper all making the touch at the same time. Koski's one of the first men to the barbell. No rep for Hapalainen. Hand in the air for Dukic and Gumanson. Yeah, Dukic's transition under the bar was astonishing. He didn't even extend his hips all the way for a squat snatch. He dropped directly under the bar. It was terribly impressive. Dukic and Koski get to the bag first, followed closely by Bjorvan Carl Gumanson and Jason Hopper. And bum ankle and all. Lazar Dukic looks like he's going to take the heat. Jonah Koski, though, dove across the finish line. And it was not enough. So Lazar Dukic. 35.86 seconds. Wow. Heinrich Hapalainen 
Now the slowest time in that heat at 40.07. Great job there by Dukic, and I think a lot of the success that he had there was his transition from that rope under the barbell to begin those overhead squats was extremely impressive, especially considering the fact that to move well in overhead squat, we gotta have some good dorsiflexion in that ankle joint. And with an injury due to inflammation and discomfort, that is a hard and compromised position to put yourself in. How impressive that he's able to grind through this and not just survive, but, but be thriving here in a sprint event like this. And putting himself in great position to move on to round three. Top 10 times from this round will move on. We have one heat left here in round number two. Go back and take a look at that last heat. And man, this was dead even for most of it. It really was dead even across the board. We watched the athletes transition to that overhead squat. Dukic was the first one to get that barbell moving and get the reps to begin to count. And I think that's really what set him apart and allowed him to set the pace for this and get moving on that sandbag quickly. And he was battling with Yonikoski on the far end of the field. Koski, you can't see it here, but we'll show it to you in a second. Tried to dive across the finish line. <laughs> In stylish fashion, he didn't have to tuck and roll. He timed it just right. Gave him his placing by one hundredth of a second. Good enough for second place in the heat for Yonikowski and setting himself up nicely to move into round three, but we still have one heat left. Five men in that heat are gathering in the dugout down the third baseline here at Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. Noah Olson, Nick Matthew, Jorge Fernandez, and Chandler Smith are there. And it looks like Cole Sager as well. As he's waking up some muscles in his posterior, we do that often. Hit the legs. Are they still there? Yep, they're still there. Hips, good. Yep. Still a little sore. We've done a lot of squatting here. We've done a lot of fitness. You gotta wake that body up, get ready for some more. Cole Sager has been to the CrossFit Games every year since he made his debut in 2014. His best career finish there was fifth. That was in 2016. He has also won the Spirit of the Games Award. Good look at Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. Second straight year it has played host to the Rogue Invitational. This competition started back in 2019 and they held it at Rogue headquarters in Columbus. 2020, of course, it was held virtually. And then in 2021, it moved here to Round Rock. And then last year they added the Strongman competition. We still have two Strongman events left today. And one CrossFit event after this. Which I gotta say, Sean, I I've never watched strongman in person this is a first for me and man it's so exciting so exciting to watch an experience here firsthand it's incredible to watch some of the things that those athletes are capable of and we still have two events for the strongman coming up later we have the the yoke log and then the stone over hitching posts and then we'll see the crossfit athletes take on a log press this evening as well And then earlier today, we started the competition with the strongman, and it was the Roga Coaster, which is out there in left field. And that was a fun event to watch. And I was talking to Lawrence Chalet and, and Brian Shaw, the four-time World Strongest Man, about this. And, you know, this is a test you see a lot in strongman events, and you, know, you could have accomplished a, a similar stimulus with a, a different apparatus, but what Rogue always does is they, they make a spectacle of it. They make it look great, and that uh, Rogue coaster is pretty impressive out there as Martins Leitzis was able to grab the event win. He is your defending Rogue Invitational Strongman champion. Event six here for the CrossFit athletes is the Dual Two. 
legless rope climbs, some overhead squats, and then the 200-pound sandbag carry across the finish line. And we are now ready for the third and final heat of round two. It's going to be Chandler Smith, Jorge Fernandez, Nick Matthew, Noah Olson, and Cole Sager. This is going to be a great heat to watch, and not that any of them haven't been so far, but there are some extremely fast squatters in this particular heat, and, and I think it's going to lead to a really exciting showdown here. There is Chandler Smith. He had a little bit of a delay as there was another scoring appeal. And the scoring team and judges want to make sure they get that right, so they take all the time they need to make sure they do whatever they can to accomplish that. Noah Olson coming in in 10th place overall. He is one of four athletes who came in tied with 300 points. Nine-time CrossFit Games competitor, Sean. Could this year make it number 10 for him? And also received the Spirit of the Games Award this past August. And there is Nick Matthew, had, who had an impressive performance at the CrossFit Games and, and got in as a backfill and made the most of that opportunity as Matthew Wound up finishing 14th overall in his rookie year and actually had two event wins. Yeah, extremely impressive. Let's get this party started. Third and final heat of round two is underway and it's Nick Matthew and Chandler Smith out early after the legless rope climb. They will be first at the barbell, followed by Fernandez, Olsen, and then Sager. Noah's cycle rate still just besting everybody on the field. Final rep for Noah Olsen, barbell down along with Fernandez and Chandler Smith. Olsen and Fernandez get to the bag first, but Fernandez again sprinting across the finish line with that. Olsen will finish second, followed by Chandler Smith, Sager, and Matthew. 32.76 seconds for Jorge Fernandez. Cooking. Cooking. That boy fast. Great job of executing clean. Again, the way he approaches the sandbag, it's, it's such confidence that he gets it up and he's taking a step right as he bellies that thing and it allows him to get several steps ahead of the, the competition. Fernandez in 18th place overall coming into this event, but so far looking like the man to beat in this sixth of 10 events here. Two really impressive runs for him so far. And now we will wait and find out who the top 10 are. And these are going to be some nervous moments for Roman Kranikov because he came in with that 10-point lead yep. over Justin Medeiros, and there is a chance that Roman will not advance. But one more look at that last heat, and Jorge Fernandez for the second straight time coming across the finish line first. 32.76 seconds. That is the fastest time we have seen. Jorge did a great job, a lot like we saw from Dukic, getting under the bar without doing a full squat snatch. Those are the details that other competitors commonly can overlook. And that's what created some separation for him and advantage in this. We will wait to find out who will move on. 10 athletes will head to round three here in the duel two. Stay with us as action continues at the 2022 Rogue Invitational.
we have figured out the top 10 men that will move on to round three. Jorge Fernandez, who had the fastest time that we've seen, no shock that he's there, along with Noah Olson, Justin Medeiros, and Pat Velner. They will be in heat number two, along with Chandler Smith. Lazar Jukic will be in heat one. Bjorvan Gumason, and this is not looking good for Roman Krennikov. Nick Matthew along with Cole Sager. So Roman Krennikov does not get out of round two. And he will not be your overall leader after this event. The door now wide open for both Justin Medeiros and Pat Vellner. Medeiros came into the event just 10 points back at Krennikov. Vellner just 15 points back. We saw something similar last year. Pat Vellner came into the final event, the duel, 30 points back at Justin Medeiros. He got a bye, did Vellner and then was knocked out in round two. Yeah, you wonder if they missed that extra touch, that extra run through of this particular event with intensity, with the intention. It's very different than just going out and getting a warm up. And we saw a similar thing happen with Gabby McGollin on the women's side as well today, Sean. So it could be the, the, the setback of not having quite to do uh, as much work as the rest of the field. A mistake in event five cost Justin Medeiros, and now a mistake in event six could prove to be very costly for Roman Krennikov. Top five times out of this round will advance. It's Cole Sager, Bjorgen Gumitsen, Lazar Jukic, Jona Koski, and Nick Matthew, who will be out first. Nick Matthew who comes in in 15th place overall. Won an event yesterday in back attack. Yeah, and he's strong, good squatter, great at seizing the moment, which we got to see at the CrossFit Games put on full display, executing new movements both in gymnastics and with the jump rope this year and excelling in that. And we know that his coach has said he's just here to learn and gain experience. Well, he's got another opportunity to do that right now. We are underway. First of two heats here in round three. Everybody done it about the same time. Sager and Koski getting to the barbell first, followed by Matthew Jukic and Gubinson. Koski, similar technique to what we saw from Dukic there in the previous round, getting under the bar quickly, not quite extending all the way through that squat snatch. Jukic got hit with a no rep. Koski now in front by himself. Nick Matthew and Cole Sager. Behind him, followed by Jukic and Gumitsin. Yona Koski is going to hold off Nick. Matthew Sager comes across, followed by Jukic, and then Jürgen Carl Gumitsin. Yona Koski wins his heat 34.42 seconds. Nick Matthew was gaining on him, just ran out of real estate. Matthew's going to take second, followed by. Cole Sager, Jukic, and then Bjorvin Carl Gubinson with one heat remaining here in round three. Yeah, great pacing right out of the gate by Yona. He was fast up that rope. It was very close overall, but just a slight advantage coming down, getting to the bar, very clean and getting under it and starting to count those overhead squats. Got in the lead going into the bag. Koski looking to move his way into round four. We go. Yona, one of the first off the bag. Quick transition to the bar, and look at that squat speed. And Lazar Jukic, who was neck and neck with Koski, got hit with a no rep, and Yona Koski took advantage. He did, and even what we saw, as we saw Nick Matthew kind of gaining speed on him, there have been another 20 feet left. Boy, we could be talking about a different result, but Yona literally paced it just right for the task that was ahead of him. Heat win for Yona Koski. As one heat remains here in round three. Justin Medeiros, Jorge Fernandez, who has the fastest time of anybody we have seen so far, followed by Noah Olson, Pat Bellner, Chandler Smith also among the five men who will be out there.
and it's a big heat right now for both Pat Vellner and Justin Medeiros, the two men who are right behind Roman Krennikov in the overall standings. Roman has been knocked out, and he had just a 10-point lead on Medeiros for the overall lead and a 15-point lead on Pat Vellner. Justin Medeiros trying to become the first man to repeat as Rogue Invitational Champion. And there's Pat Vellner. And, and he, you know, this is big for Pat because it's not just about Justin poising himself or creating potential to take the crown. It's where can Pat go and how can he manage to create or, or use this as an advantage to gain on Roman and hopefully overtake him in his position. Vellner, the 2020 Rogue Invitational Champion. There is Justin Medeiros who had that one hiccup in the turtle event, the no rep on the lunge. It was his first finish outside the top five so far in the competition. He took 12th in that event. His last run through this, Sean, was clean and fast. So was that man's Jorge Fernandez. So far has been the fastest in this event. Fernandez, as I said earlier, 18th place overall coming in. But if he keeps up the work that he's been doing, he could very well win this event. And there is Chandler Smith, who is eighth overall. Best finish so far with a second place in event two, Ski Ball. Second and final heat of round three of the duel two. Medeiros Smith and Medeiros flying up that rope. Pat Vellner is the first man to the barbell. Medeiros cycle time in the last heat was faster than Vellner's. But Vellner right now is hanging on to the lead. We'll have the barbell down at the same time as Medeiros. Here come Chandler Smith and Jorge Fernandez. Medeiros is off first. Look out, because Fernandez is gaining ground. Jorge Fernandez trying to overtake Medeiros. Oh, it's going to be I close. I don't know who won that. I think Velner's going to finish third. Wow. We'll have to wait for the scores. It looked like Velner edged out Smith across the finish line. We have yet to get his time, but it seems like Medeiros was able to hold off Jorge Fernandez by about three-tenths of a second. Yeah, where it stands, I'll tell you, Justin really took advantage, again, his transition to the bag to get it from being completely still on the ground to moving it forward towards the finish line is impressive. He, he doesn't get as low as most of the competitors under the bag and try to scoop it. He literally just places his fingers just enough under it, confidently picks it up, and gets to work. Justin Medeiros winning the heat and looks to move into the final round, top five times coming in and we'll have to sort out the finish here because it was close. Very close and I'll tell you what, it was a bit of a hidden element but Fernandez got hit with a no rep in the middle of those overhead squats and if that doesn't happen, well, we could be having a different discussion clearly. They dropped the bar close to the same time. Just a quick pick up there by Medeiros and that is what sets him apart with just enough lead. But look at Fernandez gaining. It was Total that close. Finish. And then Vellner on the far end of the field looks like he may have beaten Smith across the finish line, but we have to wait on the official score because that was extremely close between the two of them. Top five, moving on to round four. Things getting serious here. In event number six, the duel two at the 2022 Rogue Invitational.
We are almost down to the final five athletes of event six for the CrossFit competition, the dual two here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. The strong men are getting warmed up for their next event, the yoke carry overhead log lift medley out there in left field. And we actually saw one of them, Mitch Hooper, go over to the barbell where the CrossFit athletes have been warming up and try an overhead squat. And the crowd got some kicks out of that. Mitch did nef definitely did not hit depth, but still it is cool to see uh, both sports coming together here uh, at the Rogue Invitational. Last year was the first time that Rogue added the strongman competition, and it's the first time I think a lot of CrossFit fans got to see strongman in action, and it's a lot of fun to, to check out. It's, it's cool that it's on display here on this stage. I think so. It's, it's a beautiful thing to watch communities combine and, and actually grow together. You know, the more eyes and the new more eyes that we can have on our sport, awesome. The new more eyes that they can have on their sport, even better. And I had conversations with strongmen that said, watching the CrossFit athletes maneuver the bag the way they did at the CrossFit Games will actually push their sport and specifically even on the female side for the future. Well, Rob Kearney on the left side of your screen in those multicolored tights actually got his start in strongman through CrossFit. And he is a member of Matt Fraser's HWPO team. So we look forward to seeing that event later on. But Right now, the business at hand is figuring out who the five men who will move on to round four of the Duel 2 will be. And here we go, Justin Medeiros. No surprise that Jorge Fernandez is there as well. And Pat Vellner. Chandler Smith has made it through. And finally, Yona Koski. So another big opportunity for Pat Vellner and Justin Medeiros to put some distance between themselves and overall leader Roman Krenikov, who did not make it out of round two. Medeiros was just 10 points back at Krenikov to start the event. Vellner, 15. And the two athletes that had the fastest times here in that coming out of that previous round were Medeiros and Fernandez. And Fernandez was the one that got hit with the no rip on those overhead squats. Can he clean up this run and allow it to project him through and be top two again to get that opportunity on the final round? And there is Jorge Fernandez who came in in 18th place overall, making the most of this event here. Yonikoski. Was looking to punch into the top 10, came in in 12th with 250 total points. Top two times will move on out of this heat and score off one final time in a winner take all heat. We talk about seizing the moment, Sean, and, and, and Chandler Smith has something to prove to himself. He's out here literally, again, competing with the fittest on earth, and he didn't get an opportunity to display that at the CrossFit Games this year as he ran into some trouble at the Granite Games physically due to his health. Um, and, and now this is a stage for him to see where his fitness is, put his best foot forward, and really see where this 2023 season is going to go for him. Round four underway, top two men. Moving on, Justin Medeiros and Pat Vellner at the same time make the touch, and then Koski stumbles coming off the mat. Chandler Smith got to work first on the overhead squats just ahead of Vellner and Medeiros, and Vellner, a no rep. He's moving pretty quickly here. Two no reps for Koski as well. Medeiros and Chandler Smith. Here comes Jorge Fernandez. Medeiros has to go quick with that bag. Jorge's going to make slight work, lots of speed. Here comes Fernandez. It's going to be Medeiros Fernandez, Chandler Smith, Pat Velder, and then Yona Koski is going to finish in fifth place. For the second straight year in this format, Justin Medeiros will find himself in the final round going head to head with Jorge Fernandez. And again, it was close between the two of them across the finish line. What a race. Pat Vellner is going to finish fourth in this event. That is going to be good enough for 85 points. Chandler Smith will take third. He'll earn 90 points. And then Yonikosi finishing fifth. 
will add 80 to his total. But Justin Medeiros looking to be your overall leader heading into the third and final event of the day. Yonikoski, the first man we've seen stumble coming off the mat, but there's just so many things that you don't even think about that when you think about transitions, but he fell, and that cost him. And then we had a couple no reps from Pat Vellner, who was moving at a really fast pace on those overhead squats. And I'll tell you, that's the unique thing about this event. Sean, if you're thinking about anything, you're already in trouble, right? Like, this is completely a go fast, take chances event where athletes are out there when they're executing well in a complete flow state, which means they almost hear the beep, and then all of a sudden they come to consciousness as they pass the finish line, not even really sure what happened. And a lot of times that's how they optimize their performance. They're in a place where they're simply out there executing the movement standards and finishing as fast as possible. Noah Olsen taking some time to sign some autographs here and take some pictures. One more look at that fourth round heat. And keep an eye on Pat Vellner, who had a really fast pace here on the overhead squat, but the no reps cost him. Yep. And that's where you get it, folks. Accuracy is key. We talked about that right out of the gate. You've got to stand the reps up all the way. It's not just about the squat depth. But then Medeiros has such a quick transition to get the bag up, but Fernandez is running with that thing each and every round. It's going to come down to Jorge Fernandez versus Justin Medeiros in the winner-take-all final. 100 points on the line in the Duel 2, the sixth of 10 events here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. And so far, it's been a pretty fun show to watch here with the men. Justin Medeiros, again, for the second straight year in this dual format, moving on to the finals. Last year he was squaring off with Guy Mahieros. This year it's going to be Jorge Fernandez. Yeah, and I'll tell you, it, it doesn't matter what we see. Justin seizing the opportunity to maybe make up some points on Roman. But I know that his coach, Adam Niefer, is always echoing in his ear, you fight and you scrap for every point available. So it's not enough that he's just out there top two. He's not going to let off the gas. He's going to do whatever he can to seize the moment and get these 100 points that are available to him right now. Regardless of what happens here in that final heat, Jorge Fernandez has guaranteed himself his best finish of the competition. He'll take at least second in the event. His first finish inside the top 10. Came in an 18th place overall, looking to move up the standings. Heading into the seventh event later tonight, the Texas Log. Now, from what I know, Sean, Jorge is already committed to going team one more time, at least, out there with his crew from Invictus. They had a great showing at the CrossFit Games this last year. And if all those members are back, they've got to be a heavy favorite in my mind with the way they executed and everything else. Not that that's on his mind right now. But when I watch him take the floor, I'm like, hey, they're going to have a mean team coming back next year. The team division will be very interesting in 2023 for sure. Yeah, and I know there's a lot of folks that we probably don't even know about yet that are already making some alliances, and sending some text messages, and making some phone calls. Travel arrangements. You know it. Lodging, getting taken care of. The questions might be thrown out. Can you watch my kids for three weeks <laughs> while I'm away handling business? Darius and Jorge Fernandez are being given a chance to catch their breath before they're brought back out on the floor for the final time. And if Jorge Fernandez can just get to the bag around the same time as Medeiros, you got to like him in that portion of the event, but Madera seems to have the edge in the other two movements. Yeah, so far it's certainly what we've seen, so it's... And here's what I'll say. We've gotten to watch champions and the way they carry themselves. I've seen this from Tia where this could ultimately be a big bait by Justin, and I'm not saying that this is in the back of his mind or that he wouldn't have this a level of awareness, but has he reserved a few gears in his sandbag carry every round? just to make Jorge think he's got a chance to nip at his heels and maybe he'll be able to go full send here on this final round. There is Jorge Fernandez who was 22nd 
in the team division at the CrossFit Games last year. A former collegiate pitcher at San Diego State, and a pretty good one at that. Held opposing hitters to a 227 batting average with runners on base. And those hitters went just 11 for 56 in his senior year with two outs. So knew how to deliver when the pressure was on when he was on the mound. You got to really like the carryover. Anytime an athlete has experience on the field, on the court, in sports at a high level, and they get an opportunity to express it in a new, new endeavor, the similarities are sometimes not very obvious to some, but in an athlete's mind, it's all the same. Fernandez used to one-on-one -on -one matchups between a pitcher and a batter, and Justin Medeiros used to those matchups on the wrestling mat. We're in for a showdown here, folks. Winner take all, Fernandez versus Medeiros here in the duel two. Medeiros first up the rope, he'll be first to the barbell. Fernandez got hung up a little bit. Yeah, the descent matters, and there is a skill and a technique in the proper descent to allow yourself to not get hung up in that rope, and Justin showed us there. Fernandez making up a little ground here. Medeiros is gonna be the first man to the sandbag, but here comes Fernandez. Can he make up the ground? Justin it looks like Medeiros it's too much. is going to hold him off. And an event win for the defending rogue champion. Nice. 31.31 seconds for Justin Medeiros. For Justin Medeiros. Who picks up his second win of the competition and rebounds nicely from that 12th place finish earlier in the day. And maybe paying the price for that dive across the finish line. He might have made some, some tough contact with that sandbag, Sean, as he dove across the, the <laughs> That's line. That's a light way of putting it. He seems to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> what execution, though, there by the, by the champ. Seizing the moment doing exactly what he needed to do, when he needed to do it to earn himself another 100 points. As usual, scrapping and fighting for every point available. And I misspoke earlier, Medeiros wound up finishing third last year in the dual event. It was Sam Kwan who faced off with Guy Mahero, so my apologies to Sam Kwan, who tends to get overlooked all the time. Justin attacking that rope with the eye of the tiger. He is fast up the rope, but watch his descent. It's clean. He's got that fireman descent with a slight cross of his legs, regripping the bar just in time. And what a transition into the overhead squats, showing the judge exactly what he needs to see. Proper depth, full hip extension at the top. Bar stays aligned over the midfoot throughout all 10 reps, and that allows him to pin the bar and get to the bag just ahead of Jorge and finish with that suicide dive for the dub. Paid the price for the dive, but he does get the win, and Justin Medeiros is with Kiki Dixon. Justin, an incredible finish to this event. It looked like you were hungry for it. What were you willing to risk to get the W? Man, willing to risk it all. We've had two events back to back, super high risk. No room to really miss, and on uh, the last event, I had a big mistake, cost me big, and I knew this was another high execution event and I was able to go through no no reps, clean run, and uh, just wanted to roll the dice and go for it on that last one. It certainly panned out for you, taking the event win. Did you find that as you went through the rounds, you were getting more efficient, or was the fatigue starting to set in? No, definitely. I mean, there's not a high volume of work, so just kind of trying to dial it in each round and uh, trying to just make it to that next cut. You certainly made it. Congratulations on your event win. Perfect, thanks guys. Justin Medeiros, his second win of the competition, looks to be your overall leader. And full send across the finish line to bring home the victory. And he needed a moment. That could have been a lot worse for Justin Medeiros. It could have been a lot worse, Sean. Overall standings now through six of the 10 events. Justin Medeiros by 20 points over 
Pat Vellner, and he turns a 10-point deficit into a 60-point lead now over Roman Krennikov, who falls all the way to third place. Sam Quant stays in fourth. He's just 15 points back of Krennikov, tied with Jeffrey Adler, but Quant has the tie break. One event remains for the CrossFit athletes on the day. That's the Texas Oak. That will be later on this evening. We will take a quick break, but action will continue with the strongman competition coming up. The Yoke Carry Overhead Log Lift Medley is next at the 2022 Rogue Invitational.
Just two events remain in the strongman competition here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational from Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas, and it's a repeat from 2021, the Yoke Log Medley. Thanks for being with us, everybody, here on Saturday, the final day of competition for the strongmen. I'm Sean Woodland with Lauren Schlake. Keith Dixon is down on the competition floor. And with just two events remaining, things have gotten much tighter on the top of the leaderboard. Just five and a half points separate first from fourth. We are in for a battle over these last two events. There is no room for mistakes now. Any little mistake is going to cost someone. We've got a lot of athletes still capable of winning. It's going to be very exciting. Overall standings coming to this event as you look at the yoke that awaits these athletes. Alexei Novikov is still our overall leader. Trey Mitchell sits in second by two and a half points. Martins Lietzi started the day six points out of first. He's trying to repeat as Rogue Invitational champion. He now trails Alexei Novikov by four. The yoke log medley is something that we saw last year. They have to carry the yoke 50 feet, and then they try to amass as many repetitions as they possibly can on that 360 pound log. Yes, interesting elements with this event. We've got two different events. Athletes would normally wear different types of shoes for these events, different equipment. So it's really making sure you can combine the two together. Last year, we saw the likes of Luke Stoltman, one of the absolute best log pressers on the planet. By the time he was done with the yoke, he was drained and he wasn't as efficient as maybe he normally would be on something like the log. Every single one of these athletes is more than capable of pressing 360 pounds. The big question is how easily do they get through that that thousand pound yoke first? This event is presented by Beyond the Whiteboard. And since there are two very unique challenges here, what are the keys to success? I really think it's about getting through that first implement as effectively and as efficiently and quickly as possible. The more time you're under that thousand pounds, the more draining it is. And if we look at last year's winner was Mateusz Kieliszkowski in a time of 40.41 seconds. That is the target these guys will be looking to beat. I think athletes that are coming back for the second year in a row, the likes of Martins Lissis, Alexei Novikov, they have a big advantage having touched both of these bits of kit before. Kevin Ferris will be the first man up. And here we go. Look how huge that implement is. Kevin making steady strides. He's looking nice and tight in his upper back, just moving through the legs and the hips. A thousand pounds, and this is really, I mean, a thousand pounds is a huge weight. But this is put there to drain them before they get to the second implement, the log lift. 360 pounds now, three repetitions needed. Fastest time in this event, when Ferris going for his first rep, and he will get it. Gets it down on the first rep. Magnus for Magnuson, the head judge here. Looking on as Kevin Ferris now goes for rep number two. 360 pounds. Come on, Kevin, press. Not able to get that one. And when you get to this point in an event, and you're at that fatigue level, and you fail an event, uh, fail a rep, pardon me, it's tough to get back on and get a success. It really is. It's been so tough for Kevin. He's a fantastic strongman, but he's stepping up to this rogue invitation. It's a brutal competition. Every event, tough and heavy. And he's having to go out early every single time and set the pace for the next athletes. It's always easier to have something to chase, to see other athletes go first. He's giving it his all. Just not enough right now. Two minute time cap for Ferris. He might have time to make one more run at this thing. I don't think we're going to see him get this now. Like I said, 360 pounds fresh. All these athletes hit this type of weight, no problem at all. But after doing that thousand pound yoke and then trying to do reps on this, the legs start to feel like jelly, the core starts to weaken. And you can see there is no power left to get him.
Ferris is going to wind up with one successful rep at 360. Not a bad effort on the yoke for Kevin Ferris, but the log certainly giving him problems. It was a solid effort. I mean, the yoke is not his favorite event. He's, he's much better at frame carries, farmers walks. Those are the events he really likes, the yoke. He's moving steadily, but we're gonna see quicker athletes than this on this first implement. And we've got some very, very big log lifters to come. American log lift record holder, Bobby Thompson. He will be looking to score big points on this event. Mitch Hooper, one of the fastest men on the planet when it comes to the super yoke. If he can get through that yoke quickly and save energy for the log, he's going to be good. And like I said, the likes of Alexei Novikov, Martins Lissis, and of course, Trey Mitchell has been incredible. Every single event, even the events we think he's not going to do so well at, he's been putting the work in, he's looking great, and he's putting himself in a real position now to challenge for this title. And there is Maxime Boudreau, who'll be the next man up. Now, Maxime's an athlete that struggled on the yoke in the past. It's not been his favorite event. He's a very good log lifter. I've seen training videos of him looking very good, though. He's been putting in the work. Now, let's see if that training can transition into competition. We draw with 11 total points here. He's been disappointed with the performance so far. Spoke to him earlier. He, he's trained really hard for this competition. It just didn't start well, and then seem, th things seem to go wrong af one after the other. He needs to pick up some points now and show us what he's capable of. He started off with a 10th place finish in the Tower of Power. He was unable to complete a single rep on that 900-pound deadlift, but then rebounded a little bit in the next event. Uh, finished 6th place, but then another 10th place finish in the Husafel bag carry, and then a 7th earlier this morning on the Roga Coaster of Paul. And I think that's the one that really disappointed him. The, the Roga Coaster was an event he was looking forward to, felt he could do well on. Only getting seventh place in that event, it knocks your confidence. He needs to forget that now, focus on this event. Think about the training he's put in, he loves the log, just needs to get through this yoke as efficiently and as quickly as he can. It's interesting, look at his footwear, he's going for those wide, um, barefoot shoes. Feels they support his feet well for the event like the yoke, and he can still perform and drive hard into the ground with the, 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 the press that you kind of use to generate that leg power into the leg. Some athletes prefer Olympic type lifting shoes, but Olympic lifting shoes are really not the best choice when it comes to the yoke. So it's figuring out what feels best for both implements. The reps to beat is two, that's one successful yoke carry the entirety of the 50-foot track, and then one log lift from Kevin Ferris. To complete the event, you need three successful log lifts. Yeah! Here goes Maxime Boudreau. Maxime's goal has to be to finish this. That's got to be his goal. Look to complete the course, put the pressure on the guys to go. He needs to make sure that upper back is as stable as possible. Strong in the core. He's moving very well. This is looking good for Maxime. He's been putting a lot of work into this implement. It's notoriously been one of his weakest events. Unfortunately, he's gone down then, he was moving well. And one of the issues when you go down and you've got to relift that thousand pounds, that's more energy being used up and being drained before you get to the log. This is more comfortable now for him. The log is an event he likes. Let's see what energy is left. And he won motions that first rep. Viper's the first repetition. If he can do that again, he's going to be in a great position. Two reps down, he's got one to go, and he's not even at a minute yet. So Maxime Boudreau is going to complete the event. It. 47 seconds unofficially, 46.78 for Maxime Boudreau, and that is the result he has been waiting for. That's more like the Maxime we know. And that time would have been good enough for third place overall last year. Looking back at the results, 
This could be a really solid performance. As I said, Yoke has never been his favorite, but he looked solid. Made a slight mistake there where he went down. If he didn't go down, maybe he could have been challenging for the, the, the likes of the record right now, which exists with Kiliuszkowski at 40.41 seconds. Very good performance there from Maxime, and that's going to lift his spirits going into the final event later today. We've talked a lot about perspective here in this strongman events. This is what they need to do in order to move that yoke back. That's definitely the easier way of doing it. <laughs> Simple machines certainly come in handy. 1,000 pounds on that yoke, and these strongmen make these implements look so easy that you forget that Maxime Boudreau just pressed 360 pounds three times. We're going to take a quick look at Maxime's log here. This is so impressive. To viper this kind of weight, the Viper means they're one motioning the movement. It's not using any leg drive. It's all driving through from the hips and then into the shoulders and triceps. Look at this. Great balance on those first two reps. Needed to use a little bit of leg drive on that last one, but gets the down signal. That is a fantastic performance there from the Canadian Maxime Boudreaux. And you mentioned where that would have stacked up last year. Being third in the event, well, the man who did extremely well, one of the men who did extremely well in this event, Mateusz Kaluszkowski, is not here this He's week. not even here, so, yeah, that was a fantastic effort there. So that could easily be Maxime Boudreaux's best event finish of this competition, but we still have eight men to go. 46.78 seconds, a very solid time here. In event number five. Aethor Melstead is next up. Melstead coming in in eighth place overall. His best finish so far in the competition was in event number two. Finished in fifth place overall in the Sear Bell lap. He's a very solid performer. Doesn't necessarily do incredibly well at, at events, but he's very solid, good all-round strongman. If he can improve in a few little areas, he can then start to really challenge in some of these big competitions. Right now, against the likes of Lysis, against the likes of Novikov, he's not quite good enough to really beat them on certain events, but always solid. I'm, I'm, I'm expecting him to push for, he'll, he'll be aiming to finish this. Decent log lifter. Decent on the yoke, just needs to put it all together. Elstead getting set to make his attempt at this event. Reset just takes a little bit of time because they need to adjust the height of the yoke for each individual athlete. You need to make it fair so the pickup point is the same. Otherwise, if you had a giant competing and then it's one of the shorter guys, you could end up having to squat that weight up if it was just set for the, the same height all the time. This is a repeat event from last year, and this is the same log that was used in 2021. 12 inches in diameter, 360 pounds. And all of this road kit just looks incredible. It's what Strongman needs, these big, impressive-looking implements. The Roger Coaster we saw earlier, just absolutely fantastic. But the yoke here, incredible, beautiful-looking log. Originally, Strongman, they were just lifting logs that kind of been pulled out of a field somewhere, out of a forest, twigs coming off them everywhere. <laughs> the balance wasn't great. Now these implements are perfectly made and engineered. There is the yoke that weighs 1,000 pounds. It's 76 inches wide, 108 inches tall. And we see one strongman move it 50 feet, and then we got two guys coming out with a tractor, and they got to move it back. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever been under 1,000 pounds? No. It's not a fun position to be in. Here we go. Icelander, eighth or master. Melstead is set. Maxime Boudreau has the time to beat, getting through the entirety of this event in 46.78 seconds. That really was an impressive run here by Maxine. Let's see what Aethor can do. 
bit slower to get himself going. Steady strides. Some quite long strides. I would focus more on a shorter, faster movement. But he's staying steady. Needs to make sure he doesn't go down. He's about halfway through the 25-foot mark. He takes a quick break. This kind of way. He's keeping the implement still, which is good. Just needs to get through. Doesn't want to have to go down again. There we go. Now he'll be on to a much more familiar and comfortable event with him. 30 seconds it took him to get through that yoke carry. Now his first attempt at the 360-pound lock. What technique will they use? Squats down on the clean. He's going to drive those hips through, roll the log up the chest. Looks good there. And a strong press for rep number one. He's going for the slow and steady approach. Already, Boudreaux's time has come and gone. He needs to attack this. He's got time, but there's some fantastic athletes to go. I'd be trying to get this done. Two minutes, even though it's a long period of time for a strongman event, it's not really enough time to recover. So he needs to get through this. A good clean again, he needs to use those legs. Well, they keep it in the rack position, but Melset looks like he's out of gas. Yeah, it doesn't look like a strength issue there. It looks like he's kind of breathing hard and struggling to get air in. Looks like he loosened his belt a little bit too, just to have him get some more oxygen in. They've got such big muscle, they burn through that oxygen really, really fast. And like, like I said, I mean, that first rep on the log, you watch that and you think he's got plenty left, but it's that fitness endurance that the athletes need as well, and that's where they like to know the likes of Novikov, the likes of Lissis. They're real all-round athletes. They're not just powerhouses. Technically efficient, fit, and powerful. There we go. And nice recovery by Melstead to get his second rep. The power is there with this man. Just needs to put it all together. Combining these events is very draining. You see that rep, it was comfortable again. The strength is there. Just needs to work maybe on that endurance combining these, but a solid performance there from Athel. Still got time. I thought the time limit was two minutes, but it must be 2.30. He's going to call it. It is two minutes and 30 seconds on the cap. Melstead now with the second best score that we have seen, getting two successful reps. Boudreaux is the only man to complete the entirety of the event. And we still have seven men to go here. Now our next man is Rob Kearney. He's got experience on this. Last year he competed in this show. Last year Rob was coming back from some personal issues, some injuries. Um, but on paper, these are two separately very good events for him. He's the former American record holder in the log lift. And he's one of the fastest men when it comes to the super yoke. If he's in shape, he could put in a very solid performance here. Rob Kearney, seventh place overall. His best finish was in the Sear Bell ladder as well when he took fourth. But he is six and a half points out of a place inside the top five. So Kearney, if he can do some work over these next two events, could have a really solid finish here at the Rogue Invitational. And he'll be looking forward to this event much more so than the Rogue Coaster earlier. This is really down Rob Street, log lifting and super yoke. Like I said, individually, they've been fantastic events for him in the past. Unfortunately, he tore his tricep and, and that kind of knocked his pressing back a bit, but he's recovered well. We saw on the dumbbell how good that was. Let's see if a year later, the recovery's gone really well. I'm expecting him to get all three on this log this year. Talking to Rob earlier in the week, and he definitely highlighted this as one of the events he was looking forward to, given his prowess with the, the log press and his experience in this event last year. Let's go back and take one more look at Hathor Melstead's performance. The Melstead really took the, the slow and steady approach. It took him a while to get under the yoke and get going. It took about seven seconds of time before he was actually starting. The athletes can get through this implement quickly without any mistakes. That is the key. I know I've said it already. But the more energy they have by the time they get to that log, the easier it's going to feel. You could see once he was onto the log, technically very efficient, good power. He was just feeling that exhaustion already from the yoke.
great power on this clean. He's nicely in a rack position there. And look how easy that rep goes up. From up here watching that, you'd think, just get on with it. It looked easy. But I know from experience, when that weight's crushing down on your chest, it's a horrible, horrible feeling. And Mel said would miss an attempt, but then recovered nicely and was able to get a second successful lift. And that is all just that, that weight is crushing down in your chest. You can't get that air in. You start to panic. It's a horrible feeling. And Mel said we'll be able to get that second successful lift as Rob Kearney is set. Here's the whistle. Rob's moving well with this yoke. This looks quick. I'd say this is the fastest we've seen out of any of the athletes so far on this first implement. Already halfway there, and he's just about done. Ten feet to go, and Kearney under in 20 fell seconds. swoop. Under 20 seconds on the first implement. Now he's walking slowly, composing himself. Let's see what kind of shape Rob's log pressing is right now. How is that tricep affecting him? How's his recovery gone? Gets the first rep. Looks like Maxime Boudreau is going to hang on to the lead in this event. Rob Kearney trying to become the second man to finish all three lifts on the log inside the two and a half minute time cap. There is number two. It's a, now last year, Rob only managed two reps on the log. Can he finish this one this year? That's obviously been his goal coming in. Do better than you did last year. He's got plenty of time left for this final rep. Third attempt for Kearney. Good clean, needs to stabilize. And he will get it. So there Rob Kearney, better than last year. Much, much better performance from Rob. 120.58 seconds, the second man to finish. All the reps inside that two and a half minute time cap. Maxime Boudreau still our leader at 46.78 seconds. But Rob Kearney has got to be happy with that effort. Yeah, I, I think he will be. You know, coming back from injury is always nerve-wracking. You get, you can do the, all the training you like, but when you get on in the competition and you're in those events where you, this is the, the log is the event that he tore his tricep on, and in the back of your mind, it kind of sticks with you. So there's always that little bit of doubt, but he'll be happy to get that out of the way. Good, solid performance, finish the event, really get a great run with the yoke. Always good with the fans as well. Started off with the fastest carry that we have seen so far on the yoke. Look how quickly he moves with his thousand pounds. Very solid, great technique, upper body, completely stable, nice quick legs. And then he goes three for three on the log press. I think it's clear to see he had a game plan as well. He wasn't put off by how quick Maxime went. He just focused on doing what he needed to do. It's easy to watch other guys go and think, damn, that was fast. I need to go, you know, really hit it hard. And then you can often make mistakes. So stuck to his game plan. I think Rob will be pleased. Running his own race. And it was a smart decision as Rob Kearney gets through all three log presses and now sits in second place right now in the event with six men left. He's actually changed his technique on the log as well. He used to jerk the log, whereas now he uses more of a traditional push press. And I spoke to him about that. He just doesn't have the confidence in the tricep anymore to jerk. The yoke is getting reset for Bobby Thompson. And Bobby is a monstrous log presser. But we saw last year, it's not just about the, the, the log. He needs to get through this first implement. And he's very solid on yoke as well. There is a potential for Bobby to get some big, big points on this one. Sixth place after four events. Best finish was in the opening event. The Tower of Power when he took fifth place. Going to be a lot of log lifting going on here as 
Bobby gets set up after this event, the CrossFit competition continues, those athletes are going to be taking on a, a log press. So I hope some of them are paying attention here. I'm sure some of them have been talking to the strongmen backstage, just trying to pick up some tips. I'm actually really looking forward to seeing that event. These CrossFit athletes, unbelievable, but when it comes to power, there is no better than the strong. I don't think you're going to see 360 pounds go up. Um, if we do, we'll be very yeah, impressed. Absolutely. Especially after all the other events they've done as well. Bobby Thompson getting set, and he will be the fifth man to take on this event. Bobby, one of the seven men who are making their first appearances here at the Rogue Invitational. Bobby's PB is up near 485 pounds. So, in theory, 360 shouldn't feel that hard for him. But, like I said already, this yoke implement just there to annoy them a little bit before they get to the log. He is the American record holder in the log lift at 478 pounds. If he can get through this yoke carry in about 30 seconds, look out. Yeah, he's got the capability of one motioning the log. It just all comes down to how he feels once he gets there. Do the legs, does the core feel tired after doing this thousand pounds first? He's up fast, didn't mess around with it. He got in quickly, he's moving well, good strides. Another athlete taking long strides, but he's got that core strength to cope with that. Very stable, upper body's nice and rock solid. The implement isn't moving around. That's a great run there. Very fast, under 20 seconds. Wow. I think we could see a good time. Bobby is a great log lifter. Let's see what he does with his first rep. Getting right to work. Strict that pressing that first no one. Problem. That is a powerhouse. And a quick reset for the American Nightmare. Got 10 seconds to track down Maxime Boudreau, so he's gonna have to hurry here. Good rep, he's gonna have to go though, he can't mess about. Boudreau is gonna hang on to the lead. But second place right now in this event, up for grabs. Third rep is good for Bobby Thompson. He's trick pressed every rep there, just showing that incredible shoulder and tricep power. Good enough for second place so far. 53.86 seconds for Thompson. As we are now halfway through the field here. Three strict presses at 360 pounds in about 25 seconds. <laughs> He's a powerhouse, there's no question about that. Now they will move the yoke back into position, and Mitch Hooper will be the next man out. And still, Maxime is our leader so far on this event. All three logs in 46, 78 seconds. Maxime needs that confidence boost as well. He'll be feeling good about this. This next man coming up, Mitchell Hooper, extremely fast on the super yoke. For him, the log is more of the weakness on this one. So let's see how quickly and how much energy is saved by the time he gets to the log. He's a solid log lifter, but if we were talking log for Max, Bobby Thompson is so much stronger than, than the majority of these guys. It's being able to combine all the implements together. Now look at this, this was a solid run. Nice and steady, he was quick. Core looking tight, the implement not moving at all. Using that white line in the center to guide him. And that was a fast time for Bobby on the open. The only criticism I can say is he's just a little bit slow getting to the implement. Guys like Novikov, guys like Lissis, they're going to move quickly between implements and quickly between each rep. Each individual rep for Bobby was fantastic. He's just not moving quick enough between to challenge the really top guys, such as um, Maxine, who's in our first place so far. 
really impressive effort for Bobby Thompson on that log as we expected, but not able to track down Maxime Boudreau, but does sit in second place right now in this event. So we have our top five up next, and what a top five it's been so far. This contest just improving all the time. The athletes getting better every year. New faces, and this guy has been a revelation this year in Strongman. And Mitch Hooper was having some fun with some of the CrossFit fans earlier as the Strongman were warming up. He walked over to where the CrossFit athletes have been warming up, picked up one of the barbells and attempted to do an overhead squat. Got about maybe a quarter of the way there, dumped the barbell, set kind of a ta-da motion to the crowd. <laughs> they gave him a big ovation, but it was great to see that interaction. He's a real showman as well. He loves playing up to the crowd. Hooper does have an event win under his belt. He won the Husafel sandbag carry to close out Friday night. And that is what has helped him move himself into the top five. He'll, he'll expect a lot of himself on this event. I know if you're talking to him, he wants to be top three minimum yes, on this one. On Potentially the, on the take the win. Yes, sir. And you take the front end over the line. And then you sprint. Best of luck. Thanks, sir. So far in his international career, he's not been beaten on the Super Yoke. So if it was just that event, you'd be almost like putting all your money on him to take the win here. But as we've seen already, it's combining the two. If it was just a log lift for Max, I would expect Bobby Thompson to win this event. It's who can, can combine all these together. And that is a, an interesting element about this one. Maxime Boudreau still the time to beat at 46.78 seconds. He's it's interesting. He's going to talk to the referee there. I don't know if he's trying to bribe him. I was going to say, is there some money that changed hands there? <laughs> Here comes Mitch Hooper. He will be the sixth athlete out here. 46.78. Still the time to beat by our current leader, Maxime Boudreau. Maxine Boudreau talking things over with Rob Kearney. Cooper is about ready to go here. Ten seconds to go. Now watch out for how quick he's going to be on this super yoke. Look at the speed he gets to him so quickly. Fast, short steps. Look at the foot pace. Unbelievable on this event. Now, how does he do transitioning to the log? 10 seconds on the carry, and right to work is Mitch Hooper with his first attempt, and that Great is no problem. Rep. Doesn't even let go, and he's got two in the bag. And he's got time to get the win here. 28, 29 seconds. If he gets this, he'll go into the lead. And wow. Mitch Hooper smashes that event, 32.39 seconds. That is eight seconds faster than Kilius Koski from last year. Unbelievable performance there from Mitch Hooper. Ten seconds, sub ten seconds on the first implement. And three solid reps on the log. He is going to be extremely happy with that. I think that's going to be a very, very hard time to beat. Mitch Hooper is trying to work his way onto the podium here, and that is going to help. He trails Pablo Nakanechi for fourth place by four and a half points. Nakanechi is going to be up next, and the pressure's on now. Pablo's been exceptional in this show so far. The deadlift he put in on day one, unbelievable. His performance on the arm over arm, first thing today. The sheer power of this man is crazy. He's got all the power in the world to do well at this event. I want to see how he can kind of combine the two events. Does he let any mistakes slip in? Sometimes he's been known to kind of... He's so new to the sport and so powerful, but he still has a few things to learn, which is quite scary for the opposition because give this guy another year, and I think he's going to be incredible. Let's take another look at Mitch Hooper's effort. We knew he would do well on the yoke, and he sprinted across the track. 
I was hoping for big things for Mitch on this one. We've um, we've been working hard on this event, but you never want to jinx things. <laughs> and you know his log is very solid, but there are better log lifters in the event. I just knew that he could get through that yoke so quickly, he'd put himself in a good position. And the difference there between him and Bobby is he just didn't waste any time. He held on to the handles, was fast between each rep, and he was saving time there. You rarely see someone with that many log lifts not even let go of it at the bottom. That was an unbelievable performance there. Mitch Hooper hoping to bring home his second event win of the competition. And that time of 32.39 seconds is going to be really hard to beat. But we still have the top four men in the standings to go. And Pablo Nakanechny is going to be the next man to step up. And I'm wondering if he's even going to be able to fit into that yoke as wide as he is. <laughs> he might be able to jam those shoulders in. I'm going to grease up the sides to make sure he has a enough of an opportunity to get that thing onto his shoulders. He is like a Terminator, isn't he? If there's any movie producers out there looking for a villain. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting looking at the leaderboard. I mean, with Alexi, Trey Mitchell, and Martins Lissis, they've stretched away a little bit from everyone else, but Pavlo's not far behind. And a big performance here could really shake things up. Only a point and a half back of Martins Lietzis for third. Just three back of Trey Mitchell for second. And Such a big man. He's exceptionally fast. I've seen him move sandbags, farmers walks. He's quick. He does have an event win in the Tower of Power. He got 12 reps yesterday to open up the competition. Pounds. But then he followed that up with a ninth, and that's really the only blemish he's had because the other two finishes third and second. Yeah, he, he's just that one weakness so far. And I think, you know, another year of training, it might not be such a weakness. And that second place in the Roga Coaster pull, you and Brian were talking about it earlier as we are going through that event. If he cleans up his technique there a little bit, that could have been a win. I agree. You know, Brian and myself are watching that thinking, how fast could this guy have gone if he's had some decent training and technique with it? Because it was just raw power. He was missing the rope with almost every pull. You know, those little blemishes in technique, they just kind of add up little seconds at a time. And he could have taken four, five, six, seven seconds off his time just by improving technique. Pablo Nakanechi getting set as Mitch Hooper will see if his time will survive. 32.39. Pardon me, six, nine seconds. That really is a fast time on this event. Got through that yoke carry in about 10 seconds and then just ripped through those three reps at 360. And I will say, the quicker you can get through this yoke, it makes a big, big difference. If you are under that thousand pounds for a long period of time, it drains you very, very quickly. You could be the best log lifter in the world, but if you get to that thing, you've been under there for 40 or 50 seconds, your energy levels are gonna be zapped. Here goes Pablo Nakanechny. It's taking longer to get going. And this is not a good start for Pablo. Very, very short steps. He's moving better now. Going to his rhythm. More than halfway done. And Ten feet away. One of them, a little mistake at the start. He's solid through there. But it's taken almost 30 seconds for him to get his hands on the log. Mitch Hooper was finished at this point. <laughs> that is unbelievable. Nakanechi now is the first attempt at 360. That and does not go. He'll get right back to work. He needs to compose himself, focus on the clean. He's got very, very long arms. Real advantageous when it comes to the deadlift. Not so good on a press, but a good rep given to him there. He needs to make use of those strong legs. One rep so far, and we're approaching 60 seconds. 
If he can beat Rob Kearney's time, he can slide into fourth place right now in the event. He really needs to. This is not what he wanted. And that's not going to go. So he's already missed two attempts. And this could be his worst finish to break. Still has more than a minute to go before we hit the two and a half minute time cap. So now for him, it's just about finishing the event, do some damage control here. Yeah, he really needs to try and get these two reps. And it's very difficult to recover in this time frame. And he knows it. And he's going to call it. So he will wind up with just one successful lift. And he took the time to the exact position, but that is not what Pavlo wanted. So he has the potential to finish ninth or tenth right now. And that's going to be good news for Mitch Hooper, who was five points behind. Four and a half. Hey, Hooper, four and a half points coming into this event, so Mitch Hooper could find himself in fourth place overall. As Martins Lietzis will be the next man out. And this is a big event for Martins Lietzis as he was able to shave two points off that six point deficit that he had to Alexei Novikov in the last event. And now trails by four. Lietzis trying to repeat as Rogue Invitational Champion as the equipment crew getting that yoke back to the starting line. So one thing we can guarantee with Martins is he's going to finish. It comes down to speed. How quickly can he do this? I don't think he's even going to worry too much about Mitch Hooper. Mitch Hooper's a fair few points behind. Martins is focusing on Trey and Alexi, doing a solid time and putting the pressure on them. Pablo Nekonechny ran into some problems early on the yoke, got himself sorted, was able to get through it. He took a long time to get going with the yoke and then went down very, very quickly. So straight away, he has to relift that thousand pounds up. It was not his favorite event by the looks of things. Needs a bit more work. He's keeping his knees bent all the time, which keeps a lot of strain on the quads. Ideally, you want to try and move from the hips rather than the knees on this event. Hips, they're much bigger, stronger joint. And then he misses his first attempt. And was able to then get himself collected and, and get the one good rep that he's going to get credit for. Yeah, this was a good rep here. Good use of the legs. Gets his head through. Nice, solid rep. But he was just done at this point. The energy had just been used up. Those big, huge muscles just unable to recover in that time frame. Final attempt, just as you could tell, and as you said, just he was out of, out of gas at that point. So we're into the business end now with our top three athletes to come Martins Lisis, Trey Mitchell, and currently leading Alexei Novikov. These three, this is going to be vital. I really feel after last year, Martins Lisis was just, just kept creeping and creeping closer, and he's sort of doing a similar thing this year. Novikov, if he wants a chance of winning this title, needs to go into the stones a few places ahead of Martins because I think Martins is the heavy favorite when it comes to the stones later. And Martins knows that, so he's going to focus on a big performance here. If he can put that pressure on Novikov, he's going to be feeling it. And Martins will be confident going into those stones. And that stone over hitching post event was the only event that Martins leads. He's won last year at the Rogue Invitational and route to his first championship here. Now, Leetzis is getting set. We were talking about this earlier, but as impressive as Alexei Novikov has been in his career, he has never beaten Not once so Leetzis. far. He's not managed to beat Leetzis in any competition. He's been extremely close a few times now. Even more, a world's strongest man this year, they were joint on points. But Martin's got the, the count back, or the, the winner of the last event rule. So he took the win ahead of him. Novikov would love to beat Martins, but Martins is an exceptional strong man. Really has no weaknesses. Let's see what kind of time he was second on this event last year behind our former record holder, Kilius Koski. Like you said, he probably doesn't want to worry about chasing Hooper right here. Just run his race, and that should be good enough to put the pressure on the two men ahead of him. Absolutely. He's raring to go. Waiting for that beep. 
just looks like a caged animal, ready to be unleashed. Leach is right to work He's on up the fast. Yard. Big long strides. Not so efficient on this event. He's had some knee issues, that's why he's got the knee wraps on there, just to try and keep those knees supported. But this isn't a great run by Lises. He's not gone down, which is good. He needs to get over that line. There we go. Martins is there, and now he will hustle to the log. So this will be more familiar for him. Mitch Hooper is going to stay in first. First rep down for Lises. Good rep there on the first rep. He's been slow till this point, but he looked powerful on that rep. Gonna have to go some if he wants to beat Boudreau. I don't think he's going to beat Boudreau. Oh, and that was that was a soft lockout if I'm honest once again. Final rep, and now he's looking at fourth place in the event. So Leeds is having some trouble here. This is slower than his performance last year on this event, so clearly not in the same shape. Maybe some of those injuries catching up with him. And now he's looking exhausted. I've got to say he looks bigger than I've ever seen him. Come on, Martins, compose yourself. You need this rep. And I'll tell you what, Alexei Novikov is going to be this is big quietly for Alexei pleased Novikov. about this. Martins like... struggling big time. I think maybe the knee wraps could have been a big mistake. I was never a fan of having knee wraps on for an event like the yoke because the blood just mm -hmm. sinks into the quads. To have it on for that amount of time where you're going through the yoke, then into the log, Maybe just can't feel those legs. They've built, they've blown up with blood. Romark getting them off him as quick as possible, but that could be disastrous for the defending champion. Only two successful lifts on the log for Martins Leeds. And Alexei Novikov has the door wide open right now if he can take advantage. That is a big, a big shot. And Trey Mitchell now will be thinking, I've got a chance of this, and Alexei Novikov will be too. Trey Mitchell will be the next man out. He is in second place overall, just two and a half points back of Alexei Novikov. Just didn't look like the strongest performance from the start for Martins Leeds. No, very wide stance, struggling. I know he's had injuries. I will kind of say that he's had injuries and maybe just not fully recovered. The knee wraps, from my point of view, I think that was a mistake. However, he probably felt he needed that support around the knees, but clearly that's caught up with him in terms of the legs blowing up. And I do think he's bigger than we've ever seen. I'm not sure what his body weight is, but he looks physically bigger. Maybe that fitness and conditioning, not quite what it used to be. That first rep was powerful. After he got that one and went right to work on the second, I really thought he had a chance to, to I, finish I here. Agree. I agree. The wheels just came off. I was expecting another easy rep, but then it didn't happen, and it was, it was almost a soft rep. He got that second one, and then he looked like he was struggling to stay on his feet. Martins leads these two successful lifts on that 360-pound log. Mitch Hooper is creeping closer to his second event win of the competition, but Trey Mitchell and Alexei Novikov, the top two in the overall standings, have yet to go, and Mitchell, a bit of a home field advantage. He's from about four and a half hours away from here in Lumberton, Texas. Trey has been super impressive this week. Recently won the Shore Invitational. He won it last year as well, but since this year, he just seems to have grown in confidence. He believes he belongs at the top now. And if you covered up the names on the leaderboard and I looked at his finish, I would assume that's Martins Leeds. Second, second, fourth, and fourth. And what, what really impressed me was the fourth places in the sandbag carry and the arm over arm, the Roger Coaster, because they were notoriously weak events for him. He's clearly gone away, put the work in, training hard, smart training, dedication. He's not someone that focuses on social media. He's not a big personality. He's someone out there putting in the work, improving from competition to competition, and he deserves to be in this place. He's performed exceptionally well. Thirty-two point six nine seconds is still the top time for Mitch Hooper. There I really Mitch. don't think anyone's going to be touching that time, but the big question is these two battling now for places one and two. Trey Mitchell and Alexi can really stretch away from Martins Lissis after this one. 
Pavlo Nekonechny having a poor performance. Martins Liss is having a poor performance. They are going to put themselves almost in an unassailable position as long as they can complete this event. And I'll tell you what, Trey is a good log lifter. So if he gets through this yoke nice and quickly, he could have some big points once again. We saw Trey in Columbus at the Arnold Classic. He took seventh there. And that was a shock. I really expected more from him at the Arnolds. But once again, he was an athlete that was going into that competition with an injury. Since then, all his results have been exceptional. And like I said, coming off a big win at the Shore Invitational recently, the confidence is sky high. He believes he is one of the elite in the world right now. And he's training hard for these competitions. Trey Mitchell. Trying to close the gap between himself and overall leader Alexei Novikov. Before this competition, I really thought Trey could be fourth, battling just off the podium. He's impressed me so much, and now he is within a chance of winning. He needs to get through this yoke as effectively as possible. He's slow but steady. Make sure you don't go down, Trey. Get to that log as fresh as possible. There we go, 20 seconds for the yoke. Mitchell right to work on his first attempt. Pose. Oh, easy press. There's the down signal. Here's rep number two. Good Good press again. Count. Now, what can he do this third one? It needs to be quick. I don't think he's quite going to beat Boudreaux. Has a chance at Bobby Thompson, though, right now. Needs to be quick. And he will get it. Gets it. Big performance from Trey Mitchell. Oh, perhaps he oh, wasn't he did given not one get of those credit reps. for the second rep, so that's... He needs to put this one away now. Make sure he beats Kearney. Now he can get fourth place in the event. The second rep did not count. There we go. And That's that it. One will. 108.05 seconds for Trey Mitchell, who finishes the event now, sits in fourth place. Uh, I just hate myself for it. So 108.05 is the mark that Alexei Novikov needs to be thinking about right now to not surrender any points to Mitchell. Alexei is in very, very nice position to be in. He's done this event before. He knows he can complete it. Made a mistake last year. So he needs, he needs to use that experience, not make the same mistakes. If he can come second on this event, he's going to put himself in a beautiful position going into the stones. The, the, the whole result from this event has really changed the dynamics of the yeah, overall the right now. And Alexi has all the advantage to take that last event and be in a really, really good position. Not super fast on the yoke, but very efficient, not putting it down on that whole 50-foot tread. Tread. Yeah, he was solid, around about 20 seconds for the yoke. Not the most stable run, but he, he got it done. But I believe it was either the first or second rep that wasn't given to him by the referee. Let's have a quick look at this now. Keep an eye on Magnus from Magnuson in the upper right-hand part of your screen if he doesn't leave the view here. So that first rep, it kind of comes down quickly. I'm not sure if it was that one or the second one. That Must looked like a better first. rep. I think it was that first one that wasn't given. So essentially having to press the log four times. but he could match it. And that was the rep that did it for Trey Mitchell, who now sits in fourth place in the event. Good for seven points right now. Alexei Novikov, the overall leader, will be the final man to go. And this is a golden opportunity for him right now. Yeah, well, the advantage of going last as well is huge. He knows he doesn't have to try and beat the likes of Mitch Hooper. His biggest rivals have not performed maybe as well as he would expect on this one. He just needs to go and put a solid run in, and he knows he will go into the stones in a very, very strong position. I think Alexi's going to be looking at the likes of Maxime Boudreaux. He'll be trying to get around that 46 seconds. 
minutes, Alexi. Two minutes. Two minutes. He, he does that. He's going to put some good distance between himself and both Trey Mitchell and Martins Lietzis. Absolutely. And depending on how this shakes out, I mean, Mitch Hooper was only six points back of Lietzis for third. Mitch is going to fly up the table on this one. He'll overtake Pavlo. He may well overtake Lietzis as well. We'll get into that in a second. We still need to focus on Novikov. It's all very well talking about it. He still has to perform. Alexei Novikov has yet to finish lower than third. An incredible athlete. Still the second youngest athlete in this lineup. He's won Europe's strongest man. He's won world's strongest man. He was second at the Arnold's. Third place at last year's Rogue Invitational. He would love to add the Rogue Invitational to his list of achievements. So many people love watching Novikov because he's more normal size. There's still, I know he's still a huge human being compared to an average man, but he's not one of the giants. So much power in a smaller package, but athletic, smart, powerful. He really is an incredible athlete. And he thinks about everything as well. He's, just, he's really not just a brute. Really thinks about everything. He will be strategizing, thinking about how many points he needs. Now he needs to perform. Novikov waiting for the buzzer here. Ten seconds. Ten seconds. Getting the crowd behind him. Novikov is a blisteringly fast after as well. He's normally very quick on events like the Yoke. Here goes Alexei Novikov, trying to put himself in position to bring home the Rogue Here Invitational he goes. He's Championship. moving well. Very, very fast. Oh, he's gone down. That's surprising. Ten feet to go. And Novikov is through. So, what can he do on the log? I'm surprised he went down there, you know, knowing that he didn't have that pressure to go blisteringly quickly. To go on this log. First attempt is good. The second right. attempt is good. So Maxime Boudreau is going to lock up second place right now, and Thompson looking like he's going to stay in Thompson third. Holds third, so he needs to try. This has got to count. Trey Mitchell. And Novikov will do it, and he, he will pick it. up a point, at least, on Trey Mitchell. So, what an interesting result that is. It's really changed the dynamic of the overall. We'll bring you the overall scores in a second. But Mitch Hooper, unbelievable there. Winning this event in a time of 32.39 seconds. Unbelievable time. Got through the yoke in... 10 seconds did Mitch Hooper and then just gripped it and ripped it when it came to the log press. He's going to be an extremely happy man. And that's his second event win of the competition. And his second in three events. So finishing the competition strong. Didn't have the start he wanted. Was disappointed on the deadlift, disappointed on the sear dumbbell. But since then, the results have got better. Winning the sandbag carry. Solid performance on the Roger Coaster, and then another win here on the Yoke into Log Medley. Here are your results for the Yoke Carry Log Lift Medley. Mitch Hooper and Maxime Boudreau finish first and second as the Canadians dominate. Bobby Thompson winds up in third place. Alexei Novikov is going to pick up a point on Trey Mitchell. And Martins Lietzis finishes in seventh place. That's going to be his worst finish of this competition. How often do we see that? Martins Lisi's in seventh place. Let's send it down to Kiki Dixon, who is with your event winner. Mitch, three years ago, you were running a marathon. Today, you just put on an incredible display of strongman ability. How do you go from there to here? You just work hard. A little bit more every day and uh, yeah, you just get stuck into it, and that's sort of the interest of the sport. It's not about 
for most people, it's not about if you can do more than someone else. It's it's just about what you can do yourself, and that's how I started, and that's pretty much how I still am, and that has me close to the top of the world. You were very confident coming into this event. What about this combo gave you that confidence? Last year, they did the same event, so we had a pretty reasonable idea of what people were capable of. Uh, last year, 42 seconds won the event. I did it 35 seconds in training. I thought that would probably win as well. Um, and, you know, yoke for me is, it just comes second nature. Uh, and then that log weight is pretty comfortable for me for three. So you put these two together and I'd back myself against pretty much anyone. Well, congratulations, you were spot on. Thank you. That is a smart bet. Here are your unofficial standings now heading into the final event. Alexei Novikov with 41 and a half points. He's three and a half up on Trey Mitchell. Martins Litsis sits in third in a tie with Hooper. That is huge for Hooper. He's gained a lot of points there, but more importantly, Martins has dropped back from Mitchell and Novikov. At least he's trying to repeat his champion, and it's going to take a, not a miracle, but he's going to have to win that next event I and then get a lot of help in the process yeah, to make Ma up that seven-point deficit. Martins is going to have to just focus on trying to put in a big performance and securing third place, and then hoping that Trey and Alexi make a mistake. But my money would be on Trey and Alexi battling it out for the title now. Trey is a very, very good stone lifter. He's not out of this yet, and Alexi's not his favorite event. He's a very solid performer when it comes to stones, but he's not a guarantee. So it's not over yet. We're going to have an exciting finish, but he will have that advantage of being able to go last, seeing what everyone else is doing, just knowing that he's got to stay within touching distance of Trey Mitchell. We are far from done here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational on this very busy Saturday. Mitch Hooper's second event win of the competition. One event left for the Strongmen. We will crown a champion later this evening. We still have an event left for the CrossFit athletes. They'll get their go at the log. The Rogue Iron Game. Pat Sherwood, Jamie Hagia, and Dr. Bill Crawford coming up next.
the Duel 2 brought on an elimination-style event where no mistakes could be made. But we still have two more events left for the day here at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. Stick around because the Rogue Iron Game is coming up next. Welcome to the 2022 Rogue Invitational here at Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. I'm Jamie Hagia, joined here by Pat Sherwood. And Pat, we just watched the strongman take on event five. And they made, these men walked across that, that field with a thousand pound yoke and made it look like an empty barbell. Thoughts on that? It's, it's mind boggling. I love watching the strongman just for that reason. You have a thousand pounds and then that log that they picked up, 360 pounds for three reps. Here, here's when you know something interesting is happening. A CrossFit event goes down, a couple people roll a barbell away. To get the strongman stuff, they bring in like a forklift, a cart, something like that. These people are insane. <laughs> That's correct. And we did actually see earlier in the day, our CrossFit individuals took on event five themselves called the Turtle. And did it pan out to the name? It was at the Turtle pace or was, how did it? No, out? not at all. Yeah, turtles are slow, but this was a short and sharp, fast workout. It was going to potentially move the leaderboard, shake things up, and that's exactly what it did. Gave us something to talk about, which was fantastic. When it was all over, Laura Horvath was the women's winner. By the way, that was her third first place in a row here at the Rogue Invitational. And Sam Quant was the top dog for the men. He did fantastic, and he got back on our radar because of the turtle. After event five, our CrossFit individuals took on event six, the Duel 2, which was an elimination style event with no mistakes, lots of pressure. How did the athletes do out there? They did great, and I loved the Duel for exactly what you just said. Mistakes were incredibly costly. Now we're talking about a short event that was sub one minute, sub 45 seconds. And if you missed one rep of that overhead squat, you basically had no chance in that heat. Laura Horvath, by the way, won that one also. That was her fourth consecutive first place finish at this year's Invitational. And Justin Medeiros gave us something to talk about again. He was first place for the men. Fantastic. It was definitely a race, diving across that finish diving line. Diving with that, like but a 200 here, pound sandbag, who does that? Here is a look at our overall leaderboard for our women. After six events, There it is Laura Horvath in that top spot with 495. You had mentioned this is her fourth consecutive win. Annie Thor's daughter is sitting in that second place spot, followed by Gabby Magala with 430 points. Daniel Brown Brandon is only five points behind her and Ellie Turner in that fifth place spot. But Laura Horvath, I mean, is there any chance anyone can catch her in the, in the rest of this competition? I'll tell you what, I mean, we had a bit of a race several events ago, but when Laura Horvath gets four first place finishes in a row, that amount of points is staggering. So now, even with four events remaining, yes, she has a 60 point cushion between herself and Annie Thor's daughter. Last year, Horvath was fourth place at the Invitational, but she is setting herself up very well to win this one, unless Tia climbs out of the stands or something else happens. Another woman, Danielle Brandon, has had an exceptional day. She has moved up from sixth place to fourth place. How, how's Danielle doing today? That was a fantastic event for her. I mean, now she is back in the game really close to Gabriela Magala, who's in third, by the way. But Danielle Brandon is only five little points behind third place. And she has that ability to just flip that switch, empty the tank, go crazy, but not in a reckless fashion. Her runs were flawless. Switching over to the men's side of competition, here's a look at our overall leaderboard for our men. It goes as follows. In first place is Justin Medeiros, but not far behind him is Patrick Vellner by only 20 points behind him. Roman Krenikov, who was in that top spot, has moved down to third, followed up by Sam Kwan and Jeffrey Adler tied for that fourth place spot with 400. 20 points, but it seems that the story is there is a race for first place between Justin Medeiros and Pat Vellner. 
I mean, both the men's and the women's leaderboard, there's so many fantastic stories there. But yes, we have a first place race. Okay, Justin's there. We've been talking about him. It's well documented that he's amazing. But so is Pat Vellner. And to be only 20 points, he's been clawing his way back. A lot of competition remaining. Don't forget, Vellner won the Invitational a couple years ago. This is his fourth time here, and he's always that guy we're talking about. Of, it's very good, he'll be in the mix, but we never say he's gonna have the gold around his neck. I don't think that sits well with him, and he is showing up. They're fighting for that, the first place spot, but there also is a close race between Roman Krennikov, Jeffrey Adler, and Sam Quant for that third place position. Thoughts on these men duking it the up The whole that. leaderboard is filled with amazing stories. This is fantastic, stressful for the athletes, fantastic for fans and analysts. Yes, we have Roman Krennikov, 435 points, Quant with 420, Adler with 420. So that's positions three, four, and five, only separated by 15 little points. All of those guys are hungry, they are battling, they are not here to make friends, and they are gonna be out for blood with the remaining of the evening. And I don't know which way it's gonna go, quite frankly, but they are all here for keeps. Speaking of those men duking it out, here's, let's take a look at event seven, which is going to be the Texas Oak. Very simple, it is a one rep max log lift. And I think it's pretty neat that we have strongman and CrossFit here. It's gonna be really cool to see these CrossFit athletes take a crack at that log. Thoughts on having our CrossFit athletes do a strongman type of workout? I mean, CrossFit athletes, this is what they have to be ready for. Literally anything is fair game. And so yes, we've seen some strongman implements make their way regularly into CrossFit. Sandbags are very common right now and I have yet to see the log in competition. This is also not something a lot of people just have to train with. So it's gonna be a unique test from just, can you show up and make it happen? As opposed to our traditional clean and jerk that we're used to seeing, what is gonna be the key on this log? Oh man, you know, it's, it's the clean and jerk, but not really. Okay, it's, it's ground to overhead, that's for sure, but this is gonna be more, certainly there's technique involved, but strength plus just raw grunt work, and then the adaptability of, I just don't think a lot of people have had a lot of exposure to the implement. Speaking of strength, we're gonna start out with the women's side. Who do you have as a favorite in this log lift? I, this is an easy choice from just numbers and statistics. We'll see if it pans out on the competition floor, but Danny Spiegel is profoundly strong, okay? Her listed clean and jerk is 270 pounds. That's tops for the women out there. But then also this year at the CrossFit Games, they had a sandbag ladder and she won that handily. So her brute strength is incredible. Switching over to the men's side of the field, we need someone with power and strength. Who is that on the men's side? I got somebody for you. I got Jeffrey Adler. I think this is gonna be a great event for him. He's also in that mix that I just talked about with fighting for that third spot between himself, Sam Quant, third place being currently occupied by Roman Krennikov. Adler wants in there. He has a 377 pound clean and jerk, the highest listed for the men out there, but his deadlift, his squat, all of his strength numbers are through the roof. So he's got the grunt work and the technique. It's Adler's. We're excited to see the men and women take on event seven. Let's take a look at what these, what we have left for the night for Saturday night. We have gone through a lot of work, but what is left is gonna be one CrossFit event, event seven, and then they also have one more strongman event where we will crown our 2022 Rogue Invitational Strongman Champion. Coming up before that, we will have one other show with Dr. Bill Crawford and our 2017 America's Strongest Man, Jerry Pritchard, will be joining us here. That's gonna do it for us now. We will send it out to, coming up next is Women's Event 7.
leading her by 60. The Texas Oak is the next event, and this will work a lot like the sandbag ladder that we saw at the CrossFit Games. But first, we're going to start with the tie break here, Adrian. Yeah, this is interesting, right? We're going to set the stage for any potential ties down the road through this event. We're actually going to race in the form of a farmer's carry, and this particular portion is for time. The tie break portion of this event is underway. And it was Matilda Garns who got across the finish line first in that heat. She was right in the middle of the field. And these times, again, will be used to break any ties that we see in the Texas Oak event. We can't, we can't overlook this. Even just thinking back to the CrossFit Games with that sandbag event, there were so many ties throughout the sequence. People getting eliminated at the same weight. And so, of course, then we, we resulted to a, a tie break that took place after the fact. And now we're literally setting the stage, knowing who's going to end up on top if there is a particular tie. Jerry, I know CrossFit athletes can ask a lot of questions. What kind of questions have, were you getting uh, from these athletes as you were taking them through the log lift? I think the biggest one is, is the clean. Mm -hmm. It's really the most important part of it sets up for a good press. So, you know, how the thing comes off the mats, into the lap, you know, with the handles pointed down, to get that thing into a good rack position on the shoulders is very important to set up for a good press. We are resetting for the second heat of the tie break here on the Jerry can't carry for time. You can see the lifting platforms there in the middle of your screen, right at home plate here at the Dell Diamond Stadium. And now we are set for heat number two of the tie break. And I think one lesson that we learned from heat one is that you have to be ready at the start line, and it's a sprint even to the bags. You've got a race to get set up, pick it up in stride, and be taking that first step and route to the finish line in order to have success. No hesitations. Top 10 athletes in the overall standings now taking the field for their run at the Jerry Can Carry. And again, these times only come into play if there is a tie uh, in the Texas Oak. Jerry, what are some things that you'd keep in mind here even with a carry like this? Just looking at it right now, it, uh, the transition from that sp initial sprint into the bag to grab those handles smoothly, but have a good grasp on them so you can take off and run and not shortchange that first initial grip on. 30 seconds before we start the second and final heat of the tie break. And then we will get into the main portion of this event. Alexis Raptus, who made the most of that appeal in the last event. Here we go. Danielle Brandon is running with those things. She's in the white top. Brandon losing her balance. And it's going to be Laura Horvath who comes across first. And Brandon took a risk, but it did not pay off. She's going to take 10th in that heat. But again, if she takes care of business in the Texas Oak, that will not matter. Yeah, that's, that's what you got to do as an athlete sometimes. You got to roll the dice and lay it on the line in order to try to create the best advantage possible. I mean, Danielle Brandon probably with an understanding under heavy loads. This, we, she doesn't know how this event's going to play out for her specific capacity. She tried to take a chance and set herself up for success. And unfortunately, sometimes that's an end result right there. Well, Danielle Brandon has been really good at you know, playing with strategies. She did that at the games with the, the tie break and the sandbag over the bar, and it actually paid off for her. And a lot of people adopted that technique where she went lightest to heaviest, but did not pay off for her here in the tie break. Event number seven of 10 here, the last event of the day, the Texas Oak. It's just a one rep max log lift. What are the keys to? being successful at this. You know, I could take the back seat to Jerry on this one. I know that he's got a couple. I made a point to list, though, Jerry, when the arms bend, the power begins for this particular movement, where it's like they've got to lap it with some bent arms commonly to get it to where they can now then use leverage 
and maximize that hip contribution to get it to the front rack. So there really is two ways to come off the mat. So you can have that bent arm straight into the lap, but you want to make sure you really get into that hip crease. So another way is to stand fully up with it and then squat down into it. That way it'll, it'll keep it into the, the crease because if it's too far out towards your knees, when the, you go to clean, it's going to be harder to clean because it's going to be down like lower towards you know, your lower part of your abdomen and it's going to be very hard to clean. You want it really on top of the abdomen. That way as you start c coming up and throwing the hips through, that line rolls right up to rack position. Your elbows are high and you're in a good position to press it on through. Love it. So Danny Spiegel, who did very well in the sandbag ladder at the Cross of Games, won that event, faced with another strongman implement here. And she could use a strong performance as Spiegel comes in in 13th place overall, coming off an 8th place finish in the Duel 2. And she's simply strong with a listed clean and jerk max at 270 pounds. I wonder what the carryover from an Olympic lift like that then we can see into a lift with the lug. I would expect her to do very well at this with she, her explosive power. Now, the log is a much different implement than a barbell or an axle, uh, but there is some carryover to that drive and be able to drive it off, get that good push press off the chest. As long as she keeps her elbows high, doesn't lose her elbows at the start where that log dips forward. If that log rolls forward, then it's out in front of you, you're trying to press it. And I think it wants to go straight overhead. So if she holds that rack position well and uses that explosive power she has, she's going to do very well. And one thing that we understand is te technique matters, no matter what it is that you're lifting. And while there's variance between a barbell and the diameter of a barbell versus a log, a lot of our athletes are used to generating force immediately off the floor and then being able to use their speed because of the whip that is created in the bar as that bar gets weightless. There's really not a time that the, that, that log is going to become weightless for them in this lift. No, never. You come in the clean, it's going to rest for a second in the rack, and then you're just going to have to explode out off your chest and keep that thing moving. Like I said, it, that's why it's very critical on that rack position to hold that rack position through the push press and straight over your head. You can't look at that log. It's got to be against your chin with your eyes in the air, and it's just got to go straight overhead. And I know that for me particularly, if I lined up and you tried to coach me through one of this, that'd be one of the hardest habits for me to break is being willing to look up arch through my low back a little bit, stay tight through my glutes in order to protect my low back and still be able to create the force through the ground. It's very hard to have the commitment, to get used to the commitment of taking your eyes off it and just launching it off your chest and not trying to watch it. Because a lot of times when an athlete tries to watch it, it will go away from the push away from the implement. I love it. These are some great things for us to be minding and watching through as we watch the competitors get ready to take the floor. And of course, they're going to do it in groups of four to start, right, Sean? They will go out four at a time. Uh, as they complete lifts, they will move on, and we will add 10 pounds per round until we get down to a winner. One of the biggest things I would watch for in these early rounds is the athletes that are, have the technique really down and, and they're really sound in the clean and in the rack position and the press, that they can carry that on through each round where the other athletes maybe are trying to search and watch other athletes trying to learn as they go. That's going to be really crucial if they can just save energy and be the most efficient on each round as they go up. Here is the start list for event seven. The first four athletes out will be Andrea Solberg, Annika Greer, Olivia Kerstetter, and Bailey Rogers. Ten seconds before we get things kicked off. The opening weight, 160 pounds. Again, from left to right, Andrea Solberg, Annika Greer, Olivia Kerstetter, and Bailey Rogers. Bailey Rogers is good, so is Kerstetter. Solberg's going to jerk it, and Annika Greer with a push jerk. So four different techniques on display in the opening round, but they were all successful. They're all solid lifts. One thing I would say on a couple of them on the cleans, where they're trying to kind of jerk it from the thighs, 
as he gets heavier in later rounds, it's going to be tougher to do. The lightweight, you can kind of get away with that. Uh, so the ones that were lapped it and were a little more controlled on the clean, I would say are setting themselves up for a better chance for the heavier rounds. And what you're saying there, Jerry, is that they really want to get it as high into the abdominals as possible before they even initiate that hip drive? Yes, because when this log gets heavy, because this is a weight now they can all handle very well. They're all strong enough to yank it from their thighs. But when it gets heavier, it's going to have to be more efficient and get atop the abdomen so they can just roll it to their chest. Next for Jacqueline Dahlstrom, Manon Anganese, Emma McQuaid, and Danny Spiegel on the far right. She's closest to the camera. Now on the right side of your screen, and that was no problem for her. McQuaid is good, Anganese, and Dahlstrom all get through. Another good round, easy lifts. Really fast on that one split jerk. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's one of the advantages is a lot of these athletes are going to be able to explode the weight. If they use their speed properly overhead, it's just in that dip and drive phase. Can they traject it in a straight line instead of up and around their face or out in front of them? Yeah, exactly. Got to hold that rack position tight. That way you can, that power can generate up overhead. Next four women out, Carolyn Prevo, Matilda Garns, Ariel Lowen, and Alexis Raptus. Garns is good, Raptus is good, Prevo no problem, and Ariel Lowen gets through. So far, all 12 athletes who have lifted had been successful. Next four, Cara Saunders, Amanda Barnhart, Emma Lawson, and Ellie Turner. There is Emma Lawson who comes in in sixth place overall. Was the overall leader at one point yesterday. But is coming off her worst finish of the competition, a 12th place in the duel two. Barnhart, Saunders, Lawson, and Turner, all good. Four athletes remain. And then we will increase the weight to 170 pounds. Yeah, I would expect these early rounds, these, these are incredible athletes. They should crush these early rounds. Which is what we're seeing right now. They're all handling it very well. Yeah, it looks very easy for all the ladies that have taken up the log thus far and, and, and it brings up an interesting topic in regards to where our community's at and where our sport is how much exposure do they have to this have, have they thought about this in the future was it not until they heard the announcement that this was actually going to be an apparatus that the first time they ever touched it and then where could they even find one in their area luckily with the growth of strongman we're starting to see some of these implements appear locally or regionally at least so that they can go find them somewhere well, I think that's one of the coolest things right now that's happening in a lot of the CrossFit gyms is, is they're, they're kind of merged with CrossFit and Strongman implements. Danielle Brandon, Gabby Magawa, Annie Thorstadter, and Laura Horvath, the last four to go at 160, and all of them are able to complete their lifts, so all 20 women still alive here as we will increase the weight to 170 to start round two. Look at Olivia Kerstetter making her individual competition debut to 16 years old. And these aren't the typical Rogue log you would buy from Rogue online. These are special made for this competition to simulate that wood one they're going to get to in the later rounds. That way it's not going to be such a shock when they get to that big wood log. So these are made special just for this. So these are a little more cumbersome even than just a regular log that you would you know, see in most gyms. We're getting set to start round two. The weight has now increased to 170 pounds. And 45 seconds before we will start. And it's once again, Andre Solberg, Annika Greer, Olivia Kerstetter, and Bailey Rogers who will be out first. 
Yeah, and folks that are tuning in, unfamiliar with the sport of strongman, but very used to watching us move large loads, long distances quickly in CrossFit are gonna probably put a little pause as they watch these athletes always hinge at the hip and wait. And the thing that I think is important for them to understand is that without the rip and the recoil or the whip and the recoil of the barbell, there's the reason for the hesitation there at the hip because that's where the power really begins for them as they try to get that log into the crease of their hip or into their abdominals so then they can use that hip, rapid hip extension to get it to their shoulders. Yeah, they really need that hip drive to get that log into the rack position and that huge the press overhead. Kerstetter will make her lift, as is Bailey Rogers. Anika Greer going with a push jerk. And Solberg's going to miss. Just missed on that split. Yep. That's one of the risks on the split jerk is get that timing just right with the log. It's, it's much different than a barbell. Solberg with another attempt and not able to get it. So Andrea Solberg will be the first woman out. Jerry, a lot like you mentioned, the miss, the miss timing there and the, and the log ended up out in front instead of up overhead. Exactly. Once it's out in front, it is impossible. I mean, you watch your best pressers in the world with the log press. The log gets out in front of them. It's not going to happen. It has to be going straight up and over overhead. Next four out, Jacqueline Dahlstrom, and Alan Anganez, Emma McQuaid, and Danny Spiegel. No problem for Spiegel. Anganese is good. McQuaid is good. And it was Jacqueline Dahlstrom who missed. She's got time here. Reset. Try to gather herself. Focus on what didn't go well. Got to focus and get that thing in a really tight rack position, not to lose it. Because once the elbows dip or the wrists dip forward, let the handle dip forward, it's going to go too far out in front. One more attempt now for Jacqueline Dahlstrom. And she will make it. And she had a nail in that press. That was really if she could clean up the clean a little bit instead of that tug from the thighs, because it's really affecting her press. Because see how she really has to yank on it? If she could coil down into it into a lap position, it would help her set up for better press, especially the later rounds. Carolyn Prevo, Matilda Garns. Ariel Lowen and Alexis Raptus, the next athletes to go. Garns hits her press. Raptus is through. Lowen makes it, as does Carolyn Prevo. It's really starting to show, though, where the athletes are going to find the struggle. And, and, and you mentioned this already, Jerry, but it's, it's really keeping that torso in as much of a vertical position as possible. These athletes want to allow that log to almost pull them forward. Elbows drop. Less than optimal driving position. And then we see them struggling overhead. Yeah, the hips kind of got to be rocked through. You want that weight kind of back over center. So the hips right. kind of have to rock through so you're back on your heels so you can generate that power up through your heels, hips, up through your shoulders, up to the lockout. There's something that we talk about with the power of, of using CrossFit as a methodology to train, and it's universal motor recruitment patterns. And we saw a movement yesterday with the GHD sit-up where the athletes laid back, and it really strengthens the midline against like undue change of the spine. This is a great example of that, because they're under load, they're arched back, but they have to keep that position to have success and not let the load change, of course, the position they want to be in. Exactly. They, they have to stay tight and hold that position. Kara Saunders, Amanda Barnhart, Emma Lawson, and Ellie Turner all successful at 170 pounds. And we have one group left before we will add more weight and go up to 180. They are the top four women in the overall standings. Danielle Brandon, Gabby Magawa, Annie Thoris' daughter, and Laura Horvath. Three, two, one, there is Annie Thoris' daughter, second place overall coming into this event, but she trails first place Laura Horvath by 60 points. And Horvath has been on a tear, winning the last four events. Horvath the first done with the jerk. Brandon, Thor's daughter, and Magawa all stay alive. Only one athlete is eliminated. That's Andrea Solberg, and we will move up to 180 pounds. I say it, it 
it says a lot or a ton for the level of these athletes. They're getting into weights that seasoned strong women do. And for them to you know get told two weeks ago what this event was and to be into these weights already is very impressive. Now we go up to 180 pounds and 19 of the 20 women are still alive. Jerry, I heard the same thing about that sandbag event from the CrossFit Games. Some of the females from the strongman world were, were saying that because of the weights that Danny Spiegel and some of these other women were capable of, it literally pushed the strong women to say, oh, we've got to get stronger. If these generalists are able to move these loads, we've got to be much more. Exactly, and they found out about two hours ahead of time what that event was going to be. And right now there's you know, some competitions coming up in strongman that they're doing a, a sandbag to shoulder, and they're struggling with weights less than what they did there. So it, it says a, a ton for these athletes. Annika Greer, Olivia Kerstetter, and Bailey Rogers will be up first at 180 pounds. Do you find there's a particular body type or limb length that, that excels at this, this log event where the longer arms help you, hurt you? Definitely in, in a, a press event like this where you're going for maximum weight, the, the shorter lifters with short arms are going to do better. Then, I mean, it's just they got to go farther. The, the, sure. The lifters with the longer arms, longer press. But if they're efficient on the technique, and they should be fine. Kerstetter gets through. Bailey Rogers is struggling a bit. She's closest to the camera. Annika Greer is able to stabilize that. That lift will count. So Bailey Rogers in danger of bowing out at 180. She has time to make another attempt. Oh, Rogers getting pinned by the, the log there. And now she's not going to have time to make another lift. And that's an example, like you were expressing there, Jerry, right? She's not getting under and into the load enough to establish or initiate that clean. We're getting at weights now that it would be very hard to do that kind of that tug clean from the thighs. And you can see there, once it, it finally came up and she wasn't going to be able to catch it, took her off her feet. Next four up, Jacqueline Dahlstrom, Manon Anganese, Emma McQuaid, and Danny Spiegel. They had to make an adjustment to the log that Bailey Rogers was lifting. So they're holding all four athletes until the next window to make sure that we keep things as organized as possible here. Yeah, and again, that, that's, that's again a, a test of the athlete's psyche. Adaptation on the fly. You feel like you're ready to go. Your adrenaline's pumping. Your physical and psychological arousal's there and peaked. And then they say, no, no, <laughs> not yet. And you got to gather yourself. you got no choice. I think that's where you find the real gamers that can make that on-the-fly change and, you know, not affect their mindset. Yep, all day. It's, and, it's, and it's something we've watched these athletes battle through over the first two days already. Round two here at 180 pounds. Danny Spiegel is through. Dahlstrom struggling a little bit towards the top of your screen. Anganese and McQuaid get their lifts to count, and now Dawson really struggling with the clean portion. She's not going to be able to get it. You can see her, see on it, when she had it in the lap, she was almost in a good position, but she's leaning a little too far forward where the log is out towards her knees. So as she starts to come up, the log actually is away from that crease of her hips. Right. So you, you want to be a little more upright when you get down in a lap position so you can keep it closer into the hip. That way you can use your hips before that drive. And I really think a lot of this is a, is, a, is a psychological battle for us so used to using a barbell. Because we're used to hearing Coach Bergner say when your arms bend, the power ends, and trying to stay as long as you can until you jump that weight off the floor and it becomes weightless. And this is almost very contrary to that. A huge learning curve. Absolutely. Tilda Garns, that lift will count. Alexis Raptus is through, so Carolyn Prevo and Ariel Lowen still out there, and Lowen fights through that. 
And here's Prevo. Just can't get that into the front rack position, but still has time. And I don't know if she's going to make another, another run. She may. Oh, she got it. Prevo's got a chance. Not going to happen for Carolyn Prevo. That was a great effort to come back and get that clean, though. Yeah, she said, "I'm listen, I'm at the Rogue Invitational. I'm going to give it a go. Give it a go. Yeah, great effort. Next four women out, Cara Saunders, Amanda Barnhart, Emma Lawson, and Ellie Turner. No problem for Barnhart. Turner hits the lift. Lawson will make it. Lawson did not make it. Unable to stabilize, and Cara Saunders struggling as well. Stay back on that dip. Saunders not able to get under it. Molossen with another attempt here. And Emma Lawson is good. Wow. Not, Huge. Not bad for a 17-year-old. That's, that's incredible. Top four women in the overall standings to close out round three. Danielle Brandon, Gabby Magawa, Annie Thorstadter, and Laura Horvath. No problem for Horvath. Stumbled a little bit there, but that will count. Magawa's through. Annie Thorstadter presses it out, and Danielle Brandon stays alive. Danielle faring pretty, pretty darn good with this, with this apparatus so far. I, I think she, she has a tremendous overhead position, so she can drive, get in a good drive position. She's going to have success as long as she can get it where she's comfortable. And she got a really great explosion off her chest. And being probably one of the tallest athletes out there with probably longer arms than most, she's doing a really great job of getting that overhead quick. We are down to 15 women now as four more were eliminated there in round Number three, and now we move to 190 pounds. Annika Greer and Olivia Kerstetter, two of the youngest competitors in the field, will be up first. Monica Greer coming in in 19th place overall, but she does have two finishes inside the top 10. She took a third in event three and then took ninth in the duel two earlier this afternoon. And Annika being one of those athletes, she openly admitted she loves to squat. So you'd like to think that some of these strength modalities will be in her favor. Don't have particular numbers, though, for a clean and jerk. Olivia Kerstetter, at just 16 years old, is extremely powerful. She has a listed 270-pound split jerk. Kerstetter unable to get underneath it, and neither is Annika Greer. Still plenty of time here. As long as they start the lift before the one minute ends, it will count. And Greer almost had it. Kerstetter wow. will make it. Wow. What a lift by the youngster. Huge lift. Had to come back and get that on the second attempt, too. Danny Spiegel gets through 190 pounds. She's out there with Emma McQuaid and Manon Anganez. Oh. 
McQuaid will fail her jerk, and Anganez is able to wow. fight through it. Great lift. Very strong presser to be able to correct that and pull it back, because it was out in front of her at first, and she recovered well. She really took a few seconds in the rack position, which is time under tension. You can't do that too long. You can't hold that too long, and she did really well recovering from that. You know what? I noticed that in the strongman event, those that had the best success in that particular event, when they got it into that front rack position there on their chest, it was immediately into the drive phase overhead. And it seemed to reduce the overall, of course, time under tension like you're describing. Yeah, exactly. As soon as you can pull tight, get that the rack and just go. Emma McQuaid was unable to complete her lift in the last round. Now Matilda Garns fails the jerk. Alexis Raptis will stay alive. And now Ariel Lowen. And Matilda Garns still have some time here. Time. And Lowen is going to bow out. Come on. Clean. Garns just doesn't look like she's got the power to get under that. Yeah, and you just wonder. That, that took a little too long there, right? Just probably sucking the life out of her there. It's too much time on the chest. And you can see both of those last two competitors, their elbows are really low. So they're really buried in that rack position. It's really hard to, to push out of that. Amanda Barnhart, Emma Lawson, and Ellie Turner up next. Wow. Barnhart will make that count. Very easy. Lawson is good, as is Ellie Turner. Great recovery. Lawson learned from her last rep. That one almost looked easier. I mean, a, a bit unstable at the, at the lockout, but. But still great shoulder stability and, you know, stability in general to come back underneath that when it starts wobbling that much. Final four at 190, Danielle Brandon, Gabby Magawa, Annie Thoris' daughter, and overall leader, Laurel Horvath. Brandon can't get the jerk to go. Horvath misses. Thor's daughter hits it. And Gabby McGowa just two forward with it. But time remains here for the athletes to make another attempt. And Laura Horvath is going to do just that. She gets to work on the clean. Bottom left of your screen. There goes Danielle Brandon. And Horvath recovers nicely. And she stays alive. Daniel Brandon won't hit it. There's Gabby Magawa, and she will make it. Wow. Great comeback there. Yeah, big second lifts by both Magawa and, and Horvath there. As I'm watching their drive position as they go overhead, it's, it's interesting to me because not to get too nerdy for the viewers, but... When, when we work level ones and we teach people about the push press or the push jerk, we really talk about stacking the shoulders and the hips in the dip phase. When I'm watching the ladies here, it almost looks like they have to drive their knees forward a bit more and they can re rely less on their posterior to drive the, the, the load overhead simply because of the position of the log. Yeah, ideally you'd want to push your knees out. Okay. Because if you dip forward, your shoulders will come forward sometimes. Right. But the ones that are doing it well, they got their hips rocked under them, are getting away with that forward, that knee bend, because their hips are under them enough. But if your hips are a little more straight through, when you, you really want that outer knee bend to go straight down with the log. Got it. So whatever allows you to travel straight up and down with that log is what's going to optimize that drive phase. It's because it's, it's so big and cumbersome. Once it gets out in front, like you're seeing, it's impossible to recover from when you start getting the heavy weights. We are now down to 10 athletes as half the field has been eliminated here. And the women who are still alive, Manon Anganese, Danny Spiegel, Alexis Raptis, Amanda Barnhart, Emma Lawson, Ellie Turner, Gabby Magawa, Annie Thoris' daughter, and Laura Horvath. And the weight has now moved up to 200 pounds. 
And it looks like they're going to go down now to two women lifting at a time. And I know we've seen, Sean, a few ladies bow out at the same weights, but we've already established a tiebreaker. We've already set that precedent for that. So when we get the standings and we see the final results, we're going to understand why the order is set in the way it is. While they might have gone out of the same weight, someone took the backseat to someone else in the sandbag race. Well, Danielle Brandon, Matilda Guards, Annika Greer, Emma McQuaid, and Ariel Lowen all bowed out at 180. And remember, Danielle Brandon finished towards the back in the back of that second heat of the tie break. Yeah, that stumble on the back really hurt her at the end there. She had a great time going, just took the risk to get going a little too fast. This is gonna be a big round, 200 pounds. It's just some, they're getting some serious weight now. Serious weights here. Unexplored territory for almost all of, all of the field here, unless they've been doing some secret training and certainly not posting it on social media. I can't say that we've seen ladies ever experience this type of loading with an apparatus like this in the form of the log. First two out will be Olivia Kerstetter and Manon Anganese. mentioned Kerstetter and how strong she is already at 16 years old. Manon Anganese is a Belgian champion in weightlifting in the 69 kilo class. First hitter right to work. Got to get those elbows high. Unable to complete the jerk. Here goes Manon Anganese. The longer she stands there, those elbows keep getting lower and lower. Can't get it to go, and Kerstetter is making another attempt. Unable to get it. Wow. Both Kerstetter and Anganese are out. All right, here we go, and Spiegel's made easy work of the weight so far. Spiegel on the left, Alexis Raptus on the right, 200 pounds on the log. Raptus really struggling with the clean. No problem for Danny Spiegel. Very easy. She's so powerful that really not even the best clean, but she's so powerful to throw it from, from her thighs the way she is. Really impressive. We see that in, in, in so much when it comes to external loading. It's like if you've got enough of a buffer, you can get away with certain things that other athletes won't be able to get away with. Here goes Alexis Raptus who muscles that thing up. I'm just trying to find some balance here before she attempts the jerk. Not it's too unstable. Able to do it. Long time to brace with 200 pounds across your chest. And since Raft has bled over into that next one minute window, we're going to take a quick reset as Amanda Barnhart and Emma Lawson will be the next two out. Barnhart, another lady who has made all of her reps up to this point look pretty light. Jerry, have you? Have you had the room close in on you ever going shoulder to overhead with one of these logs, meaning like started to black out? I've had that experience with clean and jerks and shoulder overhead with a barbell. I didn't know if it's the same with the log. It can. That's a lot of weight sitting there. So it says time under tension. So the quicker you can get that thing in the rack and get it going overhead, the much better off you're going to be because, yeah, it's, it's sitting there. You're, you're, you're breathing. I think so once the shoulders start dropping, the elbows start dropping, you start wavering too much, your chances of getting are just getting less and less. Here go Barnhart. And Lawson. Wow. Barnhart unable to press it out. Clean looked good. Just came out in front of her a little too far to recover. 
Lawson really had to wrestle that what would, log what, up to her shoulders. What would you try to cue Barnhart there on on the left? What would you what would you El elbows higher and then hold those wrists? So if, if those wrists move forward, the elbows drop. It's going to bring that log forward. So your wrists have to be solid. Elbows got to be high, and those handles need to be pointing towards the sky. Have that log right against her chin, looking at the sky. A good dip. Just probably didn't feel like she had the juice for it. Yeah, first one took too much out of her, I think. We're getting into weights now that to come back on a second attempt is going to be very hard to do. Neither Barnhart nor Lawson able to get through the 200 pound lift. And here come Ellie Turner and Gabby Magawa. Good for Turner and Magawa struggling with the clean. Still about half of that minute remaining. Magawa for her second attempt on the right. Here comes Ellie Turner. Turner almost had it. So close. Magawa unable to make her lift. Great attempts. Danny Spiegel so far the only woman to get through this weight as Annie Thorosauter and Laura Horvath will be the final two women to lift here. Both of them look really solid on the, on the last round. Even though Horvath had to take a second attempt at it, she still, when she hit the second, was very solid. Yeah, it was almost like her miss was a bit of a, a mental lapse, lack of focus. And it's all it can take, too, on the log, because, you know, it, it is a technical lift on staying in position. So you come out of position just a little bit, can kill the lift. So just come back and correcting that sometimes is night and day difference. The same situation last time. We had the athletes bleed over into the next one-minute window. So Annie Thorstadter and Laura Horvath get a little extra time to stand there and think about their attempts at 200 pounds. Here comes overall leader Laura Horvath. Two-time fittest woman on earth, Annie Thorostad. Horvath struggling with a clean. Thorostad able to get that to her chest. Finish. And now, Horvath has herself situated. Gotta go. Horvath almost got that. Thorstadter unable to complete the lift. She held it for a long time in the rack position, and the elbows just kept getting lower and lower. Both Thorstadter and Horvath making a second attempt. Horvath wow. is wow. good. Wow. Well, Annie Thorstadter unable to complete the lift. Danny Spiegel and Laura Horvath will move on. Oh, game on. Game on, and you love right. to see it. Hey, Horvath said, you're not going to come between me and my streak that easy. Hold the phone, Spiegel. Absolutely amazing. Both the last two rounds, she's had to come back on that second attempt and get that. Yeah, and I really think that's a note to, to her overall conditioning, right? It, it is. It's huge. Because you're getting in the weights that you can see most of them had they, no shot on their second attempt. With two athletes remaining, we will now move to the Texas Oak. Sitting out there on home plate. Not going to get to that yet, actually, as they're moving one of the other logs up to the main platform that is in the middle. And the weight will go up to 210. Danny Spiegel and Laura Horvath, the only two athletes left lifting. And we talked about this earlier, Adrian, but Laura Horvath needs to bank as many points as she possibly can right now because deficit handstand push-ups on the parallettes are looming tomorrow. 
Yes, and this this is a repeat workout that we have on the on the horizon from 2019 that gave Laura Horvath a, a really really big problem back then. And in fact, I I don't know that she was able to register one strict handstand push up, and I'm quite sure that you know that that DNF'd the rest of the competition for her. So there's going to be a lot of pressure uh, come morning time. So she wants to ride this high and accumulate as much of a gap on the field as she can. And she's doing what she can right now. Yeah, she really has been incredible in this log, like, especially these last two rounds to miss and come back in the second attempt on those heavy rounds and, and still and crush it. Again, a lot of fight, Jerry. I don't know if you've been able to see so far, but Laura has literally won the last four events in a row, 100 points, racking them up all the way. So it's been. Yeah, she, she has an amazing weekend so far. So Absolutely. she's just kind of carrying that momentum into this log. Absolutely. We saw the Texas Oak. It's on the bottom right hand part of your screen. Just hopefully she knows what threw her off on those first two attempts on the 190 and the 200 to get this first attempt on this 210. Danny Spiegel will be first up, and they've jumped up to 205 pounds, so now five pound increments. Spiegel coming in 13th place overall at 260 points, and has already guaranteed herself her best finish of the competition with at least a second place here in this event. She's been going really well every round. I would expect this to go just as well. Muscles that up. Yeah, great hip drive from the hip. She's so explosive. And that will count no problem for Danny Spiegel. So Laura Horvath, who's needed two attempts the last two logs. I don't think there's been much different from her 170 to that 205. I completely agree. I mean, they've been almost identical every round. Horvath now trying to stay even with Spiegel. And when it comes to these events, I think a lot of competitors know if you're staring at Danny Spiegel as your opponent, it might just be a matter of time before she's going to win this event, especially with as easy as that last lift look. Laura Horvath, first place overall after winning the last four events, 495 total points. She will finish at least in second place in this event. 205 pounds. Get those elbows up. Good adjustment. Time, gotta go. Horvath not able to get underneath that. She will try and make another attempt, but in the big scheme of things, she's already finished in second. 95 more points are gonna be added to her total. She did the last two rounds. Let's see if she can come back and get that second again. Got the practice rep in. Now it's time yep. for the real one. Doubles high, yep. set, and go. Just not able to make it. So Danny Spiegel is going to win the event. Laura Horvath will finish in second. First event win here for Spiegel at the 2022 Rogue Invitational. All right, and what do we say, folks? I say they continue to bring out the weights for Danny Spiegel. Let's see a show. <laughs> I, I want to see what she can do. I mean, it hasn't got heavy for her yet. Well, one of the judges was talking to her, and Spiegel is going to make a run at the Texas Oak. All right. Hey, this is, this is what you'd love to see. There's literally no more points left for her to earn. It's out there. We might as well lift it. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to put on a show. I love it. I love it too. I'm, that's what I'm here for, and, and it's that's something that I remember starting the sport with, and even having conversations with Tommy Hackenbrook, who helped mentor me, and we competed together on teams. We talked about that often. Is put on a show for the people that are willing to come out and support you, because that's a part of the gig. It's a part of the deal. 100 percent. Fans are here. They pay good money to be here, support the athletes, put on a show for them. That Texas Oak was made specially for this competition by Steve Slater and his son Landon, and it is very similar in design to the one that the strongmen used in the prior event. 215 pounds for Danny Spiegel. That's going to bring this crowd to its feet. Yeah, get on your feet, folks. Support this Everybody lady. Everybody wants to see this. 
And she's doing, she's doing it for them. She got 100 points in her purse already. She's going to crush it. She's got 30 seconds left. They're still trying to keep this on somewhat of a time. Everybody here at Dell Diamond Stadium is out of their seats. There's not a person <laughs> sitting in their seat right now. Everybody's on edge wanting to see this. All the athletes are standing too. These are the fun moments where the crowd's up, they're all screaming, your fellow competitors are behind you screaming. Creating memories, right? It's huge. I mean, it just shows the camaraderie of the, of the, of the sports, right? The strong man's the same way. Levels high. Big drive. And Danny Spiegel Easy. will make it. 2-15. Wow. wow. Lifts the Texas Oak. Fireworks going off. And the fans get the show that they came for from Danny Spiegel. First career event win at the Rogue Invitational. And first time that the Texas Oak is lifted. That's awesome. You love to see it. What an event, what a new challenge for these ladies. I'm sure they loved every moment of it. And that makes the Danny Spiegel fans extremely happy. And it will make Danny Spiegel happy. Because she adds 100 points to her total. Came in in 13th place overall, looking to punch into the top 10. Getting a hug from Raleigh Lowen and Laurel Horvath, who continues to pile up the points here. Four wins and now a second place finish with three events left. And the women are done on Saturday. And Danny Spiegel closes things out with a bang as she tears through these logs and then lifts the Texas Oak. Great open position, as you mentioned, Jerry. Flawless on that jerk. Her, her press is amazing. She gets so much drive. I honestly, if she could clean up the clean and make it more efficient, because she, she's got so much power, she's just almost like curling it up. If she could get more of a textbook clean, I'd be curious what she would do. I mean, she would challenge some of the best strong women for their and that's, log press. And that's 200 pounds right there that we just witnessed. Yeah. This is the lift at 205. And when she hit this, you knew it was pretty much over. Incredible performance. She's got to be stoked with that. Crush that 215, be the only one, get a shot at it. And this was just for style points. Yep. And she made a count. Danny Spiegel, an event win, and she is with Kiki Dixon. Danny, congratulations on your first Rogue Invitational event win. You didn't have to do the final log, but you went for it anyway. What was the motivation behind it? Uh, well, it was like the wooden log, and they were like, well, you can do it. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do the wooden log. <laughs> so it was an easy choice, easy choice. It was so fun and exciting to watch. This was teased a couple of weeks ago. When they released it, who, what, where did you go for some advice on the technique with the log? Uh, we kind of you know just played around in the gym we had like a log there uh ben smith and laura horvath we just kind of played around with it i didn't imagine that they would give us a one rep max log so uh, we just worked up to like a casual weight so this was this was great this was a shock it was very fun it's always fun to come out and do new stuff just like at games with the sandbag clean ladder it's fun when there's like new implementations especially on the strength side because it gets boring after a while just doing a clean and jerk and a snatch so i like that they're getting creative with it it's been fun it's been fun from both ends it's been a pleasure to watch and congratulations thank you so much really appreciate it events the laura horvath continues to lead 590 total points gabriella magawa now sits in second place, 10 points up on Annie Thorstadter as Thorstadter drops down one spot. Ellie Turner climbs up one spot into fourth, and Danielle Brandon now sits in fifth place. 
The women are done. The log lifting will continue after a quick break. The men coming up next for event number seven, the Texas Oak. Yeah, man. Great.
Saturday at the 2022 Rogue Invitational coming to a close for the CrossFit competition. The event was so fun. We're going to do it again for the men. The Texas Oak is up next, the seventh of 10 events for the CrossFit competition here at the Dell Diamond in Round Rock, Texas. Thanks for being with us, everybody. Sean Woodland with Adrian Conway and America's former strongest man, Jerry Pritchett. What's it been like for you to be at this event just as a fan without competing? Really cool. I think, you know, this has become like a spectacle for, you know, strength athletics and everything going on between all the competitions, the fan area out there, the little competitions doing with the fans in between events. R really cool. And, and it should be on everybody's to-do list in years to come to book this. And we're going to get to watch you compete in some of the Record Breakers events that are coming up later. That should be a lot of yeah, fun. I'm give them a go tomorrow, so it should be fun. Yeah, looking forward to that. The men are up next in the uh, Texas Oak. Let's take a look at the overall standings coming into the event. It's Justin Medeiros who retook the overall lead in the last event. He now leads Pat Vellner by 20 points. Roman Krennikov, who was the overall leader going into the duel two, now sits in third place. He is 60 points back of Medeiros and 40 back of Vellner. Sam Quant sits in fourth, tied with Jeffrey Adler in points, but Quant with the tie break and Bjorvin Carl Gubinson just hanging out inside the top 10 like he always does. Event number seven is the Texas Oak. Presented by GORUCK. Just a one rep max lift here, Adrian. Yeah, just a one rep max lift. We're gonna watch the athletes take the floor in groups of four and then elimination style get down to one at a time. And the keys to this event, after talking with Coach Jerry Pritchett right here, he's saying, bend those arms, squat down, get that bar high into the abdominals before you extend those hips as fast as possible in order to get the load into the best position that you can. And of course, we understand, even like Olympic lifting, speed can win, but only if through that dip and drive phase, you get the log traveling vertically and not out in front of you. And like we did with the women, we are going to start with the tie break. It's just a... Jerry can carry for time. Just one length down the field, and then these times will only come into play if there's a tie at one of the weights on the log. We see some of these athletes even staging the bags the appropriate width that's going to optimize the outcome here for them, because every little detail is going to matter. This is going to come down to the fraction of a second. Transition is crucial. 100 pounds in each bag. Main assignments on the left side of your screen. And here we go. And it's Ricky Garrard in the middle of the field along with Saxon Panchik. Jorge Fernandez is losing his balance, and Ricky Garrard's going to be the first man across. So Fernandez trying the same strategy that we saw Daniel Brandon employ and almost took a header but was able to save it. And Ricky Garrard's going to have the fastest tie break time in heat number one. There with Tim Paulson on the right and Nick Matthew who is not wearing a crop top. I wonder how this will affect his performance here, Sean. He must have hit the scissors from him. And we'll get reset for the second heat of the tie break, and then we will get into the main part of this event. And all kidding aside, we, we, we watched the ladies go through these lifts, and, and we started, as the event unfolded, to really understand the importance and urgency that needed to take place here in this tiebreaker because we watched uh, uh, most of the field have great success and then all of a sudden when one dropped several dropped at one particular weight yeah once that log gets heavy it's it's you really start to get, see athletes drop and it'll get heavy fast like same thing as is the women like these first couple rounds all these guys will crush it then when it starts getting close to that 300 pound mark it's really gonna start separating the field but i tell you these men have a lot to live up to because the ladies put on an amazing performance tackling that log. I agree. That's going to be a tough act to follow. Danny Spiegel was the only woman to lift that Texas Oak. And there's Jason Hopper, who will lead the next heat out onto the field. Behind him is Chandler Smith, followed by Jeff Adler, Roman Krennikov, and then our overall leader, Justin Medeiros. And Pat Vellner, Sam Quant, 
Jorvan Gubinson, Noah Olson, and Yona Koski. So 100 pounds in each hand for these men, one trip down the field to establish their time for any potential tie break that is needed during the lifting portion of the event. Final event for the CrossFit athletes here on Saturday night. Only three remain after this. We know two of them. We do not know the 10th and final event. Hopper had great success in that initial weighted run to start the start off the week here. Can he replicate it on this? Jason Hopper is middle of your screen. He will be on the far right side of the field as the athletes work their way towards you. We are underway. Justin Medeiros out front with Roman Krennikov. This one is pretty even. Jeff Adler. Adler with a looks great push. Looks like he was first. No idea who finished second. As that was a tight race. Everybody came across at about the same time. Wow. 9.87 seconds. Roman Krennikov right behind him, and then less than a second separating third from 10th. Wow. Great push right there by Mr. Adler late. Gained control of those sandbags, kept the momentum going forward. And I got to say, he's, he's, he's someone that I'll be watching through this event in itself. I was going to say, that's some good insurance for him. He's going to do, should do really well in this event. One of the stronger athletes in the field. And currently sits in fifth place overall. Got to add some comfort going into it, though, having that tiebreaker out of the way, having a good time. And, and Jason Hopper is one of these athletes that I think when we reference back to even the CrossFit games and the odd object test that took the shape as, as a sandbag, excelled. And he adapted very quickly to understanding he has a power athlete background playing football at Clemson. We know that he can do well with external loads, and now it's really going to be up to seeing how can he adapt to this new implement in the form of a log. I would expect, well, like he did in the sandbag, like we saw with the women that excelled on the sandbag, that excelled on the log. I would, it was got a lot of carryover to have an explosion, to have an explosion in the hips, to be able to get that log to the rack position quick and to get that power to drive it overhead. Yeah, when we think about the lineup that we've got here, we've got men with clean and jerks over 355 pounds from Chandler Smith, Saxon Panchik, Jorge Fernandez, Tim Paulson, Ricky Garrard, Jack Farlow, Nick Matthew, and Jeff Adler all coming in above 355 pounds. Boy. And while we wait for the main portion of this event to start, the men are just already getting some more reps in here before they start the main portion of this event. Ricky Garrard, and behind him is Nick Matthew. See Ricky Garrard working on that technique where he deadlifts it and then gets underneath it. Gets that right tight in the hip, in the hip crease. That way he squats down and he starts that drive up I think it starts nice and close to him so he can roll that up to his chest. Heinrich Hapalainen getting some reps in. There's Tim Paulson stepping up. About three minutes for these men to continue to warm up before we're actually going to start the main portion of event number seven as the sun is setting here on the Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. Very busy Saturday, and we still have one day left of competition. And still to come later on this evening, we will crown a strongman champion for the 2022 Rogue Invitational. Texas Oak is event number seven, though, for the CrossFit competition presented by GORUCK. And there is that beautiful implement designed by Steve Slater and his son Landon, very similar to the one that we saw the strongman use earlier. Really awesome equipment they build between Rogue and Slater. Just amazing equipment. Strongman and CrossFit now. We still have the Roga coaster out there in left field. You can see that in the upper left-hand part of your screen. Just massive sitting out there. Well, 
Scott Tetlow and Roman Krenikov working through some warm-up reps. Jordan Gumanson. That was a really good clean yeah. press. Really good technique. If he yep. can keep that as he starts going up. He can be really efficient. Use the least amount of energy on these early rounds. Yeah, Bjorven Gubman's in from Iceland. There's Annika Greer taking some time to be a fan here. <laughs> <laughs> Talking over what happened in that log press. Explain that, ra that rack position in the log. <laughs> <laughs> Annika Greer, an athlete that I'm sure we'll be watching for quite some time yep. at this level. She had a really good showing at Wadapalooza earlier in the year, and then unfortunately unable to submit a score uh, during quarterfinals. That kept her out of semifinals, and now here she is back in live competition. And we saw Bjorn Carl Gudson as Jason Hopper steps up to that. Gudson from Iceland, trains with Annie Thorstadter. Annie Thorstadter, of course, has spent time training with Hathor Bjornsson, so very likely that that crew has spent some time with implements like They've this. They've seen a log before. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe watching that young lady in about 16, 17 years here. That's a real invitation. I think she's ready. <laughs> well, now the men are making their way out onto the field. We will begin in the same fashion as we did with the women. Four men will lift at a time until we get down to 10. And then they will reduce that to two at a time. And then we will finally end up on the Texas Oak to decide the winner. You know, and, and my big thing I want to point out to anyone is, that's watching this is if, if they wonder where all the chalk has gone and the chalk shortage throughout the world, it, it's here. <laughs> it's here tonight for this event across all the shirts and all the logs. It's all in Round Rock, Texas right now. And I think a lot of affiliate owners are having heart palpitations looking at all the chalk that is being spread all over the place. They do not want to see that duplicated in their gyms because someone's cleaning that up. And we know it's not the members. <laughs> no, true shout out to all the affiliates out there. And of course, all the good members that are cleaning up their own chalk and minding the mess that they create each and every day they come in to grind. We are about set to get started. The first four men out will be Scott Tetlow, Jack Farlow, Lazar Jukic, and Tim Paulson. And there is Jack Farlow, the youngest man in the competition, just 20 years old, but a very strong athlete at that young age. Absolutely. We got to see him stringing together one of the heaviest complexes throughout the semifinals um, at, the Atlas, at the Atlas Games this, this spring. So he's, he's, he's probably pretty excited about this particular test. We start at 260 pounds. Great venue here to host this competition. Second straight year that we've been here at Bill Diamond Stadium. Second straight year we've had the hill out in center field. And then we had the Tower of Power that was out there in the left field corner. That's not there anymore. But it did look like a carnival here when they had everything set up. Strongman carnival. Yeah, the roller co roller coaster out there. You had Zeus in the middle of the, of the field. Would not recognize this place as a baseball diamond. Really amazing that the work and effort, time that Rogue puts into this. Yeah, the manpower, especially all the volunteers. Yeah. Could never make an event like this happen without them. First round is underway. Scott Tetlow, Jack Farlow on the left, Tim Paulson, and Lazar Jukic on the right. Jukic unable to hit his left. Farlow will make his. And Paulson is through. Lazar Jukic still competing on a bit of a bum ankle. He rolled it in the opening event on Thursday. And just not able to get through that. Yeah, that would really affect his power, trying to put those heels through the floor to push that overhead. Next four out, Jorge Fernandez, Heinrich Hapalainen, Saxon Panchik, and Nick Matthew. Three, two, one, lift. 
round two has begun. Nick Matthew is through. He's in the upper right hand part of your screen. Back line and, and Fernandez hit their lifts and Saxon Panchik failing. This is much earlier than I imagined him bowing out at 260. So it's just about refining that technique, keeping that upright position as he finds the bottom of that dip and not letting it pull him forward. Able to clean it. And able to make that lift. Come back. It's a little bit of risk. You see way he gets in the lap and he kicks the hips backwards. It can benefit you because you can get some good hip drive back through. But when you do that, the log is liable to slide down. And then that could affect you as you start rolling up because then your elbow's timed in a lower position. Next four out will be Cole Sager, Ricky Garrard, Yonikowski, and Jason Hopper. Sager unable to clean that weight. Hopper will get through. Koski fails the jerk. Gerard is fighting his way through it, and that will count. Sager and Koski have yet to complete their opening lifts. Sager's going to be unable to complete that. Now Yona Koski to stay alive. And he will do it. Got it. Great job, great recovery by Yona. You know, it's some, it's, it was one of my initial thoughts is that the, the men are going to have to be more technical than the women in order to hit equal weights uh, in an event like this. Yeah, at this, this weight, to do that, you know, almost like a curl where they're trying to pull it from their legs up, it's getting really tough. It, it's 260 pounds to do that. You can see that with some of the athletes. Because when you do that, you're really taking it away from your overhead. Right. You get an overhead in you know, the rack position. Noah Olson, Chandler Smith, Bjorvin Gumitsen, and Jeff Adler. Smith and Olson are through. Gumitsen and Adler, no problem. We watched the strongman take on a log lift earlier at 360 pounds, and most of them seemed like went with a, a minor push press or a press. Why don't they push jerk or jerk more with that weight? When you get up into the really, really big numbers, there's only been a few guys in history that have been successful doing a split jerk mm -hmm. at the upper weights. Now, Rob Kearney has been one that's did really well. Um, uh, Misha Kolkaya from Russia years ago, he was very good at the split jerk. But most strong men don't, haven't been as successful and don't have the, the, the timing mm -hmm. and don't have the, the background as, as some of like, these guys that do some of the Olympic lifting to do that split jerk efficiently. I think about the frame of a lot of strong men too in comparison to our athletes out here where there's a constant balance of course of, of mass moving mass. And in our sport, we have to do so much body weight dependent tests and events that we really got to ma manage the amount of size that we put on. And of course that directly affects mobility, hitting particular positions. Pat Veller in a bit of trouble here. He failed his first attempt. Second place overall coming into this event. He cannot afford to let Justin Medeiros gain even more ground. And Vellner oh, he takes that it. thing for a dance, but he's going to save it. Uh, he was close to that edge. That was an amazing save. Once his, le his left leg hit the pad, I thought he was going down. What a save. I'm really glad he saved. That would have been bad on an ankle if he'd stepped off that. You're about a three, four inch drop off the back of that platform. We will reset now and add some weight to the logs and move it up to 270. We had just two men bow out at that opening weight, Lazar Jukic and Cole Sager. Let's take one more look at Pat Vellner, who was all over that platform, but able to save this lift on his second attempt. First one, no good. And he really needed this. Yeah, and I think it can be ignored that the overall stamina that it takes to go give this another attempt and finish it successfully the way that he does here in a moment. Almost stepped off that platform and was able to save it. 
And it really looks like he's doing that with no belt. Or maybe a very thin neoprene belt. Jack Farley, no problem. Tetlow is through. Tetlow looking strong on that. Tim Paulson is in the upper right-hand part of your screen. Paulson will get it. Jorge Fernandez, Heiner Kapolainen, Saxon Panjic, and Nick Matthew up next. Yeah, those guys making fast work of that weight there on that round. Says a lot for their shoulder mobility, the core strength, the way some of them can wobble as much as they do and still straighten up with the log. Most when they get that out of position, we just come back down. There's no way they would be able to straighten it out. Right. Three, two, one. Names highlighted in white on the left side of your screen are the men who are currently lifting. Hernandez, Hapalainen, and Pat Panchik, and Matthew. Matthew's through. Hernandez is through. Hapalainen made his lift, and for the second straight time, Saxon Panchik is struggling. Much faster clean there. And Saxon Panchik. Oh. Much better on that second one. Yeah, and you've mentioned this time and time again, Jerry, but his elbows looked way higher on that rep Much than he did better. the first rep. They got to be in that high position. And you see, looking at that angle where the handles are pointing up, the back of the handle comes up and it's pointing up towards the sky. That's the angle because you want your, your, your fist kind of coming back towards your face. That way, your, that first position is that handle raising up overhead, and then the log starts straightening it out. Coming up next, Noah, I'm oh, sorry, Ricky Garrard, Yonikoski, and Jason Hopper. Hopper is good at 270. Ricky Garrard is good at 270. Yona didn't even take an attempt at the shoulder overhead here or the jerk on that last rep, so I wondered if he felt like he was in a bad position. Next four out, Noah Olson, Chandler Smith, Bjorgvin Gumanson, and Jeffrey Adler. Noah Olson was the first one out. They're all kind of looking at each other. Do we go now? And there was a bit of confusion <laughs> in the start there. Chandler looking sharp. Chandler Smith is a good press. Goobinson is good. Jeffrey Adler is going to drop it. So he and Noah Olsen have yet to clear this weight. Olsen trying to get the crowd behind him a little bit. Jeffrey Adler stepping back up to 270 as well. Adler just does not seem sure of himself to set up. So he and Olsen will bow out. A bit wow. of a surprise here. Huge surprise there for Adler. He is one of the stronger males in our field. Wow. You can tell Olsen there on the end, on that second clean, he was really wide in his stance. And really hard to generate a lot of power from that wide. But it looked like the clean just took so much out of him to get that clean. Top four men are up. Quant, Krennikov, Velner, and Medeiros. There's Vail clean, clean for Medeiros. Krennikov is through. Sam Quant unable to save it. The top two men in the overall standings have yet to complete their lift at 270. This could be big for Roman Krennikov. Harris has the clean. And unable to get the jerk, and now Pat Vellner will not be able to make it. Here's Sam Quant, and Quant stays alive. For Justin to get this, he's got to hold a tighter rack position, get yep. those elbows high, and keep those wrists locked. Medeiros has it cleaned, and he will make it. Right. Didn't see it, but Medeiros did hit the lift, and that puts the pressure on Pat Vellner, who's 
there seems to be a con there seems to be a problem here. Medeiros made the lift, and I think someone told Vellner that he wasn't able to go. Vellner was saying Medeiros was able to go. Why can't I go? So now the judge is coming over to get this thing sorted out. I have to see how this gets sorted out here. Yeah, and I think the general confusion here is simply that Maderos made his lift as time was expiring. So Pat certainly thought that that allowed him to be eligible to begin his lift before the clock initially ran out. So we're going to just wait on the judgment call here. Let's look at Maderos' lift here, the successful lift. This was his third attempt. Yeah, third time's a charm. I was extremely impressed that he could, he had it in him to, to execute this. But just like you called, Jerry, his elbows were higher. He was in a tighter position. And honestly, the jerk there looked pretty easy for him once he got in a good position. It looked great. And the last one, if you watch it, as soon as he went to dip, he lost his wrist. Like, instantly came forward. So the lift was over before he even got much, you know, started to drive. I mean, he lost it on the dip. Now, there is a chance that Madera's timed out, and that they're going to review it right now to check it. And that would be big because Roman Krennikov was successful at that lift. We will wait to get to 280 pounds, as that was the last group to go. You know, even as we kind of wait for the judgment call here and seeing how we advance forward, Chandler Smith's one of those athletes that, that we kind of had our eye on with moving this log and having success here. And, and a lot of it attributes to how he tends to move a traditional clean and jerk. We, we see some things that we would consider as faults. Early arm bend. He's so strong that he has the ability to still press out jerks even if he doesn't catch them so clean. And with an apparatus like the log, sometimes some of those quote-unquote weaknesses or faults could actually act as a strength for him in this event. He's doing great so far. Now the men are trying to stay warm before they step up to 280 pounds. Yeah, you mentioned this earlier too, Jerry. It's like stalls in play, things that throw you off your game. This is really where we get to see who's going to step up to the plate when the challenge is not even just a workout. Exactly. You see where the gamers are, can kind of shut it off for a second and just stay, stay in the zone and relax and then be able to turn it back on when we get ready to Get a go, get a go time here. And just a reminder, when you think back to the tie break, if Medeiros did time out, he does have tie break over Vellner. Yeah, like Two hundred eighty pounds is on the log. And there is Justin Medeiros, who is pacing towards the back of the pack here. And again, they are trying to figure out whether or not he timed out on that lift. He was on his third attempt at 270. And we have yet to receive an official judgment, but by but, the looks of his body language, it's... By the look at him and the way the crowd <laughs> sounded a second ago, I, I think we know the answer, but... Be interesting because it had to be close. Well, the silver lining here for Medeiros is that the man right behind him in the overall standings also may have timed out as well. So Pat Vellner is not going to be able to gain any points on him. It's a different story for Roman Krennikov. Krennikov sits in third place. He's still alive. Now he's got to make up 60 points on Medeiros. And in order to do that, if Krennikov were to win the event, Medeiros would have to finish 13th. 
So Medeiros did time out on that last lift, and he and both he and Pat Velder have both been eliminated. Now we start at 280. Scott Tetlow, Jack Farlow, and Tim Paulson. Tetlow is through. Yeah, he looks strong there. Now, Jerry, you mentioned foot position here. Some of these guys are starting to widen their stance almost in the initial pull. Is, is that something that you would encourage, or would you encourage them to start with a more traditional, like, narrow base? I'd want something a little more shoulder width, and then I know sometimes they're stepping out on the clean. Right. I'd want to take that step back in before I press, because you're, you're losing a lot of power. He's so wide. Right, yeah. Right now, hard to generate a lot of drive that wide. Farlow on the left and Paulson did on it. the right, and Paulson will get it. And Paulson is fired up. Get that man on a echo bike right now. Anytime for Paulson. <laughs> he is always fired up. Jorge Fernandez, Heiner Kaperlein, and Saxon Panjic, and Nick Matthew are the next men out. Jackson Patrick fails again. Matthew's good. Fernandez is good. And Hapalainen will miss. So each round so far has been a battle for Saxon Panchik. 280 pounds on that log. And he gets those elbows up in a good position and doesn't hang out there too long. He gets it done. Apollinen is good, and Saxon Panchik unable to make it. So it looks like Saxon Panchik is going to be eliminated. Three, two, one, Great recovery there by Henrik, and able to execute on his second attempt. Jonah Koski is out there with Gerard and Hopper. Oh, Ricky Ricky's putting up a fight here. Taking a lot of energy, energy to get that clean. And unable to hit the jerk. Now, at that point, should you just ditch it and start over? I think I would start it over because trying to wrestle that thing into the that rack position, really setting up for a, a bad attempt on the press. Yeah, it's, it's interesting in that way. It's very different than that sandbag that we watched them do at the games because they only had to get it to their shoulders, so they could put up the fight once the momentum was there. And Yona Koski was close but unable to lock it out. Gerard rolling it up. Hopper unable to stabilize. And Ricky Gerard will wow. hit it. Let's go, baby. Huge comeback. Yeah, that's a great lift for him. Mikoski and Hopper are out. You see how he got it in the, in the rack position that time? He kind of pulled his elbows together. He really held that rack position really well. So when he dipped, Log didn't move. He got all that drive going overhead. Chandler Smith will step out with Bjorven Carl Gumanson next. And since the last round bled into that one minute window, a little bit more of a break for Chandler Smith and Bjorven Carl Gumanson. Yeah, and it's interesting how I'm watching the difference in body language from when we watched women bow out of this event versus men. It seems like the guys are feeling very disappointed as if the weight's there and they just can't hit it versus the women felt like maybe they were getting to weights where it was like, okay, that was it for me. I'm, I'm cool with that, like, end of my event. So I wonder how many of these guys are really struggling with the idea that they just couldn't step up and execute the way they thought they could. Well, you we were saying earlier about what they've hit in barbell press. So I think they probably had those hopes that they're going to hit similar numbers. It was just a completely different lift for them. Chandler Smith was able to make his first attempt. Jorgen Gumanson could not lock out the jerk. Yeah, Chandler made light work with that 280. Jorgen Gumanson trying to get some help here from the fans at Dell Diamond Stadium. Come on, BKG. That bar or the log, pardon me, may have flipped the top of his head on the way down on that last attempt. Gumanson was able to start his lift. And unable to get under it. Now Gumanson bows out. Wow. 
Roman Krennikov was starting to lift. Oh, Didn't get the hold command, and they waved him back because, again, they want to make sure that they start everything on time. Goom, or pardon me, Krennikov and Quant will be out next. It's tough when you're ready to rock and roll, man. Yeah, especially when you're that walking out to the implement, you're ready to go when you get that callback, man. So I'm just holding here to make sure that they fix the log. Now, this should be the last round where we have four men lifting at a time because by my count, we have 11 men who've been eliminated. Hey, you were saying earlier about how Roman being in third, he did very well in the sandbag in Madison. He took to it very well. I would expect with his explosive power, he would do well on this log as well. So it might be big points for him. We're going to wait again. Now everything's been situated. Roman is ready to go, and now he's just kind of pacing around there on the right side of your screen in the all black as he awaits his turn at 280 pounds. He and Sam Quant will be the only two men lifting here to close out this round at 280 pounds. That lion in a cage back there, ready to attack. Yep. That pace is a familiar one. Anyone that's lined up and played a sport, right? Right before you take the <laughs> line, right before the snap of the ball, right before the tip off, right before the, you know, runners take your mark, whatever it might be. It's that, it's that anxious, excited pace that we really can't avoid. We are set. Roman Krennikov on the right, Sam Quant on the attack. left, 280 pounds. Good clean. Solid. Krennikov has it. Solid press. And Quant unable to win that fight. Roman really looks like he could go quite a few rounds in, into this. That looked really solid. He and Chandler Smith are talking things over, and a good chance we might see those two guys going head-to-head -head for the win here. Okay, Sam Quant, into this event in fourth place overall. Sam had a solid drive on that last rep. His right arm just wasn't quite locked out. Doesn't have anything left in the face. Sam Quant bows out at 280 pounds. Take one more look at Roman Krennikov, who continues to look pretty proficient with this thing. Sits down to the lap. Nice tight in the cre crease of the hip. Back. Huge press over here. And he's not spending a, a bunch of undue time right there in that front right position. He gets it in good spot, hits the lift, keeps his time under tension low. He gets in that rack, tightens up, drives. And Gets that thing locked out overhead without without any kind of hiccup. It's going straight overhead, not wavering out. Notice he's wearing wrist straps to help to, to keep the wrist locked. Unofficially, here are the men who are still alive. Scott Tetlow, Tim Paulson, Jorge Fernandez, Nick Matthew, Heiner Kapalainen, Ricky Garrard, Chandler Smith, and Roman Krennikov. It's unofficial, though. We'll now move to two platforms. Athletes being briefed about what's going to be going on here. The weight increases to 290 pounds. Yeah. Under the lights here on Saturday night at Dell Diamond Stadium. It's not hard on the eyes, Sean. It's a good place to be. It has been a fun, action-packed day. We started earlier with the Roga Coaster and the Strongman event. Roman Krennikov has some fans in attendance. Yeah. Let's go, Roman. And we will conclude competition later on this evening with the final event for the Strongman as Alexei Novikov is one event away from winning his first ever Roga Invitational Championship. Scott Tetlow and Tim Paulson will be the first two men out. Their names highlighted in white on the left side of your screen. 
290 pounds. We're now down to two platforms. Sean Woodland with Adrian Conway and joined in the booth by former America's Strongest Man, Jerry Pritchett. He's been kind enough to share his knowledge with us and again, sort of the de facto strongman coach for a lot of CrossFit athletes. Yeah, this has been fun. Awesome event to watch. Like, just like the sandbag in Madison, all these athletes have, have, have tacked it very well. And in, into numbers that, you know, a lot of seasoned strong, strongman competitors and women competitors have taken years to get to. You see Tim Paulson was psyching himself up. Final event of the day for the CrossFit athletes. They have 10 total here in this competition. Tetlow and Paulson are ready to go. Tetlow over the press of Paulson struggling with the clean, trying to fight through it. He really needs to point those handles down away from him as he pulls it in the lap. That way he can try to get high up on that abdomen. That way when he starts that drive up, he can kind of kick that log and, and get that rotation up to the rack. He starts right here with timing those handles down. Tetlow and Paulson going again, second attempts for each of them. Much better than Tetlow. Tetlow oh. almost had it, Paulson. Going for his jerk and Tim Paulson unable to get the left. Once again, we'll hold for the next minute window as the equipment is adjusted. And this is why those crash pads are 12 foot long. <laughs> <laughs> It really does say a lot for the safety that Rogue puts in mind for this because there's a lot of strongman competitions that only have maybe a two-foot pad that the log is on and really can be dangerous when the athlete starts kind of wandering with that log. Jorge Fernandez and Heinrich Hapalainen will be out next. Fernandez maybe trying to play to the crowd a little bit with the Texas Longhorn shirt. Not a bad move. It never hurts to pander. I'm sure there's some locals that love that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he is from Texas originally. Here comes Heinrich Hapalainen and Jorge Fernandez. Fernandez unable to make his lift. And yeah, we noticed both athletes just starting to get pulled forward by that weight, particularly in the in the dip. And from what you've said, Jerry, it's like they could they could almost help themselves by having a cleaner clean, a yes. more efficient clean to the shoulders, because then it establishes a better front rack position right out of the gate. Exactly. It, it sets up for a good good press. It puts yourself in a good position to have a strong press. And Hapalina uh, almost had it. Just floated out, just, just a bit, just enough. And Fernandez not able to hit it. Been a bad one on the knee. Yeah, not only does it, you know, the clean's set up for a good rack, but a proper clean will just take the least amount of energy. I haven't mean, do that where they're just trying to yank it up and spend so much time trying to pull on it. We looked. Earlier, Roman, he just set into it nicely, rolled that log up really nice and clean, you know, almost like a textbook clean. Beautiful sunset here in Round Rock, just outside of Austin, Texas. Nothing like a lit ballpark at night. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. Saturday under the lights, not a, not a better place to be. Really great aerial right there. Nick Matthew and Ricky Garrard will be the next two men out. Ricky Garrard has been heading the wrong way in the overall standings right now. 11th place overall. Had a great start to the competition. Back-to-back third-place finishes, but since then an 18th, a 10th, an 11th, and then an 18th. Here come Matthew and Garrard. 
Good to see a man hit 290 pounds. Matthew not able to make it. Gerard wasn't even able to clean it yet. Still plenty of time in the window. As he, once he started coming out of the lap, you see how it really stretched him forward. Yep. You got to really get locked in that kind of like an upright low position as you just keep it, you to keep it up on your upper abdomen there. Gerard yeah. just trying to see muscle how he starts coming up and his elbows drop. The elbows really got to be like a high row holding that log in position. Here comes Nick Matthew for another attempt. Matthew able to make the clean. Not able to make the jerk. Gerard still has yet to complete the clean, and now he has it, but did he spend too much energy getting to this point? And Ricky Gerard just not able to stabilize it. They spent so much energy trying to build the first couple cleans. Yeah, and one thing we, we've learned about Ricky, I'll tell you what, he's a fighter. He's going to continue to fight until they tell him to step off that platform. you got to love that. The competitor goes out there and gives it their all until the whistle blows. Look at Chandler Smith and... Roman Krennikov. Go. You gotta love it. They're competing, but there they're trying go. to get each other fired up. Let's see somebody hit this. They both got a great shot at crushing this. Yeah, they've they've had clean lists thus far. They're the only two men left right now. Let's see it, guys. This is what you dream of as a competitor. The field dwindles. You're one of the last ones, if not the last one on the platform. This is what you train for, right? This is it. These moments right here. This is literally what fuels the slowest training days, man. When yeah. you feel the most beat up, this is it. This is what you visualize. This is it. The hardest days it was to get out of bed, make yourself train, and get through it. This moment right here, right now. Chandler Smith and Roman Kranikov trying to become the first man to clear 290. Roman has it. Wow. Chandler Smith has it. And here we go. 300 pounds. You gotta love it. You gotta love it. The same hands up position that Chandler Smith gave the audience last year after, an, and not the prettiest way, getting through that clean and jerk. And now he made that look really smooth. Both of those were great. We will move to the center platform and the Texas Oak. Chandler Smith and Roman Krennikov going head to head for the win here. And this is big for Roman because, again, if he wins the event, he'll pick up 100 points. And Justin Medeiros went out early. If, if he finishes, Medeiros does lower than 13th, Roman Krennikov is going to erase that 60 point deficit in one fell swoop. He's got to have this. So I think he knows that. The look in his eye, he knows he has to have this. He wants this. Chandler Smith could also find himself maybe in the top four. That's what awaits. 300-pound Texas Oak. That beautiful implement that was crafted by Steve Slater and his son Landon. Looks like Chandler Smith's going to take the platform first. And Chandler Smith is lower in the overall standing, so he will go first. 300 pounds now. Here you go. It's your moment. It's trained for. And just in case neither man is able to lift this log, Roman does have the tie break over Chandler. What you got to love is the unity of sports here, just being depicted. These, these two men don't even speak the same language. And yet they understand the position that they're in. They can relate to one another here in this big moment. This is what both of them train for. But when it comes right here, this moment, they speak this language. That's it. <laughs> they know it's this only one that matters. very well, right? You can see that. It's like, it's like, you know, the CrossFit, the strongman, the camaraderie between the athletes is what I've always loved with the, you know, with the sport. You know, there's not an athlete in the field that I wouldn't throw something from my bag to help if they need it. You know, you want to see them hit the best lifts? I just want to do the better than they beat them. But 
Come on, let's go. Chandler Smith up first, 300 pounds. Wow. Clean. And Ooh. he will make Look it. Good. <laughs> wow, game on. All right, Roman. That was Roman Krennikoff for his attempt. And Chandler Smith, is, his father, is here watching him compete in person for the first time. Cedric Smith, who is a strength and conditioning coach for the Dallas Cowboys, played football at the University of Florida and was the fullback for Emmett Smith. Roman knows what he has to do. Every lift up until this has been flawless, really, with Roman. We have waited for a long time to see this man compete in person in North America, and so far he has been worth the there wait. Go. Absolutely worth the wait. Crowd's behind him. Puts on a show every time. Krennikov to Ty Smith and move this thing to another round. He won't get it. Clean was a little tougher than his previous cleans. It slid on him a little bit. He's really got to get that high in the abdomen and lock in that high row. Plenty of time for Roman Krennikov and Chandler Smith is Come on, let's go after trying to encourage Krennikov to get through this weight. The high row. Come on, elbows high. And Roman just can't get under it. So Chandler Smith is going to win the event. Roman Krennikov will finish in second place. And a great show put on by those two gentlemen. I want to see what we can do. Let's go another round. <laughs> <laughs> Let's throw a little weight on there. Yeah. Hey, Danny Spiegel win another round when she didn't need to, Chandler. Come on. What a great event. The Texas Oak did not disappoint. Chandler Smith picks up his first event win of the competition. He's gaining some momentum. He finished third in the duel two, and now another 100 points added to his total as he continues to climb up the overall standings with now three events left in the 2022 Rogue Invitational. And this is what we came to see from Chandler. You know, we didn't get to see him this year at the, at the CrossFit Games to showcase his fitness and his talents, and it's been a while since we saw him on the field. I know that he felt personally that he had to prove something to himself to be back out here with the elites in our sport, and now he's got to be really happy with the showing so far. And Chandler Smith is with Kiki Dixon. Congratulations on your event win, Chandler. You wanted to win, so did Roman, but you guys were exuding camaraderie. Talk to me about what happens here on the competition floor between athletes at the Rogue Invitational. What's awesome is that even though we're going against each other, we're just pushing each other to be the best versions that we can possibly be. So it's not me versus Roman, it's both of us first versus the weights. Um, I also want to clarify that I am not ashy, I just have chalk on my face, so please know that. Well, you're done for the day. I'm sure you can go home and get cleaned up. What was the biggest challenge with this Texas Oak? It looked like you had more in the tank. Um, I was really lucky. I got to work with a couple really good strong men. I got to work with Rob Carney, who you guys have seen. He's awesome. And uh, the Hatch brothers, Zach and Nick, helped me out. So they, uh, they made it to where this was pretty familiar, and the way it moved well. It sure did. It was very exciting to watch. Congratulations. Thanks. Beat Navy. <laughs> Chandler Smith, and it was pretty apparent early on that he was going to be buying for the event win here. Yeah, a lot like we've been talking about throughout this entire event. Set yourself up for good overhead position with the solid clean. He did a great job keeping those elbows high, as Jerry mentioned, getting himself in a good position, driving that weight directly over his head. And then finally, for the event win on the Texas Oak, he was able to hit that lift. And he was gesturing to someone. You know what time it is. Overall standings now, Roman Krennikov is back in the lead. Wow. He picks up 70 points on Medeiros in that event. And now back in front where he started the day by 10. Pat Vellner now sits in third place and Chandler Smith has moved from seventh all the way up to fourth place, just five points back of Patrick Vellner for a spot 
on the podium. Well, that was certainly fun, and here is that final lift from Chandler Smith to win the event. Great reaction from the crowd, great reaction from Chandler. First event win of the competition. CrossFit action is done for the day. Jerry, thanks so much for coming by. Man. That was a lot of fun. Learned a lot with that. Uh, thanks for having me. That was fun. That was two great events to watch between the, the, the women and the men. They both killed it. And best of luck tomorrow in the Rogue Record Breakers. Looking Thank forward you. to I'm seeing that. Here. We're going to step aside for a second, hand things off to Jamie Hagia, Pat Sherwood, and Dr. Bill Crawford and the Rogue Iron Game. Later on this evening, we will crown a champion in the strongman competition. So stay with us, everybody, at the 2022 Rogue Invitational.
Three days of CrossFit competition with seven events done. The leaderboard on the men's side shifting up and down. The women's Laura Horvath dominating that top spot. The Rogue Iron Game coming up next. Welcome to the 2022 Rogue Invitational here at Dell Diamond Stadium in Round Rock, Texas. I'm Jamie Hagia, joined here with Pat Sherwood. And Pat, we have seen three days of competition. What are your thoughts on the three days so far? Day three was fantastic. We had the turtles, so we got to use the hill, see some monkey bars, the duel where one single missed rep means you blew the heat. Heavy lifting with an odd, odd object, the Texas Oak, and then Laura Horvath, with every event that goes by, she just said, I'm in charge. And the men's leaderboard was different every single time I refreshed my phone. So that was entertaining. Before we get to the men's side, the women did take to the field first. And here is a look at your event seven results from the Texas Oak. Danny Spiegel with an impressive 215 pound lift, making that look so easy. Laura Horvath, your overall leader, just 15 pounds behind her. Ellie Turner, Gabby Magala, and Alexis Raptus all tied at 190. But it was Danny Spiegel who made that look so effortless. Pat, how did she do that? The leaderboard makes it look like it was close. It was not close. Danny Spiegel ran away with this. First of all, she wins Best T-shirt Award with Girls Who Eat right there. <laughs> it's fantastic. Now, let's just say not only did she win the event, but she could have been done right there just for the crowd. They put more weight on the log. She hit another 10 pounds, ended at 215. So she was 100% in her element. Seven events down for the women. Let's take a look at their overall leaderboard. We have Laura Horvath on top with 590 points, a significant lead. Gabby Magala at 515. And we have Annie Thor's daughter in that third place spot, followed by Ellie Turner and Emma Lawson, the 17-year-old. But it is Laura Horvath that is really just setting herself apart in this competition. There's something for everybody here. If you like a close race, look at two, three, and four. If you like a blowout, then right now, Laura Horvath is just establishing unprecedented dominance. I mean, the last five events, she has four first place finishes and a second. She is, no one's even close to her. Fourth place last year at the Invitational, and right now, I mean, it's looking like day four is going to be the Horvath show. The women were super impressive, but we also saw on our men's side, our, our event seven results for our men goes as follow. Chandler Smith with a 300 pound log lift there. Roman Krenikov not too far behind, just 10 pounds behind him at 290. Ricky Garrard, Jorge Fernandez, and Henrik Hypelinen all tied at 280 pounds. But Chandler Smith, he does it again. He always performs well. What did you see in Chandler in this? Chandler really stepped up to the plate. He needed a win. He needed some points, and he absolutely delivered on that. He entered event number seven in eighth place. Not really where he wanted to be, but putting another 100 points in his corner, he's positioning himself very well for the final day of competition. And now with that win, he's got five top 10 finishes out of seven events. So the consistency is really starting to pay off for Chandler. Such a fun competitor to watch. Here is a look at our overall standings for our men after seven events. We have Roman Krenikov. It is an ever-changing leaderboard, but he is in that top spot, followed closely behind with Justin Medeiros, just 10 points behind him. Pat Vellner in that third place spot, and Chandler Smith and Samuel Quant rounding out that top five. Thoughts on this ever-changing men's leaderboard, Pat? That leaderboard's fantastic. It's got a race going into the final day of competition. What more could you ask for? I will promise you this. I don't know what it's going to look like tomorrow, but it will change. But to have Roman Krenikov, not Justin Madero, in the lead going into the final day of competition, I could not be happier. And they're just 10 little points apart. And then we have 
Vellner in third, Smith in fourth, Quant in fifth, and only 20 points separate third from fifth. So all over the leaderboard, it's up for grabs. It will make for an exciting day four for our CrossFit. That's a wrap for now until tomorrow's events. Next up, I will have Dr. Bill Crawford joining me along with 2017 America's Strongest Man, Jerry Pritchett. We will be discussing Martins Leitzies. He is the reigning rogue invitational strongman champion and he has a tall task ahead of him if he wants to take that top spot. The reason he's so dangerous is because there is no weakness in his performances. He doesn't have a weak event. Big brace, nice and tight. He needs it over the knees and he's going to get it. Leeti is good at 9.06. That's huge for Leeti. And Leeti has done it. He will be your overall leader. He's on for the win. He is your Rogue Invitational Champion. He saves the best for last. The Dragon Roars. And Ortiz Leites may be on top of the overall leaderboard courtesy of that effort. now by Dr. Bill Crawford and 2017 America's Strongest Man, Jerry Pritchard. Thank you so much for joining us, Jerry. Thanks for having me. Just want to get your overall thoughts on the competition so far. It's been an amazing competition so far. Uh, I think a few surprises from a couple of new newcomers that were in here. I mean, surprises, yes and no. If we knew the sport and we knew Hooper would be good at, at the yoke log. Uh, Pablo, we knew he'd be good at deadlift, but he really crushed it yesterday. He came out and crushed it. Um, and maybe a, a surprise that we thought that the champion that was going to come in and, and crush it is a little bit off right now. So this would be a good event for him, so we'll see if he gets it back. We will see what happens. Jerry, you got to test some of these workouts. Last year you competed. How was it testing out these workouts this year? It was fun, especially to be the first to test these events. It was, was really, really cool. Um, and, and they're massive. I mean, Roe outdoes themselves with these, these creations they come up with, you know. And they, they did it with the Wheel of Pain and now with these two. And now what are they going to do next? I mean, how do you get bigger than these three they've built so far? There has been so many great moments. And here is a look at our top, our through, through five events, our leaders here. It is, here we go, strongman event winners. Pablo took event one, Tower of Power, Alexei Novikov, and that's Sear Bell Ladder, Mitchell Hooper, Martins Leitzies, and Mitchell Hooper again on that yoke carry. Dr. Bill, out of these five events, which one has impressed you the most? Well, I think the yoke carry and overhead log lift from, from Mitchell Hooper because he catapulted himself up a couple of places and just completely mixed the whole thing up. I mean, I agree that there were, other, there were a lot of other great things that were going on, but, you know, Mitchell just came on so strong and really smoked it. I mean, 32 seconds is a huge time. Oh, He's really capable of a great time, but that was really impressive. Yeah, that really was indeed. Jerry, what's, what was the most impressive thing for you so far? I think the Della from Pablo, I mean, he, he dominated. I mean, he came out and just stopped at 12, you know, and he had more in, in, in the tank. Um, and, then, and then Hooper's run was impressive with that yoke log, which we knew he would be fast at the yoke, but he, he crushed the log as well. Here is a look at our overall leaderboard after five events. Our men are heading into their finale. But here, we're gonna take a look at that overall leaderboard for our strongman. It is Alexei Novikov in that top spot with 41.5 points. Trey Mitchell, just shy of a couple points behind him. Martins Leitzies, your former champion, is sitting in that third place spot, tied with Mitchell Hooper. And Pablo Nakonechi is rounding off that top five. Dr. Bill, when you see Novikov at the top, what, what do you see in this man up there? Well, it's his to lose at this point. He just can't make a mistake. He's got to have a smooth run and get deep into the stones and have good times with those. So he needs to make the first three or four stones really count so he keeps himself up in the standings. 
and Martins is trying to repeat, but it is going to be a tall task for him in this final event. Do you think he can make this happen? Unfortunately, at this point, I think his best is to get in the top three. Um, I, the one I look at is the big Texan sitting behind Alexi. He wants to win this bad. Um, and this is going to be a great event for him. He's great at stones. So it, it's Lexi's to, to lose and, and Trey's to come, on, come after and get it. Martins will try to do as much damage to control to stay in that third place spot. What does he have to do in this final event? How do you expect him to do? Well, you know, he is Martins. I don't care if he's banged up or if something else is going on. He's going to come out and make a strong run. I think he'll be deep into the stones at the very least. And he does surprising things all the time. Like, you know, this morning he won that first event. And I was kind of expecting, you know, Pavlo to, to do that. So it's Martins. He'll come out and do something surprising. I do think it's going to be a tall order. That's a lot of points. I do think the, the podium is, a, you know, possible for him, definitely. And we have Trey Mitchell and Mitchell Hooper in the mix, shaking things up. How do you think this is going to fare for these two guys, Jerry? I, I think Trey will be strong on stones. Hooper, we don't know too much about. I think it's his first go on a stone setup like this. So he, he could come out and crush it, we don't know yet. Dr. Bill, uh, thoughts on this? Well, I would agree. I think that uh, 2019, uh, uh, it, was between, uh, it was between Trey and Alexi for the stone off, and Trey actually beat him. So these are those are natural stones. These are stones that, are, you know, that, that Alexi's seen a couple of times. It's really kind of hard to tell, but I, I'd have to probably give the nod on these stones to Trey because he is a good stone lifter. We're going to take a look at their final event that is going to send them into after we before we crown our champion. It is Strongman Event 6, Stones Over Hitching Post. One competitor at a time. The stones are lifted up over a 50-inch high, 25-foot long wooden log, and these stones are going to go up in weight. How do we feel that this is going to shake out for the men on, in this event like this? Well, I think uh, it's, good to, it's going to be the first two or three stones. You can't make a mistake. You just got to get clean times. And then it's going to be the guys that can handle those larger stones, the 400 and the 420. You can see they're a little bit oblong. So really what you're looking to do is have efficiency on each of the stones, as we talked about, and get good times. It's also reading the stone because they're, they're a little bit different, each and, each and every one of them. They're not the same. You know, you might want to turn it a certain way. A couple of the guys will turn them uh, where they'll actually have the oblong facing away from them. The other thing is you've got to have, you know, besides from having no mistakes, is adapting. You might find yourself really trying to struggle with this kind of pressure. I mean, the whole thing's riding on this bit. So you've got to be able to get right through it. Now that we have the keys, Jerry, you have competed in this and have a lot of experience. How do you warm up? How do you approach an event like this? Oh, uh, you just got to get in your, your good mindset, block everything out, and then just focus on what you have to do. You can't worry about what everybody else is doing, because at the end of the day, it's not going to matter. What your performance is going to matter on your, where you end up. So you just got to focus on you, come out and crush it, and if you want the best time, you can't fumble with these stones. Dr. Bill, with this being the same event as last year, it was challenging last year, it will be challenging again. Why do you think this event was chosen again? Well, I think it's just a beautiful event, and it's also, I love stone lifting. Stone lifting's my favorite event. I'm really happy to see that it is that. And these are beautiful implements, actually. I think also, too, that we had such a dramatic ending last year. That was just phenomenal to see that, that comeback and to finish it off like that. And who would think that Tom Stoltman would lose in a stone lifting event? I mean, Tom Stoltman is the king of stones, and he didn't do it by a couple of seconds, he did it by five seconds. That was amazing. So I think we still have that taste in our mouth that this is a great event to finish this event. It will be very exciting. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thanks for taking the time, Jerry. We are looking forward to event six, where after that we will crown our strongman champion. So don't want to, you don't want to go anywhere because you will not want to miss this.